Brother Tavon Swaino, a.k.a. The Orthodox More. And this is Debate Talk for you live. And I have the, the, the distinct pleasure and honor of being joined uh, by Sister Dana Marnici. Um, if you're not familiar with her work, I personally consider her today's like a modern day version of Drusilla Dungeon Houston. Um, a lot of Moors are familiar with her work. And if, if you're Israelite or, or, you, or you do with the Bible or whatnot, um, you, you're really going to find her, her current work really interesting. And so just to give you a quick background of the sister, um, she has a, a, a website you can go check out called uh, AfroAsiaticBlogspot.com. And Sister Dana Reynolds Marnici describes herself as an academic researcher slash author dedicated to documenting the forgotten heritage of Afro-Asiatic peoples. Um, her education is that she received her, her BA degree in history from Rutgers University, uh, Douglas College. She received uh, uh, her master's degree in social, uh, social sciences slash anthropology from University of Chicago. Um, she received her master's of education um, uh, from Eastern University. You may. Uh, she also has some some works where uh, she's been on. She's worked with tra uh, as a translator for Zahi Kawas, the director of, of Giza Antiquities. Um, she also worked as a research manager for for a, P a PBS affiliate. Um, she's also been known as a as a former magazine publisher at Global ba Global Global Black Woman Magazine. Um, and her publicated works include. Um, you may most people are familiar with her with her works from Ivor Van Sudderma in uh, in Golden Age, Age of the Moors, where she where she wrote a piece in there called. The African Heritage and Ethno History of the Moors, Background to the Emergence of Early Berber and Arab Peoples from, pre, from Prehistory to Islamic Dynasties. Uh, again, that was uh, in Golden Age of the Moors by Ivan Ben Sertiman and the Journal of African Civilization. Yeah, she also uh, has a publicated work called The Myth of the, Mediterranean Race, of the Mediterranean Race Inside the Book Egypt, Child of Africa by the Journal of African Civilization, Volume 12. Um, and something that the Moors, a lot of Moors in her for is fear of blackness, recovering the hidden eth ethnogenesis of early African and Afro-Asiatic peoples comprising the Moors of North Africa and Spain. Uh, and that was in the West African Journal. Um, she has many, 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 many more articles on her on her blogs, uh, on her on her uh, website, AfroAsiaticBlogspot.com. So I, I recommend that everybody go there and familiar familiarize yourself real quick with her work because she has a lot of it. Um, and currently, we'll be talking about uh, a book she has coming out called The African and Arabian Origin of the Hebrew Bible, Exegesis in Light of Inscriptions, Folkloric History, and Early Ethnography of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to let the sister give herself an intro and, and, and obviously uh, fill in any holes that I missed because uh, she has a very lengthy and illustrious career. So uh, good afternoon to you, sister. And thank you for joining, joining us. Thanks, Taiwan. Um, well, I think the main thing that you did not touch upon was my work with, um, like I say, the, uh, not work with, but my background with the Rosicrucians and uh, a lot of esoteric Christianity and um, different uh, organizations that were involved in Masonic, uh, early European Masonic tradition. Uh, so my, I would say you know, my upbringing was kind of mystically bent. There was a mystical bent to it. Um, and a lot of the reason I got started with this stuff is that, uh, as I say, I had certain visions and dreams and that kind of thing when I was young to, that let me know that we weren't being told, um, you know, a lot about African and Afro-Atlantic history. So just want to tell you that kind of that's where I'm coming from, from a mystical, well, that's where my work, how my work started from a mystical standpoint. And then, you know, I have on tape where a psychic that I often go to said that um, I was going to be working with the Masons, which I consider to be the Moors and the people like you that, um, you know, deal with the mystical hermit, hermit Hermeneutical, um, hermetic, or whatever tradition or background of you know this research. So, to me, that's the only important point in the research is the fact that you know we're, we're at least I I know that I'm here to get people focused back on God again. So, right. I know you also have a background in energy work. Do you want to explain that as well? Well, I mean that could take a whole that. <laughs> A whole nother lifetime of them. 
Yeah, I mean, I started off with, uh, when I was young, you know, my mom used to have meditation. I uh, used to work with a theosophist and um, have meditation work. And then she introduced me to um, some Joe Ray light healers and I uh, got into Joe Ray and my aunt uh, got me into Buddhism, which was the Nanyo Horenge Kyo thing. She was the founder of different uh, temple, uh, not temples, but um, yeah, I guess you can say temples in the area. Um, this is my aunt now I'm talking about, who's, who's not my mom. Um, and uh, then that the chanting brings you whatever you want. So I tended to get more into healing and uh, I got into a Shinto sect that was into um, a very powerful form of light energy healing, which could literally, the reason I got into that is because they said that they could start, uh, they could actually light matches on fire with their hands. And, you know, actually I got involved in that. Um, as an initiate and found out, you know, a lot more about the spiritual world, um, you know, and experience a lot more with the spiritual world um, than I'm willing to talk about here. But um, in order to get out of that, because that was like a little, you know, once you get into that kind of thing, you're dealing with um, spirits and that kind of thing, different levels on different dimensions. I had to get into something more, less intense and, um, so a lot of people moved over to another, a Korean sect uh, that I came came to be involved with and was more involved with healing, but using as much uh, earth and water energy as light energy. So heaven and earth energy, more balanced. And that I think really um, did a lot to straighten out a lot of things in my life and start making uh, changes in other people around me, their lives as well. So. But I mean, I've used all these practices to heal people, heal cancer, um, uh, you know, tumors, viruses, people with, um, you know, arthritis, um, family problems in terms of relationships, um, manifesting problems, problems of, at work, you know, employees and that kind of thing. Um, that was just a very powerful practice. Uh, involving Qigong, Qigong, and the Qi energy, work with the Qi, um, which is the dragon's, dragon of life, we call it. And um, this has to do with uh, what I, all my research, because the, for me, the Bible or the Torah, just especially Genesis and all that, as well as the Upanishads in India and a lot of the other sacred texts are about the movement of this sacred divine energy called the dragon of life, okay, the chi, or chi, it's even called chi in Africa, really. It's a feminine energy that comes up from the base of the spine and spreads, you know, purifies all of our chakras and meridians. And each of these um, chakras have names in the, in the Bible and Kabbalah, in the Upanishads. It's, that story of the Upanishads is all about the traveling, the movement of these um, energies through the different meridians and chakras, through the uh, up through the, you know, through the pituitary and spreading out through the crown chakra. So that's how deep, you know, this these um this belief system of our ancestors was. That's been changed by uh, other people getting involved, you know, who were converted, forcefully converted in most cases to these belief systems. Mm -hmm. What I find really interesting about your work on a spiritual level in terms of its healing is the fact that so um, for, when you talk about Genesis, for instance, right, like in the Table of Nations in uh, Genesis 10, there's, you get like 70, 70 people or nations basically mm -hmm. mentioned. Why not. And so a lot of people don't really follow follow that those groups throughout the Bible or throughout throughout history and, and see who they are and, and how they really intermingle, et cetera, whatnot. And what I find interesting about your work is there's like a unification healing going on to where like, like it unifies the division amongst our people in a sense to where, to where they can, they can begin to find themselves. Um, even, even people who can, uh, uh, like, like Moorish or Israelite or people who don't even, um, people who are just African American who are trying to figure out the history of it, that they can learn, they can, they can connect themselves, um, on, on the larger African tree and what, and what branch they go to and, and what root and what root they're connected to and whatnot. Right. I, that's a really uh, healing aspect for me, for instance, I've been following your work for at least 19 years or whatnot. And and the more the more I read your work, that's 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 what I find. Um, like I said, mm -hmm. like, 
when we started this interview, uh, I sent you a debate that I had where I cited your work heavily in, in that debate or whatnot. And and th- th- just a little bit of work in that 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 cited that that I cited in that debate, um, it was it was it was life changing for me because it gave me a it gave me not just a starting point but an ending point. Like a lot of people know, like okay, we go back to Africa or not. And for those of us who like who, who check out DNA and other type of stuff or whatnot, we can fi- we can actually find out certain certain places we go back to or whatnot. And so, mm-hmm. so I can find your work and, and not just connect, connect myself to West Africa. I can go. I can go. I can have it go back to East Africa and the origin of things mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And that to me, that was extremely powerful. Um, so real mm-hmm. quick, I want to ask you, like, so you were talking, you were talking about like visions and stuff or whatnot. Like, what, did, what was it like a vision that sent you down that road to to, to wanting to to unify things, or is that something you you you, uh, you naturally get, get into, or do you recognize you do it, or is it going to happen through you? What's going on with that? Well, I mean, again, this is a long story. I mean, it's something my family in general is, you know, very clairvoyant and very mystically inclined because, you know, like I said, my parents were involved in different organizations, um, uh, you know, practice meditation, and study the Vedas and all those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, even their ancestors were Masons, too, both on the European side and the African side. So, um so when we were born, like me and my me and my brother, we also have like Hindu Indian ancestry and as well as American Indian ancestry, a native ancestry. So when me and my uh, brother, you know, when we were young, we used to watch kind of visions in us in a circle in our rooms when we were, you know, when we were in bed at night, we used to watch I used to watch movies. You know, I didn't know other people couldn't do that. I didn't know other people couldn't see chakras and that kind of thing. I've seen things that, that you know, are supposed to be just on, only in fairy tales. So, um, and then, you know, people would ask me to, my, our mother would ask us to look at her and see what was around her and stuff. And we both saw a Chinese, tall Chinese man wearing a kufi and white long gown. Um, you know, we, we, so that's how I know, you know, it wasn't just me imagining things because me and my brother, with my brother also, even now he dreams in Vedic, uh, you know, he has these Vedic, I guess um, motifs coming to him in dreams, you know, that tell him things like somebody's in danger and that kind of thing. So it's about it's probably an ancestor thing. I think we have some gypsy in in, in us or something, <laughs> because I had this one experience. Um, but this is after playing tarot cards. I would suggest people don't play with tarot and Ouija and all that kind of stuff because you can bring up a lot of things that, you know, that another thing you, they're just supposed to be in fairy tale, but most of those things are real. And they actually can start manifesting in the in the physical world, you know, if you don't know what you're doing. So anyway, and then my son too. He's even, uh, you know, he's even. Um, he used to tell me, for example, that you know he saw a man with a hood go into my car, and and uh, what's it called? Uh, the Grim Reaper, I guess. When he was almost, I guess, seven, he told me that, and I'm like, okay, but. I had so many head-on crashes in that car too. <laughs> so, uh, and um, yeah, my, my son was even more, I would say, stronger in terms of connection with the other other uh, worlds than he is. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, I. There's a lot of stuff I could talk about, but um, the thing is, yeah, I just started having certain um, experiences when I was young, in turn, including one asked Akashic record, because um, Akashic is not necessarily everybody, you know, not all visions come on the Akashic. Akashic is when you go back to your past, and it actually tunes in like a like a white noise. You'll see white noise first, and you'll be back in your past life. But whatever, um, uh, whatever the um, Akashic record means to people, they should um, understand that it's kind of based on electricity. It's not necessarily just a regular vision. But so this one lifetime, and uh, well, this one lifetime, I mean, I saw uh, that I, my mother was a head of priestesses. And I was on a boat with these other women that look like, actually look like East African, more like the Djibouti 
type of women on a boat. And we were using the word la or the syllable la to, to contact, we're well not contact, but tune ourselves in with, with um, the sun. And um, there was a music playing in the background and the, the instrument they were using, I never, I never heard of it before. This is, I think I was 17 when I had this experience. Um, and the song that they were singing using just la or the melody sounded kind of Indian. So I said, well, what are these people? And I, I never really seen these people before except in um, like something in National Geographic. That's why I knew it was like the beauty could have been like the beauty or something. But so later on, as I was listening to, um, I was watching this movie called Harvest 3000 Years and I heard the instrument again, but it wasn't as clear as in my vision. And this instrument was in a, the, the movie was made by an Amharic, Amharic man. Uh, and he was talking about agri, you know, the agriculture and the change in Ethiopia and that kind of thing. So a lot of these people, you know, I had seen through the Kasha and through visions. Um, there's a lot of visions I've had that, you know, showed me that um, these people are so far advanced that it's not even worth talking, comparing what we are now. I mean, people think that this is advanced. That's nothing compared to what these people did were doing. So I don't know. I don't know um, how to explain it other than that. <laughs> but and I believe that you know, because the people involved were different, you know, being African rather than other different kind of people, um, they were just more, I guess, more metaphysically oriented. That's all I can say. But so later on, I also learned that these people were called. People that went out on ships, or women that went out on ships, were called harim or harim magada, and I learned that from a book um, called Bornu Sahara and Sudan, and that these people were called Phoenicians, or or women of the Phoenicians used to do that. Right? But at the time, I didn't know Phoenicians were actually in that area. So you know, it's only in the last ten years when I come to believe and know that the Phoenicians actually did come from the area of the Eritrean Sea and that these people were actually related to them. So that was, um, you know, and then I, I, in high school, I had a woman, kind of like a mentor who was white and Russian, but like she was, I don't know how to say it, but she was a real life witch. And she was old, she, her hair was pure white. And she, all she used to talk about was Rasputin, Rasputin. I think she might have been related to him or something, I don't know. but. Um, she was telling me what I was going to be, and she said, you're going to be like Angela Davis, and you know, you're going to work with someone coming from the Midwest. Um, but anyway, uh, she she knew whatever I was doing at home, she would, you know, when I'd come into school, she'd say, why are you treating your mom like that? You know, she'd yell at me. So, so but yeah, I had, um, I, I, I've been guided, you know, throughout my life to different, to different people and stuff. So just had a very metaphysical upbringing, you know, everything that I see on TV, I see in Harry Potter, Harry Potter and things. Um, a lot of that stuff, my, either me or somebody else in my family, my family has experienced. You know, on a, not, even, not even just on a metaphysical level, but on this level. So, um, so I, for me, the world of, that world is almost, you know, it's realer than, this level of, of experience. Like my mother passed away four days ago, or I, think, I, I forget when she uh, I think it was Wednesday. But um, you know, I don't, I don't know why I'm not. I don't feel a sense of loss because the connection is still. I feel the connection is still there, and it's like she's in a much realer place than we are. We're in the low land. We're in the low level. It's actually land of Canaan. This whole dimension that we're in, you know, we're experiencing. So and I've also experienced, um, I think also what helps is I've always also experienced myself in, in uh, before I came here, you know, with my family, uh, we were kind of like light beings, tall light beings watching the earth, um, a prism, prism light, the color of light you would see in a prism. And I they asked me if you know I wanted to go back, and I said 
I, you know, because I knew that I was the one that chose to come here from that experience. I didn't have to be here, but I, I keep choosing to come back. I must have, um, anyway, I jumped back to this like TV screen to come back to my consciousness, state of consciousness. So there's just a lot of difference, I think, between my viewpoint of life um, than a lot of other people that I know. So I know some people have experienced certain experiences like that, but there's very few. Yeah, I think we might have to bring it back for a part two and talk about that because I have very similar experiences on, on a lot of those things. Um, wow. Minus, minus maybe the, the theosophical background, um, but in terms of like the visions, in terms of uh, even things with like you're talking about with, uh, with your mother whatnot. Like my father's been passed for a few years and whatnot. And I don't feel the same loss that most people do because um, even from the North American Muslim uh, concept to where to where um, death is not an enemy to, to man, it's a friend. Yeah, it's a, it's a joyful experience, really. I mean... I, yeah. think most of, I think most of the um, people sometimes, you know, that don't understand death and they feel really horrible when their loved ones pass on because they don't believe in past lives, first of all. They don't see the, the uh, other side at all. So it's, I know it must be hard, but for me, like my mom, like we've been together in some of these past lives that I just can't feel that that sense of loss. You know, I know I'll be with her again. Fortunately, work, we worked out a lot in this life <laughs> that we had in other lives. But um, and she was, you know, very old and ready to go. So that's it. Um, and uh, so we have Hindu, we have different ceremonies, and um, you know, there's different things that people should do when their loved ones pass on because you do go into um even though it's usually a higher place, there's still lessons to be learned and stuff. And, you, and they can also help us in this life um, through their own enlightenment on the other side. All right. That's why you, you got in the Bible stuff like let the dead bury the dead. You know what I'm saying? God right. is the living and whatnot, et cetera. Whatnot. Exactly. And exactly. even with what you were talking about in terms of, in terms of like, uh, so just, just to, just to clarify things and draw a bridge, a lot, a lot of our, a lot of our listeners here are going to be left from a, like a biblical Christian base and whatnot. So they might not understand some of the esoteric things you were saying. So just mm-hmm. to try to, to draw to try to draw a link real quick like so even in the bible it talks about like uh where god was talking about like the blood of somebody was crying unto him from the ground or whatnot that he could hear that there was a sound essence or there was an information coming from the essence of somebody's blood or something like that or mm-hmm. genetic genetic information or whatnot even even in even in the quran or whatnot it speaks about the concept of like uh uh the, the Quran is a remembrance for you because because we all heard we all heard the words of god in the pre-existence or whatnot it's, it's a part of our essence or whatnot so it's a remembrance for it once we hear it and whatnot. So there's a, there's an aspect there's an aspect of of uh, of, of the, the essence of God's uh, the the essence of the information of the truth of God being in, being intrinsic to us, um, intrinsic to the soul, the spirit, etc., whatnot, um, and it, it being like an unlearned an unlearned thing. It's not something you have to learn. However, and that's that's why when when you, when you hear the words of a prophet or a teacher or or a leader or whatever that that resonates with the truth, it, it literally it resonates with literally resonates with you. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's that's a that's a whole another conversation for a whole another time. Getting leaving leaving the world of the esoteric in a, in a, in a, basically the instinctual and all that type of stuff, uh, and moving more into the scholastic world. Um, uh, one one thing I really I really dig about your work is that, like I said, you you have a mile a minute of resource of of, 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 of citations and uh, and uh, etc. Whatnot where, where you get your work and whatnot. So. Uh, I want to jump into 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 that kind of thing right quick and, turn, and start talking about the scholastic stuff right quick. So just 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 to touch base on that, um, like I said, a lot of people are going to be familiar with your work from from uh, the Golden Age of the Moor with Ivan Van Sertima. So real quick, how how did you come to work with Ivan Van Sertima and the Journal of African Civilizations? Well, to be truthful, it's another metaphysical start. I mean, I had heard this music called SOS. SOS, and all of a sudden, um, it was impressed on me that for some reason that this was the something in the beat was what was used to build the pyramids in Central America, and that they were African people related to Africans. And I had heard of Dr. Van Sotomayor's book, and um, actually, I went to the um, bookstore one day and I was looking in through the book section and the book just literally fell out. Um, so that's how I first, you know, encountered his his um, research and theories. And I decided to go to Rutgers because of him. 
So that's how I met him through Rutgers, and I, and I convinced him to uh, work on the more, you know, the more thing. Because I had been actually researching, um, yeah, researching the Tibu, and I had seen these Tubu people, these Zagawa people, in a dream before, you know, before uh, I ever started even studying them. You know, got get, got to know them or see them in Africa. You know, all I saw was Tarzan movies and. Uh, people in loincloths. I never saw these people wearing the turban, and uh, you know they were riding horses in figure eights. They trained their horses in figure eights, and, and it was in North Africa. I knew that from the dream, uh, and I had never seen that. I'm like, where, where are these? You know, where? How come I'm not seeing these people in books and stuff? And then that's, that's what got me started, uh, you know, looking into it. Looking so. Into it. You okay. said that you, you influenced him to start the book or to, to write the book? Well, I guess so because he wasn't, you know, yeah, I, I mean. That's awesome. He, he, yeah, he, he he actually did talk about the Tibu, tibu but I told him, you know, I had a lot of information and that we should write, you know, where he that, should That makes book. a lot of sense to me because when I, and I'm not to catch you, I'm sorry, but when I read the book, um, what, when I get to your section, it seems like a lot of foundational stuff. Like it's almost like the rest of the book is explaining what your what your foundation is. Because like you said, the Zagawa just then, right? So so uh, just so everyone's uh, familiar um, uh, with the sister's work, she goes through and she lists a lot of different Berber tribes and a lot of different tribes um, that would have been linked up to to, to the Moorish culture, etc. In in that particular section of the book and whatnot, um, and and. This is what this is what I was saying. Was it was trans, uh, it's transformational for me in terms of understanding things because before I ran into this sister's work, I wasn't seeing things being lined up like that, and so it's I can see to where to where a lot of that book is actually like cooperating on on a, uh, on a later scale. What you were talking about on a foundational scale that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, well, you're you're actually one of several people that said to me this basically that it's been foundational for them. You know, transform their lives, which I'm extremely happy about, but. That is the purpose of this information coming out, so that mm -hmm. people can understand. I mean, it's not me. It's not me. Just me. Believe me, I'm. I'm just channeling. That's what I'm saying. The metaphysical aspect is important. I'm. I'm being shown the research and things, and people don't really believe me when I say that. I'm. I'm being guided, you know, to this research and sources, and even certain people. You know, a lot of people that I've met. I met um, Dr. Bernard. No, no, yeah, Bernard Lehman. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I met him first in a dream, uh, and, I, and uh, later I talked to him. And I asked him if he had this motorcycle with a um, with a uh, card on the side, like they used to use in World War II. And he sent me a picture of him. He said many of them. He sent me a picture of them on. He's and in the dream it was like I was being told I was going to be, you know, meeting this person. Who's also on the same along the same path in terms of research, you know. So that's another person to keep in mind in the future. He's actually not, you know, he's not African. Uh, he was an Ulster, Ulster, Irish or Scottish, whatever. Work he used to work with the ANC in South Africa, though white man, and then he worked, moved to Ethiopia and, and Arabia, studied there, and I think he married an Ethiopian woman and stuff. So. But um, yeah, so a lot of people that are involved in this work are not necessarily of African descent. It's just that a lot of this knowledge is meant to come back to the fore. A lot of people who know this information or are agreeing with it, like my book that's coming out, uh, like I said, I mean, one of the first uh, supporters was a David Goldenberg um, who, wrote, who was a white or, yes, European. Uh, Canadian American who lived in South Africa for a while and wrote about the curse of curse of ham. Mm -hmm. um, so he, you know, he wrote me said he had tried. He got in touch with me through Wesley Muhammad, uh, and you know, I think he's just more open minded and understanding because um, a lot of the stuff he's written in his books are actually Afrocentric now. If people like me had written that, like about the Colchians being from Kushites, that kind of thing, um, or Cochin China being related to, I mean, he backs up his stuff though. That's that's the difference between early Afrocentrics and um, him, because he, he, like I said, he said certain things about the Amazons being kind of like related to North Africa and that kind of thing. Anyway, 
Um, him and then the 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 forward for my book was written by um someone I still don't want to mention his name because you know the book's not out, out yet, but um, you're gonna you know people are gonna be surprised that who wrote the forward because he's a very well respected um, scholar, white Western scholar in um, in this country, who is an expert on Islamic exegesis and um you know and also Judaic and um, Christian comparative religions, you know, comparative comparing those religions and the exegesis related to the Bible or the Old Testament. So and he's the one that wrote the Ford. He said he thinks it's amazing what I'm what I did. <laughs> so yeah. I wouldn't disagree. The little bit I got to read was fantastic. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna like it, but a lot of people I know are gonna be upset. So which is fine with me. But they're going to be upset because of how well you back up your work. Like you were talking about the early Afrocentrics not really backing up your work. Like again, like yeah. whenever I read your work, I got <laughs> I got to have two sets of notepads. <laughs> well, it's always good to have two sources for your, you know, statements. Two or right. three for statements, especially if you're a supposed Afrocentric. You know, because I I'm on a, I see sites people call me radical Afrocentric and all this other kind of stuff, which you know they want to find. Yeah, so that, that brings me to my, to my last question before we jump into the book. Like, so I, I know that you, you've worked with Zahi Kawas before. And so, and we were talking about this Afrocentric view and whatnot, and, and people coming from different, different backgrounds, changing perceptions and whatnot. I can see where your work would directly be counter to what he kind of portrays in the world and whatnot. Uh, so, Zahi was a joker, and he would make some, um, you know, comments that I found very offensive as an African descended person. Um, now, <laughs> but um, you know, I liked him. I still like him. And, but um, yeah, he doesn't think that the uh, Egyptians, like many Egyptians, they don't think that they're African in the black sense of the word black African. They think that they're special, just like other people in the world. They think that they're special and separate from, um, you know, as as groups. Um, you know, he did not even think he's Arab. He says, you know, he would say things like, you know, I don't even look like Arab. Or, I find that to be extremely interesting. So, so again, like I told you, my, my mother's of a, of a North African lineage and whatnot. And whenever you, whenever people uh, who test their DNA of North African lineage, with everyone, anyone that I've seen, and even on the internet, whatnot, it, almost the last one, there's a very small, like a single to a single to like a high, like or a low double digit percentage of Senegalese or or Mali uh, DNA in there. No matter where they are, from Egypt to Morocco. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, genetically, it breaks down the fact that there was a migration from there that spread out and, and covered North Africa. So when they try to say that they're they're the they're, they're uh, that they're the original to the, to the area, whatever, they're not even Arabian. Whatever. I don't I don't understand where that comes from because all the history stipulates like like no, nah, you're definitely not native to that spot. Well, yeah, there are a lot of people that agree too, especially the ones that are not educated in Western by Western scholars, you know. There's still, you know, there's people, I have Egyptian friends that have said, you know, the, the real Egyptians were dark. I said, yeah, I do know. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, so it depends, though. Yeah, where you're coming from depends on, you know, Morocco, Algeria, and depends. The Kabyles are, um, for example, people might think that the Kabyles, very skin, very first and Berbers are more racist than um, maybe a Moroccan would be, being darker, but it's not always the case, you know. So, um, yeah, then the Arabs too, they're, some of them are very racist and some of them are very not, you know, it depends on where you are, what, how you've been educated and that kind of thing. What your class is, you know, economic class and um, what your traditions are, that kind of thing. But now like Qaddafi, somebody like Qaddafi, he, he knew this stuff before we did. <laughs> He's right. talking about the original uh, people of Arabia were African, um, and not like, like uh, you know, like not like in the sense of he, he, but in the sense of, you know, that the people that are now around Lake Chad and, and even West Africa, who's talking about those people, have some background in Arabia, which if you look at the skeletons of Arabia, the few that there are there, um, it's not all East African. It's people that are very unusually so-called Negroid. Or with Negro traits, you know, the very broad platter and nose and um, 
you know, projecting jaws, whatever this were supposed to be, the so-called ego. They were a larger version, a more powerful version of the so-called ego. Like I always say, Mr. Maybe Mr. T or Tebow, Tebow. What's his name in the Friday? <laughs> oh, okay, uh, like, like, like a robust like, Bantu frame, like like a more robust Bantu type frame or something like that. Or? Well, yeah, but Bantu are just smaller, smaller than some of us American. But um, yeah, I mean, wow. the, okay, yeah. so bigger yeah, than the Bantu. when I went to um when I was in New York about um what was it? 1980s and I stayed in the um I stayed in the Y there um and there was I met people from Saudi Arabia they were giant giant negroid people walking like like trees they look like tree trunk living trees walking the size of their bone structure is just completely different than African much bigger much um power more powerful I'm like and the guy told me he came I said are you descended from slaves? And he looked at like, I me mean, like I was crazy. And he said, you know, all the people in my town look like me. He was from near Al Karj in Central Arabia. And I found out the name of the um he did say El El he said Uda. Uda. And uh later on, just in fact last year I saw people start posting pictures, or actually I found a picture of uh, somewhere of these people from Uda, which is El Uda or Lud. Lud, El Ud. Okay. Now, all of our names, all these people's names come from uh, our totemic. So that name is related to the lion and the sound that the lion makes at a certain time of the day. Okay. Yes. And those, and, and at the same time, the totem, totemic, totemic, they're also related to the planets and stars and constellations and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm saying. They're very complicated, very beautiful combination of things that make up this truth you know about our heritage that i'm trying to keep on the right plane it's not about just being black and you know the blacks were created everything in civilization which you know they basically the nabatian did a lot of that but um you know it's their connection with the cosmos and recognizing it as an outward extension of their inner selves you know, and that's where spirituality comes in. That's where shamanism, that's where um, religion, how religion was formed. Through this knowledge, through these priests or through these people, shamans who could interact with the world in this way. You know, that's another, I forgot to talk about that, that, you know, basically the, the last practice that I got into was more shamanic than anything else in, in terms of us being able to relate to nature. So we merge in with nature over time. And um, I noticed more, more and more as I did that and got more into this pra Korean practice um, that you know you can control, you kind of not control, I should say, but well, yeah, you can kind of manifest what you want in terms of nature, the weather, um, your life path. Um, you know, that's what abundance is about: being able to merge in with the mother, hail mare. Full of break. The mother Mary is nature itself. So like telling a storm to be still and it being still. Hmm? Like telling a storm to be still and it being still. Exactly. And that's what the, you know, Jesus or Isa could do because he was a master. Well, he was an adept, um, probably near Christ, you know, the Christ consciousness. Um, I don't believe that, you know, Jesus himself was a God. I believe that, um, you know, there are people that reach that a state or having people that reach a state where they can, you know, where they can manifest Godhood fully. I mean, they're not basically not living in this country, but um, there are people like I, I think there's one in Africa and a couple in probably more than a couple in, in Asia that can do that kind of thing. You know, have power over life and death, that kind of thing, which I think Isa probably or Jesus probably could. Who, whoever the one, because there are people like I, I've heard in India that can just pull out your life force just by looking at you, you know. But they wouldn't do that if they were of a higher caliber. I mean, there's wish doctors probably can do that too. So, but um, 
basically, you know, yeah, people need to understand that um, this is where these religions came out of, the full knowledge of the connection between the cosmos and our inner being, you know, etheric on the etheric level. And, you know, if you were to look into our different chakras, you would see different multicolored, um, you know, several chakras, actually, I think over a dozen going down way up here to way down there, plus thousands and thousands of nodes and meridians. Um, and all of these had names, you know, among our people. And they were connected to the stars and planets. So what's interesting about that is, is, uh, is so for a lot of people listening to this and real quick, let me make a brand disclaimer. Uh, the views and opinions of the host and, and uh, the, the guest are not the views and opinions of W Talk for your South Showtime, just to be clear. <laughs> Um, brand disclaimer the views and opinions of the host and the guests are not the opinions of, of South Show Time or Debate Talk for you. But with that, um, so again, like I said, your work was it was foundational for me in actually understanding like the link the, the link the link of going from West Africa to East Africa and then also through other parts of the world and whatnot. And so part of that was for instance, like my father is, is of a Yoruba uh, lineage at one point. And so mm -hmm. part of the Yoruba, for instance, say that they come from the, the, the Sabines and that the Queen of Sheba came from them from them and whatnot. And so mm -hmm. when you look at the Sabians or whatnot, for instance, like the, the, the Islamic tradition was stipulated that they're the oldest monotheists in the world or whatnot, that they have they had the first tradition or whatnot, that they went back to well, know that type of stuff. Yeah, Aborigines in general, their different clans had their own gods. That's where that comes from. You know, in fact, Christopher Eret talks about that, uh, about the mon monastic, monastic tradition or monotheism in... Um, you know, among Afro-Asiatics, including, you know, that's in Saba, but, you know, it, at least the Sabians, their priests knew about all the different connections between the, the uh, you know, divine one. So right. Least, there's Allah, which is the divine one, but within Allah's, there are, you know, the, the guardians of Allah, for one thing, and then there's the 360, uh, degrees or 360 um, deities, um, you know, so the whole astrology thing that the Sabians were masters of and all the other Afro-Asiatics Afro and Africans were masters of, because they knew, you know, even without going there, they knew, they knew um, phys going there physically, they knew what the deal was with these planets and the constellations where they were all situated and stuff. Now, people say that, oh, how did the Dogon know them? Some, some, um, uh, you know, the Dogon of Marcel Guyot's book about the, um, the jackal star, the, star uh, series, the seri yeah. serious mystery. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, some aliens brought this knowledge to the Dogon, and they're the only people to know. But all, all Africans know this or knew it. Right. You know, the, this, this whole thing, Africans and Afro-Asiatics Afro extending to Dravidia and probably past that to the Indonesian area. They knew about, you know, they all had the same mystery traditions, similar mystery traditions. I mean, the gods of India, the gods of Africa, the, the so-called prophets or, um, yeah, people, leaders of Genesis, ancestors, the Abraham and all this. This is all, you know, Abraham, Saraswati, and um, Sakya Muni. Sakya, Sakya um, not Sakya Muni, but Isaac, and Sakya, Sakya, I think his name was in India. All these traditions have the same um, background. Now, some of these these individuals mentioned in Genesis may have been real, but you know, the further you go back, when you're talking about uh, the Jubal and Jabal and Tubal, Cain, all that, they're talking about allegorical things related to the foundations of civil, civilization and how you know, in connection with the stars and planets, because different ages emerged, you know, um, back in the time of Abraham and back in the time of um, Mahal Mahalil and all those, you know. But anyway, you will find the names of all these tribes still today in, in Arabia and certain parts of Africa, though. That's the whole point of my book.
Right. And the one, the one point I want, I want to make real quick is like, so I was touching on the Sabians because so a lot of people will touch uh, hear what you're saying. They're like, oh, well, that's that's esoteric. That doesn't match up with with my or whatever. But I was, I was touching on the Sabians because historically they were seen as like uh, like they were seen as like star worshippers or this, that and the third. But at the, at the end of the day, they're the link to where you can see where henotheism and monotheism really overlap, right. intertwine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera whatnot. Um, and, and so with that, I really want to jump into your book and whatnot. So let me, let me get into this title one more time because it's, it's a very intriguing title. The African and Arabian origin of the Hebrew Bible, exegesis in light of inscriptions, folkloric history, and early ethnography of the Arabian Peninsula. Would you please break down that title for our listeners? Well, first of all, I didn't want that. No, that's not my title. The, the, the first, the second part of the title is mostly mine, but the first part my publisher wanted to change. I had something like um, Into the Deep was my title. It was talking about the Afro Tahama being um it's in reference to the Afro Tahama or the Tahama being the land where you know all these people, uh the, the Israelite Canaanite people originated and spread out, spread abroad. The deep refers to the Tahama. That in the first paragraph of the Old Testament, Tahama is mentioned, but it, it's translated as the deep. So the deep. Um, it's you know very allegorical, but it's also historical, and that's how you know our ancestors use these words. So the exegesis is um, referring to the, the true context of these of the Old Testament, uh, and where these people were, where they went, and why they can't find them in the Levant. Because a lot of people don't know that there's a big <laughs> there's a big problem now that the you know a lot of the biblical archaeologists are saying you know there's no the Old Testament was mainly, you know, mythology, and it wasn't really based on a lot of historic, a lot of history, because they can't really find, you know, the ages don't match up in a lot between these um, happenings of the Old Testament. So, um, I had read a book called um, "The Bible Came from Arabia" a long time ago, and that was introduced to me first in Zahi's uh, lab when um, there was this Yemenite guy that was working there. And uh, he told me about it when I said, when I found out he was from a, the Himyarite tribe of Murad, and I was, you know, I was amazed because he was, looked like it was from Sudan. And, he's, and he said, no, I'm from the Yemen and I'm from the Himyarite, I'm from the Murad. And luckily at Rutgers, I had, you know, taken, borrowed some of these books, which I generally returned. Uh, and um, there was a book by uh, Pritchard James Pritchard that talked about the Murad tribe and the inscriptions of the Himyarites. Uh, so people know, people that are familiar with the Sabians know that the Murad were this, basically the Sabian, was Sabian Himyarite tribe. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me about, and I said, oh my gosh, you know, I had read in the book Born in Sahara in Sudan about Hadad and Shadad and the fact that the, the Berbers claimed origin from uh, the Yemen and, and from Shaddad and Had of the Yemen and stuff like that. And he was saying, oh yeah, Haddad is our, you know, our folk history is, is a mountain of fire. Um, we have, you know, he, he wasn't going to say it because he's Muslim, you know, Muslims don't talk about uh, Shaddad and Haddad in, in terms of, uh, well, they don't even like to talk about the, the folkloric aspects of things anymore. They just, right. you know, they're just straight <laughs> dogma. A lot of, a lot of them, you know, but, um, and so I said, oh my gosh, that's interesting because the Amorites are the people that worshiped Hadad and brought that to Babylonia. Or originally, I thought they had originated Babylonia, but it turns out those were the Amorites. That the Murad and the um, many of the South Arabian folk were themselves Amorites. And they're the ones that brought up this, these gods or these, um, yeah, the gods to Babylon. So one of them was, um, one of their ancestors was, however, uh, named Hadad and Shaddad. These are just generally leaders in the in the ancient Sabian world. You know, they had names like that. And if you look at Berber history and Tuareg uh, tradition, the original before Western people went over and started educating them, as they say, they talk about you know their origins up from Suwar bin Ad and Ifrakush Tuba, the Himyarite, and um, you know people that. And they say that uh, they well they told the colonialists that they left their country about 900 years before Alexander the Great mm -hmm. in their country which was Phoenicia 
before I'm, uh, yeah, before Alexander the Great. So um, this is, would be the same time that the Phoenicians came over to, to Africa, you know, Carthage and all that stuff. So people are thinking like, um, you know, there's something, some people other than the Torah and the other African people that were Canaanites that came to Africa, but no, it was the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, the word Tifanag is related to the word Phoenicians, Phoenag, meaning the, the language means belonging to the Phoenicians. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or belonging to the Phoenag. So, um, you know, it was, there's just a lot of stuff. The fact that they still wear purple, the indigo purple, which was a Phoenician purple, that's where that comes from. Right, made from the hyrax of, of the particular... Uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the rock art, similar to Arabian rock art that they found in Ethiopia and then uh, further westward, um, in terms of the Phoenician artifacts under the Garamantian, uh, some of the Garamantian tombs, all that is because you know, the Torah are kind of late comers compared to the original Berbers, because the Torah weren't even Berbers, they were what's called the Mazik's or Amazik. And the Mazik's, if you look at the inscriptions and if you look at the um, history of the Arabian Peninsula, they were a people of the area of the Wadi Kanana, Canaan, in south of Mecca. And those people, maybe over thousands of years, you know, came across Africa, like they said. But the point to remember in all this is that it's always been, there's always been a civilization since five to 7,000 years ago, both sides of the Red Sea were, um, had been colonized by uh, the same people. You know, the, the names of the tribes are the same. The names of the tribes in ancient times are the same. I don't care if you're talking about the Beja, you're talking about the Bisharin or Bishari, talking about the Hajima or Hadarm people, who are the Hadarm people of Saba, they claim, claim to have come from there. So these people that get upset when, you know, I'm saying that, you know, these people probably moved uh, westward over time from, or maybe a lot of them, um, you, you have to realize that those people are already on both sides of the, of the um, African, you know, both red and African Arabian and African side of the Red Sea. That was, you know, the Afro Tahama civilization for thousands and thousands of years BC. Um, but it just so happens that a lot of them were on the, on the, uh, see, another thing people don't understand Arabia is less than 20 miles away from Africa. You could swim across to Arabia. How the heck? Are these people people going to be different? You're talking about thousands of years ago. How are they going to be different? If they're floating back and forth between the Red Sea and around the coast up into Persian Gulf, and then they colonize Babylonia. They have the same names in Babylonia in, in us and today's Yemen. You'll see some of the black people still having the names Yahar um, in the uh, Yaffe and um, there's other other um, names that were in ancient Babylonia that are still in South Arabia, especially among the darker skinned people, because they were one and the same people at one time. And then other people like the Gucci started coming into the Babylonia and migrating further west from the Zagros um, and kind of the Gucci Kurds, probably the same thing as the Kurds, you know colonize that area. Those are the indigenous indigenous people of Syria and Assyria. After the you know original Semites came there, the black people. So that's how you get this mixture in Babylon and uh well Syria actually was colonized too later on by the Nabataeans, which was became a general name for the black people occupying Arabia. Nabataeans or Ishmaelites and that's why you find uh the sons one of the sons of Ishmael is Nabat or new bait. So, so for people who might not be familiar with your work or Kamal Salibi's work, um, are you saying that that Canaan was originally in, in Arabia or that it extends all the way to Arabia? Well, Canaan was never 
the biblical Canaan was never in Syria. The biblical Canaan and the people called Canaanas were always in uh, the area of south of Mecca. And that's what I had um, found out about Nibal Drew Ali, that he had apparently been, you know, in the company of people who knew that already. So, I mean, so Kamal Salibi also talks about that, about the Wadi Kanauna, and the fact that it extends up to the Tahama or Hejaz area. And then these Canaanite people who are still in the Jordan Valley in black colonized that area. Now, there might have been some early movement of, of Canaanites coming from, um, you know, Arabia into that area, but there's not really evidence of that until, um, you know, after the foundations of Israel. And Israel wasn't founded there, it was founded in South Arabia. And that's what the book is about. Ooh, let's jump into that right there. So for the Israelites and the, and the, and the Christians who might not be familiar with your work, um, right off the top, so you're talking about names that I can find in in Southern Arabia that that, that that I should be able to find, or that I can also find in Levant, etc., whatnot. So, so what what biblical names that that uh, that Israelites and Christians might be familiar with from Genesis, etc., that 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 they might be able to find in Southern Arabia currently through your work? I would say I think I named all of them, or most, almost maybe sixty. No, yeah, maybe sixty percent of. Um, the major tribes of Genesis. I mean, the Dianites are found, the name Keturah or Beit Katir, Katira is still found in um, South Arabia, and those are the ancestors of the Medinites in general, the Afar or Afrin, um, Epha or the Yafi. Um, who else is there? I don't know, I should have gotten the Bible in front of me. <coughs> but, um, you know, when you know that the Midianites and the Canaanites or al Qaim of the Kuda Hemorites were in that area, you know that's where the Israelites came from. from the early Judeans came from the Midianite and Canaanite um, admixture. Because the rulers of the Midianites were actually the Amalekites, who are mentioned in that area until colonial times, the Amalek. And I have that, you know, in different black spots. So the Amalek today also go by the name Jawasim, or Kassim, Kawasim, and they're found around the southern parts, but they're also, you know, people, the people um, have been mixing in, in Arabia. People, the Arabian, after the, after um, 1500 AD has been completely changed in terms of the population biology. So people that go there and start saying, uh, well, they don't have, you know, Africans don't have this J1 stuff that the Syrian, white, white Syrians brought down into Arabia, um, they're missing the whole point. Because most of Arabia, as, as we know from, you know, from descriptions, docu documented descriptions of people as far away as China, were black, very dark purple color, including in the Hejaz, which was, had the same exact dozens of tribes as Central Arabia and as the Assyr and as the Yemen. See, people don't understand that the Yemen, which is called Sudan, as, as late as um, uh, Ibn Khaldun's day, it was considered part of the first zone because the people were black. The first and second zones, I think, of, of, the, of the world for Muslims or people in that day, they used to talk about the first and second zone being part of Sudan, or the, where the environment was hot and black and the people were, the environment was hot and the people were black. So he left the Maghreb out of that at, at that time, they didn't call them, but um, he considered, you know, and some other Syrian people considered, most people considered that the Najed or Central Arabia and the Hejaz were part of Gilad as Sudan for the first and second zones. And that extended up across parts of India to uh, Indonesia and into China. So it's just a very late transition that we've been seeing, you know, after certain dynasties and certain the fall of the of the Cobb Cobb and Muntafi Arabs and in, in um the Fertile Crescent caused a movement of um you know actually other people took over Babylonia and these the Syrianized Arabs also started moving 
southward. The, the Shamar, the Syrian looking Shamar start moving southwards, and the Anaiza, who are also called Ans, still in Yemen, completely different in appearance. But it's these people that move down into uh, the nomads move down into Central Arabia, and you have this mixture of black Arabs or the Arab colored Arabs and the non Arab looking Arabs, who are just people of Syrian, Persian, you know, different fair skin uh, people that are just people who have a mixture of these different, you know, they probably have Arab in them, but also have these Syrian and Persian and Turkish and everything else. So we know that we know that you know in the 15th century, uh, the Chinese were describing the Arabs as black and as very pur dark purple people. That's known. You know, we have the documents for that. And Wesley's put some of that up. I've talked again and again about um, the the emperor. What was it the general that wrote about the Hejaz being you know covered with their very dark purple people. They called the people in um, Malabar, the black people in Malabar, dark purple, while the people in, and they were Dravidian colored people, and the people in Hejaz, very dark colored people. So what does that tell you? It tells you they're darker than, darker than average African Americans. Because at that time, the Malabar was occupied by Kushites. You know, later on, it was pe people and uh, other fair skin people started moving in there, but... Uh, Benjamin Tudela, a Jewish uh, writer who was explorer, and I think he was, a, I forget if he was the 10th or 12th century, wrote about the Malabar people and how they were Kushites who worshipped, or not worshipped, but venerated the star, knew about or read the stars and planets, meaning, referring to the Dravidians. So, um, you know, and you can go through all the tribes of, of Arabs and their descriptions, and, and you could see that, you know, they were definitely not fair skinned by any stretch of imagination. The, Cana the word Canana became the root word for the biblical Canaan, Canaan, or Canaanites, and they're still in various places black. Even in Jordan, where, where they're trying to say that these all these dark skinned Jordan people. And I'm talking about, you know, regular black people. A lot of them are regular black uh, and really almost African-American looking Jordanians, uh, Jordan Valley people. It's called the Gore or the Valley. Um, kings of the ancient Canaanite peoples. And yet people are saying, oh, well, they must have been brought up as slaves there. They have the names of the ancient Nabataean peoples who were described as black. The Nabit or the Nabait, al Nabait. Who gave their name to the empire of the Nabataeans that was in the region, or a civilization of the Nabataeans that was in the region, and had also been in Babylon at one time before that. So, but what I found out curious about that is that the word, the original Nabataeans were actually the same people as the Ansar in Hejaz. These uh, black giants called Azd, Azd, and they were divided into, I mean, not all of the Ansar were giants, but the the Az people, the Khazraj, and the um, Owls, except for their client class or vassal class, with, with giant black people. And that's why I keep mentioning the story of Ubada bin Samet, who was one of the uh, Arab generals that went to Egypt. And the, the guy who was a Byzantine, the Neo Roman ruler, Macalcus, is called because at that time they said Magog, they thought he was that meant European. But um, this, this Byzantine ruler said, keep this black man away from me, he scares me. Um, and then Ubada, it was written that Ubada said, I will, bring, I will bring a thousand men back from Hejaz as black or as big, as big and black as I am or blacker than I am or something like that. And I just thought it was you know, very strange. And, because when I when I went to look at who the Azd were, I found out that the, the remnant of the Azd are the modern Dawasir blacks, who are many of whom are still black giants living in Central Arabia. Um, and Ubada bin Samet, in some uh, one of the traditions, is said to be over eight feet tall. 
And you do find people, you know, mainly among black people in Africa and that in Arabia that are over eight feet tall, including the Watusi. And the Tuareg themselves, who claim descent from the Adites, the, the noble caste of them are still very tall in some places. In some places, over seven feet tall. So these people existed. You know, it's not like when they talked about giants and things like that. These people are giants, some of them. I've yeah, seen I was just going to say that. I was just going to say, so when the Bible talks about giants all over the place, are you saying it's, it's, it's more realistic that this, this would have taken place in, in the Arabian Peninsula or whatnot? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, there could have been giants moved up to, I don't know, moved up to Syria, but I haven't seen <laughs> many. I haven't seen, there are some Lebanese people I've seen that are very, very, very tall that probably have Arab in them. But there's whole groups of people in Africa and in Arabia where there were supposed to be giants called Amalek and Adites. Um, and Jabarin or Iabarin, um, Gebers in the Bible, it's G H E B E R S, um, or Kabiri, the ancestors, worship, the worshippers of Kabirim in groves, the Canaanites. We're talking about these people that used to build megaliths, um, that were in southern Arabia in the, in, in the you know, not to Playa. In, in Nubia, you know, all these people are the same. A lot of these people, especially in um, in Arabia, you have it in the area where the Az people were and where the Canaanite people were. So there's no reason to say that, you know, a lot of these, that's just one aspect of the history that's purely historical. These people, there were people that were over eight feet tall. You know, not, probably near nine feet tall. Who knows? Maybe there was a lot more back then. But, and then there's this very strange phenomena of very small people, small like grasshoppers. The, the Israelites call themselves. You know, we were like grasshoppers in the site. Now you will see the same thing. You'll see um, very small black people, not like, well, probably the same size as pygmies, but they don't look like pygmies because their hair is like curlier, curly kinky. Uh, one of your Moorish friends is calling me. <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. Another person that I was supposed to be interviewing with. Anyway, um, oh, what was I, what was I talking about? You're talking about the, the the shorter people with the with the with the curly oh, yeah, hair. Yeah. So, a long time ago, when I was at the University of Chicago, I was reading a book by colonial colonialist name. I think his name was Richard Burton. And anyway, he's talking about these people that lived in Kaibar, these Jewish people that lived in Kaibar, because somebody who went there in the 15th or 16th century, an Italian, Italian explorer, said these people were, were small and black. They're Jews who slay and skin any Muslim alive that comes within their midst. And so I was like, hmm, that's interesting, Kaibar. Uh, and then I later learned that the, there was a Jew named David Ha Rubaini, Rubaini from the tribe of Reuben that claimed to have come from Kaibar. He was very small, like dwarf-like. Uh, a few years ago, or maybe last year or a few years ago, I learned that he was, there was something that said he was black as a Negro uh, in the medieval Europe. He was an adventurer in medieval Europe that said he came from Kaibar. And that his people, he was a prince of the people of Judah, no, a people of Ga uh, Reuben, Gad, and something, I forget which other tribe. Um, but in that other Israelite tribe in the area. Now, Kaibar is in Hejaz, which was the northern part of Israel for a while. And that's why it talks about that in the Bible, it says Kaburus, or the river Kaburus, the northern part of Israel. So you're saying that the Hejaz, which is the western part of Saudi Arabia currently, uh, where, where, where mm -hmm. the Mecca regions and all that type of, so, so you're saying that that was northern Israel? Yes, that was northern. That was the tip of Israel. It was that most of Israel was further south, where they are today under the same names. Interesting. So, okay. I, wow. So, for for our Israelite family listening, we heard you talked about talk about the Midianites and some other people and whatnot. Um, I, like, so in, in the snippet of your book that uh, that you released, um, I noticed that you talk about the people of Manasseh as well. 
So are there other Israelite tribes right. that people can currently find in the area now via your? Well, aside from um, what I'm trying to say is, see, up until six, 16th, the 16th century, mm-hmm. all right, the, this people like the Sulaim bin Mansur or of Manessa lived in the deserts of or surrounding Kaibar and Medina and that kind of that area, and even further north. And the people were described as black. Sulaim and another tribe living in the Haras of Arabia and, and Syria were described as black by al Okay, so not only that, but and like I show in my book, there is document of saying of somebody saying that the tribe of Manasseh occupies the desert of Medina. They're talking about the tribe of Mansur or Manas- Manasir, as they're known in Arabia and in Sudan and elsewhere, um, because the IR is you know, basically an ending in, in that language. Um, so Sulaim bin Mansur or, or Hawazin bin Mansur or Suleiman bin Mansur, those are tribes of people that live in that area. They're also found in further south, you know, and down to the Yemen, but also into Africa because they were the same people. The, the, um, the, the word Sulaim itself is the Salini of, Ju- of Josephus, who were Salma, Salma, uh, who was of the tribe of Manasseh. Look at look. If you look at the Bible, you'll see the same names of these people. If the clan names of the Sulaim and the, the Harb and the Hawatate and other dark skinned people that are there, they're the same people as are in mentioned in Judah in the Bible, as Judeans in the Bible, like in Nehemiah and the Book of Ezra. The same exact names. Okay, so all these people, Hawatate, who I don't know how you pronounce it, Huaytat or Hawatate. They have clan names that are similar to those in the, or almost identical to those in the Genesis and in Nehemiah, where they talk about the Judeans. And that's because these people came from the Tahama and further south. And the same thing for the Canaanites. You find that all the Canaanite names, you found the Edomites, all the Edomite names in the Yemen today. And some of these people you'll also find in the Horn of Africa as well as across, especially in the, the area. Um, well, I would I would have to say the, um, like you know the name um, Zagawa itself, the name Zagawa or Zawaga, which is the one tribe, you know, it's, that's Arabic for Zagai or Sakai. And that's why in one of the traditions and some of the traditions it says that Sakia was the son of, uh, Son of Islatan, son of Misraim, son of Ham, right? Um, they're talking about Sakai. If you look at in the Bible, you'll see Sakai is one of the Judean tribes. And the Judeans are people that came from a place called Misram, Misraim in Nedron in the Yemen. It has nothing to do with modern day Egypt. And that's why in all Ar- Arabic tradition, you'll see that the names of these Amalekite rulers of the Mis- Misraim region are those mentioned in South Arabian inscriptions today. So Egyptologists have, you know, create a, a big morass of chaotic nonsense with regards to chronology and uh, who the, you know, ancestors of the Egyptians were, who the ancestors of the biblical Hyksos were, because that's also related, you know, also related. You know, they can't find out who these people are because they mixed up chronology and the, and the <laughs> mixed up the biblical Mitzrayim with modern Egypt, which only get, got its name from the people that settled, settled there later. Mm. Yeah. And people, if you go if you go look it up, you'll see that the word Pharaoh also was not used for the Egyptian rulers. It's actually a, a South Arabian, it was actually a, word for, a title of South Arabian rulers. Okay. South Arabian rulers, the South Arabian people colonized and were already related to the people in the 
up on the opposite side of the Red Sea. And that's why you find in Strabo and Diodorus and Josephus, you'll see they call on the people Sabians and along the Nile. Sabians are an Astaborans, Subteca, because the Kush, that the Kushites, the Sabians, the Canaanites were all one people. They lived on both sides. Now, I don't know which came first in terms of, um, you know, the Medianites crossing, you know, the Medianites probably crossed from Arabia, not, you know, first, after, after they settled there, after the Semites settled in Arabia, you know, the people that came back across the Red Sea were the Medinites. They settled in Troglodytes, which was, you know, the area now Somalia in the Afar region. That's why you have the name. Joseph has said that the Medinites settled, the children of Keturah settled in, in the Ethiopian Troglodyte area. So the Ethiopian Troglodytes were basically, uh, you know, these Medinite people. Another thing I put up, um, well, another thing that was very interesting to discover was, well, I had already known that the Kara, Al Kara tribe that lived in Oman and Yemen, that they were, um, you know, black and kind of like the Mahra, they were remnants of the early South Arabian people. But what I didn't know is that these are the people that were related to the Canaanites. These are people that were not only in Yemen, but were in Hejaz. The, the al Hara were part of the um, confederation called Habashi, Habashi, not, see that name, Hab Habashi? Mm -hmm. It might even be related to their name of Habash, which was the name of mountains in the, in the Hejaz area. And these Kinana people, Interesting. al Kara and Hun, al Hun, or Haun, um, they were all Kuzaima, Mudika, Hudhail, they were all black people up until recently. The Hudhail are still probably black, I don't know. But Charles Forster, I think his name was, or Doughty mentioned the, the Charles Doughty, I think, mentioned the Hudhail as having black and Chinese skins. And Hudhail bin Mudrika was the brother of um, Kunana bin was the, was the uncle of uh, Kinana. And the Kinana was the tribe that the Quraysh came from. And the Quraysh was the tribe that the prophet of Islam came from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you put <laughs> if you put all of those together, two and two together, the fact that there's still Quraysh that are black living in Sinai and, and Israel, you, you can see what, why, they, why the early Europeans uh, portrayed Muhammad as a black man, as a Negro. Right. If you and look I, at okay. Crusader Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 I interrupt, I interrupt you. Go ahead, please. No, I'm just saying, if you look at the Crusader pictures of them fighting with shields, you know, they, the, the Europeans said that they always put a, their, their leader on their shields. So, if you look at the few pictures they have of the of the um, what do you got? the Saracens with their shields? What do they have on their shield? They have a, a black man with you know big lips. And stuff. So that that just show goes to show that you know it doesn't matter what where you look. There's evidence of all around where what the Arabians were. You know it, the the Quraysh Kanana were Ish, is were Ishmaelites as well. Ishmael. Ishmael and Canaan were connected people. The Hamathites were the Hamite people or the children of Ham. It had nothing to do with Africa, just meant the Hamite, the Hameda people that were there. And I have, you know, the evidence showing that as well. But if you look at, um, and, and, and that was actually made, I first came across this. I wouldn't have come across this unless this person who Kind of controversial in the Moorish community, Lord Abba, I'll mention him. I was reminded that Hamathites are called the children of Ham by him. Yeah, and the throat, yeah. I was just about to mention that about the Hamathites. Yeah, that the Ham and Hamath were the same, were considered the same. That's where the word Ham came from. And that really referred to there being the agricultural 
or um, the ham, the ham, uh, what's the word? It comes from the fact that they were dealing with the vineyard and the ham and the and the the fields. They were the agricultural client castes of the um, you know the, the Shemites, the Shem, just meaning the Amalekites and the you know, other Medinite people. So we're not talking about different different uh, colored colors of people. We're talking about different uh, economic um, levels, I guess, or economic um, circumstances. The pastoralists are called today Simran, and the, and the um, agriculturalists are called the Hamran. Hamran. So even in you know in Syria, I got to ask a question. Part of culture had to. No, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have a lag right quick. Cause I, I mean, I'm starting to cut in, get into your words right quick. But uh, go ahead. Oh, say that okay. no, no, I was just saying that that's part of the the Arabian Afro-Asiatic culture. I mean, even in India, you have the same thing. Uh, a legend about Kamar and I think it's Sim Simar, and you have it in the Bundahistan. Bundahistan, some um, I guess medieval. Hindu epic. It talks about the sons of Maluha and Moses. So talking about the Amalekites, you know, and um, Musa they call them. And that uh, what was it Hema, Hama, Sima, and Jaspita, or Japhet, because all of these were the names of you know different deities. Jupiter, Jaspita. Um. So, go ahead. You can ask a question. Hold on, hold on, real quick. Are you saying that the Jupiter is linked to Japheth? Yes. Okay. And Japheth. And Japheth. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm, we're definitely going to have an esoteric conversation around, too. We're definitely doing that with. Mm -hmm. uh, but, real quick, though, for my Morris family, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question. So, I heard you talk about uh, the, the Hamada as the Hamatites, and then also the, that the Mitzrayim was, in, was, in, was, a, was a people in Yemen, right? So for yeah. people who aren't familiar, in, in, in the Circle Seven Corona talks about that, that uh, that the, the there's a, there's a hold on, let me pull it up so I don't I don't back and say it wrong. But the, but the context is is the concept of uh, there being a link between the Hamathites and, and the people of Mitzrayim being the people of Egypt. Um, and so, um, actually, let me just leave it there. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem is that it was mixed up um, in later times. Of the Mitzrayim people, who are still called Musri in in Arabia, with and they were Menaean people, the earlier kind of an earlier Sabian people, um, or the Ma'in, the people who founded Christianity, the Minim. Um, that area is, I think, northern Yemen, is where that is. And then and there's um, another place called the Egypt or Mitzrayim of. Um, it's called Sahul, Sahul in Yemen. But um, I brought that up to say that that is why, that's part of the reason why biblical archaeologists haven't found an exodus from from um, Egypt, the modern African Egypt, because it never existed. The only exodus that took place was from by the Azd people in South Arabia, from Marib or Mariba. Or, or, yeah, Marib and Mariba in the Exodus, you'll see Exodus 17 talks about Mariba. But, um, yeah, I'll, and all the names of the tribes, you can find Eben, the Ebenezer, um, and that I've learned recently. Um, and then you can find the, or the Yaban tribe, and you can find the Philistines and all these, uh, Basically, I traced, you know, for where the Levites went and all the, because they had their Arabian names or their Afro-Asiatic names. I figured out which, you know, which ones they were mm -hmm. and put it in the context, you know. So is Marib uh, the place where they're finding the, from my recollection, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, isn't where they're finding the remnants of the Queen of Sheba? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's where she lived, yeah. Well, that's, apparently, she was more than one Queen of Sheba, but yeah. Right, 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 right. Me and, me and uh, Makeda of uh, Lacandes of Nubia might have been another, you know, consider herself a descendant of Queen of Sheba too, because, um, you know, the, the Ethiopians know that they 
that at least some of them know that they were, arrived from Arabia many years ago, many millenniums ago, or se several millenniums ago, three millenniums ago, some of them, and some much later too. So this is where we get the term in history as divided as the Sabians, correct? Well, I used to think so, but there was another thing that happened. There was a, sp a spreading of the Sabians after it's actually like the spreading of the Canaanites it was was a reference to the spreading of the um, Sabians after the Marib, you know, after the uh, flood of the Marib Dam, and the people went, were, you know, just spread across Saba. So you can read about that in Said of Andalusia's works and other other um, medieval writings. Okay. Yeah. But some of them did, like I say, move into Africa at that time. That was like, what was that, a thousand, over a thousand years BC. So if you're talking about that long ago, that's plenty of time for people to, you know, start out as a few thousand and then grow into millions. So there's no point in getting, you know, defensive about, oh, these were, you know, there's no proof that Africans came over. There's plenty of proof because of the fact that Joseph has even said that there were, or was Joseph is, or somebody else said that the El uh, Eldad Hadani, that's another tribe that's still in Yemen, Don, Don Bahila, or Bilha, as, as the Bible calls her, calls them her. And she was a queen in ancient Arabia as well, mentioned by the Assyrians, because at that time a lot of the um, rulers were queens. That's why that's why I say there are many queens, queens of Sheba, but um not, not interestingly, I remember the Named Bilkis comes in. Bilkis, Bilha. Well, anyway, as I was saying, um, all the names of the the Israelite peoples are still found in Yemen, and the Yemenites Jews themselves claim that they never came from anywhere else. So that's kind of like an invention of the Western world and the other the converted people to Judaism, people who had converted been converted to Judaism. Yeah, please touch on that. Well, after, um, you know, the Romans, after the Romans colonized certain parts of the Jazz and Sinai and all those areas, um, you know, there was a lot of trading that went on between the, these Phoenician people and these Solomian people, and they settled in Rome and actually ended up in converting a lot. A lot of people were converted to Judaism. So the first... European Jews were actually Romans, and then they found genetically that those were those first uh, Judaized people were tied to people that went to Spain, not necessarily to North Africa, but to Spain, and then to um, the Khazar area or the Turkish area. So that's how you get all these different, you know, different um, European Jews who do have Jewish ancestors but you know not as they're not as pure Jew as as they like to think they are I'll just put it that way <laughs> because we know that because once they found that the Lemba genes the Lemba people have the African Bantu Lemba have more Kahin genes as a group as a whole group of the especially the Buba clan and then most uh European even Kahin people I think themselves, European Italian people. That shows you how close the the uh, no, what the people were genetically. You know, they were more related to African Jews, or at least those African Jews, than they were to those European Jews. Now, like I say, the Kahin, the Kahin were the people that occupied Kaibar and these you know these areas. That's you can look that up. And what did the Kaibar? How are they described? And who were they? We know that their names actually correspond to certain early Arabian groups that settled the area. They didn't come from Syria. The early Jews did not come from Syria. They were Arabian people that came from the Yemen, where they still are. Many of them still are there. And the Yemenites don't claim, these. many of these Yemenite Jews do not claim to have come from Israel. They say, you know, we've been here, especially the ones around Sana'a both the white and the black, because there was people that came in later from, just like in Afghanistan, uh, 
to probably from Afghanistan. Um, just like they moved into Malabar later too, the, the uh, fair skin group. So, I don't know what, what was I bringing up about the Jews and you wanted me to talk about more. Well, yeah. you were talking, you were talking about the, the, the Jews in Yemen said that they, they, they didn't, they, they come from Yemen, that they didn't come from somewhere else. And that there was yeah. a Western construct. That and they, that and they, look at, look at what Benjamin Tudela said. Um, he wrote that most of the Jews are in the Yemen or the Yemen, which was actually a little, a little further north than it is now. It's, you know, it could have been up some of times, you know, in some text it refers to an area going up to Central Arabia, you know. Um, so as far as he was concerned, like then that was a thousand years ago. Over oh, that, well, I don't know, maybe a little less or a little more. Um, the Jews, the Hebrews, or I should say the Hebrews, I'm not going to say the Jews. The Hebrews in general, most of them were in Yemen. That was the largest population of Hebrews in Yemen. Okay, that's an interesting term I want to touch in. I want to jump in on right quick. So you're saying Hebrews now, right? And so so when people get familiar with your work, they're going to get familiar with the concept of you, you linking the term Hebrew to the term uh, like Berber and Berry Berry and Eber. Um, well, see, there was a... The, Abraham was supposed to be Hebrew, or Abram, and Abram, and those are people that were in the Yemen too, where, where they still are, in the Hadramaut, in fact. The Hadramaut has these kind of people. Um, and Tabari Al Tabari says that the Eber lived between the, the dead and this Hadramaut area. Now, see, that's the that's the reason why we have to learn Arabic because these these Arab Arabized people are talking a lot about you know, the roots of Afro-Asian culture and the Bible. Yeah, real quick, not, not, not to catch you, just, just so people know what you're talking about. So Al Tabari is, is, a, is a Islamic historian or whatnot. And she also mentioned someone earlier, uh, uh, al Khajaz or al Jahaz, excuse me, um, who, who was, is a very important person to go look into because he was, he was a black Arabian who wrote, who wrote a, a treatise on, on, on the black Arabians on, and, uh, no. Jahiz? He wasn't black. He wasn't black. al Jahiz wasn't black? No, he wasn't. I stand corrected. No, he was a, he was an Iraqi who may have had an African grandfather. The only reason that black people or black Americans, as usual, like to say he was black is because he had bulging, <laughs> bulging eyes. <laughs> well, well, I knew him because of his treatise on, on the black. No, listen, listen, let me just tell you something. He was he had black in him probably. But he was basically an Iraqi and he was kind of racist. He made racist jokes about black people. He was talking about the Nabatian, for example, um, looking like they had, well, I, I forget what he said, but looking like they had tails, their butts were so big they looked like they had tails, something like that. <laughs> but but um, he, wasn't, he was basically Arab, somebody with black blood, but not modern Arab, more like a modern Arab. He wasn't black, well, he wasn't, a, he wasn't pure Arab. Let's just put it that way. He was probably Iraqi. And my heart has been broken live on air. As I used to, as I was up until now, I was thinking that Al Jahiz had written a treatise on, on Black Arabians and was was proud, proud about being a Black Arabian or whatever. So, never mind. But still go well, check well, out. He was trying to give credence to the people who were calling themselves Arabs. He was saying, "You look, look the Salim and the, the all the tribes of the Hara." Which are eight hours and actually eight hours in Yem, uh, in uh, Arabia alone, I think, extending way up into the Horan and Syria, where there's still black people. They're trying to say are descendants of slaves. Um, he said all those people, all of the people of the Hara were black because of the environment and their their the fauna and the domesticated animals were black, which they still are, except for the people are not anymore a lot in a lot of these places. So, yeah, he said that the Sulaim, um, and he's not the only one who talked about the Sulaim being black, too. But the interesting thing about the Sulaim is that it's the Israelite, Israelites in Egypt, the real Israelites in Egypt, who used the term, they replaced the term Sulaim with Salma. And that's why I was saying to you, like, it's kind of, now it's going to be hard to say that those people are not the same as Salma that was descended from Manessa. 
or the Judeans who are descended from another. So anytime we're talking about Arabs, just you know you're talking usually about one of these people of the Bible, of the Torah, or the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, called Israelite, Canaanite, Edomite. Edomites were not and are not Europeans. They are known by their same names in Arabia, and many of them are still dark skinned or black, near black. What would be some of the names in Arabia now? I know you probably said them earlier, but uh, just to clarify, what are some of the names of what? Uh, the 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 so called uh, the people you're talking about Edomites now in Arabia. Um. Well, what are some of the Edomite names? And I'll tell you. Besides Adam, the the Adam area, which is still the red, the Red Mountain area. Um, I have to get the Bible. To that'll work. No, there, that that'll work right there. That's a that's a good reference right there. Um, but real quick, I want to I want to touch on what you were talking about in terms of learning Arabic and whatnot, because I think there's a very important concept in that that a lot of people, even particular people. Oh, hold on, hold on, though. I want to finish, like because I did a whole thing on Aparigenetics Blogspot about the Edomites and their names. I'm trying to think. There's Dishan or the the Dushane, as they're called today. Um, Ezir or Azir, Asir. Okay. Um, there's. Let's see who else is there. Um, Akan. That's still the name of the um, of one of the tribes. People try to, or the Kani, or Kanari, as Tabari said, they were also called. People try to relate to the name Akan. I'm not sure of that, but the name Kanuri may very well be connected, and the Kanuri call themselves. Very, very. So this is uh, the sister's website, afroasiaticblackspot.com. And so real quick, I'm going to go see if I can find what she's talking about in her uh, in her search engine real quick. Yeah, if you had, if you um, put in... Uh, Here Edomite. we go. Edomites, Hebrews, and Israelites in ancient and modern Afro-Arabia. Is that, is that the one? Mm-hmm. I think that should be one of them, yeah. If you go down to the bottom, it gives you a list of the names of the people. Okay. The Dawah pyramid, that was Dawah, that's a Canaanite man, Kinana of Israel. Yes. Now, I've seen you see, see wow. why they see very dark purple people. Wow. And so yeah. would that be would that be an example of when you when you talk about shining skin? In, I can't see from here. But okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's very small, but I apologize. I, apologize. I, apologize. Okay, I forgot you're on, the, you're on a whole different situation, but okay, I'm gonna try to go find these names right quick, and we'll get into that part later. Um, but yeah, so the names of the um, yeah, if you look up Mahalil, if you look up um, let's see, okay, there we go. So there's Mahalil, let's see. Oh, Molly. Oh, Molly. Um, do, you, do you have it listed under, under Edomites in it or something like that? Do you have um, the name Dishan there? D I S H O N? Or Dishan? Dishan? D I S. If you, if you search, if it's not on there, that might not be the right one. G I S. D I S H A N. D I or G? Or Horan. D shan D D. Okay. But in in Arabic, it's Dushane Dushane. Okay, we got Dushan right there. Okay. Dishan. Okay. What am I saying about that? I, I don't know. That's just one of the uh, blog spots where I post. They're corresponding to the children of Esau or or Hamdan, Ishban, Ithran, Lotan, oh, yeah. Yashzan, Altana, Bilhan, Ruel, Dishan, Esur, Akan, As, Aya, and and then Iram bin Kedar. Wow. Yeah, if you look further up, you'll see those names, the same names. But Hamdan, I mean, that's a, <laughs> yes, the Hamdan tribe was related to the, the um, Sabians. They were a Sabian tribe mentioned in Sabian inscriptions. And the Marad and people like that were, were closely related to them. Fantastic. And see, this is what I want to touch on what you were saying about the about the Arabic and whatnot, is in, in the sense. So a lot of what I tell a lot of my, my Israelite friends is the fact that so with it, uh, in, in the claim of being of being taken in, into slavery and whatnot, um, mm -hmm. they, they they struggle to find things in like is in, in Hebrew or whatnot. And I try to tell them like, well, you're not going to really find it in Hebrew. You're going to find it more so in Arabic and whatnot. 
because that that was the language of the people that they were amongst at the time and whatnot, i.e. in Spain or even in West Africa amongst the Moors and whatnot. So like the Moors in West Africa, like their 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 lingua franca is Sanya Arabic, right? Which is a very particular kind. Of, so you're talking about Sabian and 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 uh, and, uh, and Hemirite and, and Yemenite and all this type of stuff. And, yeah. and people don't recognize it's like the Hassania Arabic and even the Hebrew in the in the in the in the in the, in the Maghrib. It has a heavy Yemenite flavor to it and a heavy Hemirite flavor to it. And people aren't really familiar with the with the Hemirite and. Uh, well, uh, well, the Hassania came over later though. They they came over with the Islamic invasions. Those are more those are more Arabs. They're not really. They're Yemenite, recent Yemenite peoples. You know, they came over like a, less than a thousand years ago. Agreed. I was just talking about about about, about how, how how it affected the language and, and whatnot, and from, and from what direction. Oh. Oh, it, okay. it, it also it also touches on what you talk about in terms in terms of the migration from 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 the Berbers of East Africa, like in, in the Somali region, etc., all mm -hmm. the way to West and North Africa, and whatnot. And so people can actually okay. people can follow the, the can follow the, the the language almost like a fingerprint in a sense. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, oh, that's yeah. That's a good good point. Um, yeah. And so I want, but I do want people to recognize that there's yeah, there's been several waves of groups of people, and that was like one of the last waves of the black man over into Africa. You know, the, the Arabs. The Arabs are the Sulaim Sulaim housing group, which they belong to, and that's where you get the uh, modern Sudanese, and that's why they look a little different than uh, you know they've been absorbing people. Um, very until you know they only crossed over after the night. I think after the ninth, most of them after the ninth century, you know, with the Salim and Hawazin and people like that. Um, so you know, you, you see that their hair is a little straighter and um, their features might be a little bit different, but in general, um, the Moors, the original Moors, are very, very did not, you know, they were less. Um, had less absorption of Eura Eurasian people, less absorption of Eurasian type people, so they look more like African, and that's what the original Arabs look like, because modern day Arabs are not, you know, they're mixed with different groups, including the dark skinned ones. Most of them are mixed with different groups. And I had put on the Facebook um, pictures of the Persians, I mean, the Persian. <laughs> Persian culture in uh, in the Assyr and um, places where they wear the flower flower hats because those are that's an Indo-European Indo-Aryan or not even Aryan because the early Aryans are Nabataean but <laughs> Indo-European traits you know their their culture the people men, now living in the Assyr that paternalistic Arab culture so-called Arab culture is really largely influenced by the people of Persia, Afghanistan, um, northern India. They still wear those uh, flower flower hats in northern India. So you find that all over the Assyr area where these, you know, these people have since entered. And in the in the southern in the Yemen, a lot of the tribes like the Beit Katir or Katur Al Katira, Katura, as they're used to be is it's translated in the Bible. They're, they, according to the colonialists, were taking Persian women or Iranian women as slaves. Not, not slaves, as concubines. So, you know, the whole of the Yemen has been, you know, changing. Turks have come into the Yemen. Iranians and other Abna, Abna have come into the Central Arabia and the Yemen. Syrian groups have migrated south since the 17th century. The nomadic Syrianized Arabs that used to be black, because the black people, the black men, were taking a lot of women that were not Arab. So it's not, you know, it's not their fault, but <laughs> uh, it's not their fault that they're not don't look Arab anymore. But um, so you have people have to realize that a lot of the intermixing that's gone on has changed the face of Arabia, just like North Africa. I put up some some history about why, uh, you know, why it doesn't look like it did when the uh, Arabs wrote about the Berbers being black. You know, the Ar not only the Arabs but the um, Spanish Spaniards, like Isidore of Seville, talking about Tangiers in the north of Spain, talking about the Moors that came into his 
his um into the Iberian Peninsula in his era of the seventh century uh, as black as night because those people occupied the coast of, of um, North Africa and were influenced later by other groups, you know. Now there were also Vandals, Vandals and other people, um, Lombards and other people, but like I say, also Genoans, Genoan merchants that came in after um, the, the Moors, Moorish or Muslims were kicked out of um, the Iberian Peninsula, hundreds of thousands of Andalusians went, you know, some of them came into North Africa, some of them went into France, um, and a lot of those people were not black, they were, you know, fair-skinned people, just Germanic and or Spanish related people. Um, the Levant people have come in, people from, in other words, where Israel is now, or Syria, and um, Lebanon, those people also were being brought in, even since Roman times, you know, into into North Africa. That's why Gildo, I mean, that's why um, Claudian, the, the Roman or Neo-Roman, I forget which one, fourth century AD talks about Gildo the Moor taking his, taking the Roman women of the Levant, you know, because they were being traded from that area. And, you know, in the how they were making mixed children. Um, and by Gildo meaning the Tuareg, because the Tuareg were the ones that called their rulers Galadi, or still call their rulers Galadima, Awalid Galadima, and it's related to the word Goliath. And that's where you get, you know, the word Goliath in, uh, or Galiates in um, not only the Aegean, but in the, you know, in the, in the Torah where it talks about the Philistines because the Philistines and the Amalek, 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 they were the same people. That's why it's so ridiculous to talk about the Philistines coming from Macedonia, or wherever they're trying to say now. The Philistines were, were Philistine al Fulais, or Yemenite people. And they're still, they were mentioned in uh, Yemen in, in um, colonial times, al Fulais. And in fact, Kamal Salibi said the word was related to Falasha. But of course, you know, Today, Falasha means something else, he means like a foreigner or something like that. But he said that he, he suspected that the word Falasha and Al-Fulais were originally related, so. Wow. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so the Tuareg or, or, and the Zagawa or Zagai people became interrelated because, like I said, the Zagai uh, were the the agricultural smiths and the well there were also some pastoralists among them because they had the belly belly Tagawa. but um the name also goes into Songhai correct yeah so I was gonna, yeah I was just gonna say that that's why I lost track the the guy or Usu, Usuigan tribes became the Songhai or the Suga they were called Sugai and in in the African language groups you often put in the N Songhai. Just like in uh, East Africa, you have the Afar, but the Somali call them the Anfar. Um, so the Sugai, or um, also called Wangara, Wangara, or Wakur, and um, these traders also became known as Aswanek or Sonink. Soninke. So first, the Zagawa spoke probably Nile Saharan and Chadic languages and then they adopted the uh, language of the Niger Congo groups that they settled amongst. So you have some and the, here's where the Igbo and the um, Yoruba come in. Some of these groups also settled among them. They're called Dukan, Kwararafa, Kwararafa. Um, let's see what else. Uh, um, is it Bupier or Bupier? But anyway, all these groups claim to come from the same place, which is Canaan, and they claim to have been Jews, including the Sony Kanuri groups or Barry Barry. Now, what I was saying before about the Sakai is if you look up, look it up, it's one of the children, I think, of Heber, H-E-B-E-R, or Ashur. And the word Berber, as you will look up, you'll see it. Oh, they say it means um 
speech or barbarian or bar one who speaks a barbaric dialect. And in the Afro-Asiatic languages, Canaanite Semitic languages, the word does mean to speak or fount or fountain or speech or mouth. Like in the Gala, I think the word means mouth. Or bear, berry means mouth or something, something of that sort. But um, there's no question that all these, the berry, berry, and the Zagai people or the Songhai people were the same people, and the Khmeri too. And these groups settled among the Hausa, and that's why you find a lot of the Hausa that have the same thing, the same horse tradition. And you'll find that wherever the, these people are, they were very um, uh, prolific horse horse breeders and horse trainers. And they went out to Spain, they, the word uh, Zanet or Zanata, Jeanette comes from the Zanata, which were, was the name of these people when they went to the, the, the Waga Berbers are considered part of the larger Zanata group or Zanet group. So um, yeah, it's very interesting. And I don't know if you noticed in the, <laughs> In the recent movie about um, Roots, you'll see uh, how they changed the narrative where Kunta Kinte is wearing the loincloths and you know really big lips and stuff to uh, the scholar, this young man scholar who's riding horses in in um, and he's wearing, he's wearing a turban. Timbuktu and all that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that was a little higher, better, you know, portrayal of more probably like what you know the original. Kunta Kinte was, if that was his name, because apparently, according to Tariq Berry, the guy that wrote, who was in, I don't know which Arab country, I forget, keep forgetting what Arab country he comes from, but he wrote the book um, uh, on the unknown Arabs. Mm -hmm. And he said that the word Kunta Kinte means, I am from the Kunta tribe. Now, the Kunta Tadmakaka were related to the one of the Moorish. Um, Moorish, Moorish man-related tribes. From Mauritania, correct? Not necessarily. It could have been from Senegal. It could have been from um, right. yeah, any of the West African, you know, probably not, probably not Morocco, but you know, between at that time it was called you know what the Sahel it? region, basically. It was called actually Mauritania and Senegal, uh, Senaga, the Senaga region. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now. Hey. Oh, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, so I was just going to say, so those were the first slaves brought to Portugal, the Zanaga or the Black Zanets. Those were the, the Songhai people that they call them Azawaga, Azawag. Oh, so um, would, this be in, would this be under the Papal Bulls, like from uh, uh, like uh, Intercaitera and from uh, Doom Diversus, et cetera, whatnot, from like 1453, et cetera? Like, so you're saying this first slaves brought to Portugal? Wow. I think from Lagos, from Lagos. Yeah, and um, that's where probably all those men you see with the, the nose rings and stuff and the black men and the paintings from Portugal or the Japanese paintings on Portuguese blacks, they might have been those people. See, this is where I want, I want to jump into the to the to the slave trade aspect of things because so in uh, in those paper bulls it talks about the fact that the that the that the the slave trade was being specifically inflicted upon the Saracens and then also other pagans in the area and whatnot. And so Saracens, it kind of gets muddied at, at one point to where like it can mean just any, any of the Muslims and whatnot. But at one point it also means like the lineage of Sarah and whatnot. So like it almost, it almost has like a, a dual, a dual entendre, a double entendre to where it means like a Muslim slash or more and also like an Israelite and whatnot. And so what I find interesting about your work is that, is that you're talking about a lot of different Hebrew people in general, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, well, well, the right? word Saracen, according to today's scholars, actually meant somebody that came from the East, Shirak, Shiraku, mm -hmm. some, you know, something related to the East word East. But early Christian Europeans said that the word actually was like a play on the word Sarah. Yes, Sarah, the Baron Sarah, the Sarah, Sahara. So, Sarah, like I said, the early. Abraham Sarah allegory is uh, it has to be taken into account there, but they were also called Hagaranoi or Agaranoi, a car. 
And that word comes from, it's of course related to Hagar. Mm -hmm. So, and Hagar was a myth of the Mitzrayim, not Egypt, but of the Mitzrayim. And there were people called Kipti, Gipti in South Arabia too. So I think what happened was over time, all those different groups that, you know, did settle in uh, the Nile Valley got confused and, you know, they probably after, during middle, medieval era, era started to, um, you know, customarily use Egypt in, in Africa as the Mitzrayim of the, of the uh, Torah. But um, yeah, Hagar, according to um, Al Hakami, I think it was, he went, he was one of the early Arabs, a true Arab, I think, in, in Egypt. And he said, you know, we have to consider the Egyptians one of us because we share the same mother, Hagar, and their hair is crinkly, like, you know, like us. Their hair is crinkly and they're, they're black and their hair is crinkly. They come from the black earth, like our mother, Hagar. Well, the word Hagar is, Ahagar and is related to the word earth, you know. Uh, it's a place where people, it refers to the settlement of people as well. It's a city or this place people settle. So, you know, it's just a very complicated, you have to know all the nuances of what what the Arabic language and the culture is about. Right. This is right. what earlier Orientalists knew, but modern modern um, people don't, sometimes don't pick that up, don't pick up all the uh, semantics, you know, semantic connection. But, um, yeah, so all the, all the Ishmaelites, Ishmael was supposed to have been born from um, the emergence of the Jurham tribe of Yemen. And um, uh, oh, I can't think now. But anyway, they met, merged and they spread out from the Hejaz. Um, but, you know, all the people that they're mentioning, the Batians and all the Ishmaelite peoples, they came from the Yemen as well. And in fact, the Nabataeans, al Nabait, as I said, was one of the tribes of Aus, or Aus and Aus, who was, or Uz. In the Bible, he's called Uz. Okay. And, and Uz and um, Kazwaj were the Ansar that lived in Hadez. So um, these al Nabait, apparently, they're the ones that brought this, the, they were originally called Thamud. Part of the you know remnants of the Adites who lived in Iran, which is in um, Hadjimaut, and in well, it's in the place in Yemen and Hadjimaut, but the um, and this later became Aram, you know the Arameans. When you talk about the wandering Arameans, that's why the Nabataeans are called Arameans, Canaanites, and Cushites by the Arabs, or in the medieval Arab Arabic texts, because they were all one people from the Yemen. In Iram, Iram, and um, you know, Ad and Aram too are related in the Arab texts. Ad and Aram, again, yeah, not from um, Iraq. And you know, see, my problem I have a problem with also the Middle East. It's not just the Europeans that do this, the Middle Eastern people, Middle Eastern um, non Arab people, and non Semitic people started writing about, you know, how they were where Ur and all these other uh, places were and that they were the the Arabs because everybody at that time wanted to be Arab. You know, they painted their faces black so they could be Arabs and that kind of thing. There's documentation about that. You know, after the Umayyad, Mayad period, the Abbasids, uh, the early Abbasids were apparently Arab too, but gradually these other people like the um, you know, Syrian, Turks, Persian, many Turks and Persian came to view themselves as more, um, somehow more Arab than me, or more in charge of Islam than the Arabs. Um, and even though, you know, the word, the, the Turks and the, and the Persians originally were considered like slaves, they were called the slaves, you know, the slaves. And that's why in the, in Al Dahabi's work, I guess that was 14th century. He was a Syrian. He said, when we visited, visited Jazz, 14th century, now we're talking about, 
He said he didn't see any fair-skinned people. They were all Hudar or, or whatever, how you pronounce it. And he said the reason is, he said the, if you saw a fair-skinned uh, person in Hejaz, he was automatically considered to be a descendant of slaves. Just like in America, you know, if you saw a dark skin, whatever, in the, in the, in the South that was was um, in charge of a plantation or whatever, he was automatically seen to be, um, or owned plantations, because they did own plantations and were slave owners in the South and America too. You know, they were consider considered to be, oh, well, he's a descendant of slaves, you know. But in this case, it, in both cases, it might have been true, but especially in, um, in Arabia. Because even though originally the um, Arabs were slaves, and that's why you get the curse of Ham, because the Arab people were slaves of the Persians or the pre, was it the Sassanid period, I think? Um, was it Parthian or Sassanid? The period right before the Lachmids took over, the Lachim tribe took over, who were Azd people. I want to say Sassanid, but. Yeah, it might have been Sassanid, probably Sassanid. I should know that. Um, they were actually the slaves or the vassals of the these uh, uh, Iranic or Persian people, white Persian people. See, what you're saying is very powerful in the sense. It, it, so, a lot of people, you, you're saying we need we need to learn Arabic, and a lot of I think a lot of reasons why people of, of our of our of our ethnicity don't learn Arabic is because when they hear about Islamic stuff, they hear about it from from like what you're talking about from the from the Persian or the et cetera, the non the non true Arab source of it or whatnot, and, right. and a lot of people don't understand that there was a large hijacking of Islam. For instance, I, I remind people, for instance, when when the Moors went into Spain in 711 A.D., that they they had no mad they had no school of jurisprudence when they went in. That uh, mm -hmm. that uh, those 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 are as a matter of fact that the people over in the east actually came over to the Moors and asked them to create schools of jurisprudence like the Maliki school and the Zahiri school, et cetera, and whatnot. Um, so so they 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 they. I, I want I want a lot of people listening to walk away from this conversation understanding that 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 there's there's a original information that the sister's talking about in terms of like where it comes from us and and then there's people that she keeps saying who aren't from us who are who are who are uh, what would be the word I'm looking for uh, redacting the information in, in in a way you know what I'm saying they're changing usurping <laughs> I was trying to be nice and that but usurp works yeah usurp definitely works. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. The, the whole heritage of the Arabians, like like Qaddafi said, it, I mean, these people in Persian Gulf still speak with a strong Ar Iranian accent, and um, you know, the 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 there's traditions in Persia of them pushing the son, the children of Zahak, they call them the Az people, or the children of Dahak or Zahak, Ad Zahak, Al Zahak, um, out across back from Persia into the sea and that's why uh, you see the Achaemenid, Achaemenid Persians the earlier Persians are all black even though people are trying to say they're <laughs> Elamite and stuff like that um, the early Persians were black people descended from the Nabataeans and that's what the Arabs said not you know and that they they got the name Aryan from them from the Nabataeans Arya or ara meaning lion. So, um, and the, and even Herodotus said that the word that the Scytho Homavera, the the people that the Scythian people that wore the large the hats, cone hats, whatever, like the Phrygian hats or whatnot, yeah, yeah, that they adopted the word Aryan from Medes. Now, who were the Medes? The early Medes were similar to. I know this is hard to believe, but similar to the my, my, um, Medianites. And that's why you find in Greek um, Greek uh, legend that the confusion between Job and Tobias, the, the Mede, because they were originally, the Medes and the Medianites were the same people. The, the, the black people that were called Meds or Medes were the people that were called Medianites. Or mad, Madi in Arabia. So the Madian, because in in South Arabia, 
you add an an in the Musnad script, uh, script or pronunciation, Madian is it means the land or people of Madi or Maad. Maad. I'm sure you've heard of Maad. No, I haven't. No. Okay. Well, see, and I think it would be good for people to learn the, the folk tales about these early. Um, like mad and um, because they correspond to the Torah, what's mentioned in the Torah. For example, it talks about how mad was sent to Horan after the ne Nebuchadnezzar invaded the Yemen, and Jeremiah was there in the Yemen with Barakiah, or they call him Urmiah or Uremiah or whatever. Um, so all these stories you'll find in Arabia, but they're in reference to the Yemen rather than to someplace further north, like in Syria or Babylon. But, but the European scholars, they were so so um, intent on viewing Israel as in Syria that you know they had assumed that every the Yemenites borrowed all their stories from these, you know, northern peoples and non-black northern peoples in Syria who really had nothing to do with <laughs> the Torah or the, or the context of the Torah. It was made in the Yemen. And it related to people that later moved into, um, well, actually earlier had moved into Africa anyway. Because the, the, the Torah that we have now it comes from, a, you know, or the Bible that we have now comes from a later period, but the Torah um, go, goes back way, way, way before that. And you'll be finding out about that later, though. Not, <laughs> okay, so we yeah. can't touch on that part. I was, I was just about to ask a question about that. I'm, I'm, I'm still yeah. gonna, I'm, I'm asking how. Way, but... it, that's too important. Be, it, be careful. Just be careful. Okay. So uh, in, a, in a previous debate I had this year about, uh, in, in a, uh, there was a topic, the topic was, is the Bible uh, Afro-Asiatic or Greco-Roman? And uh, so in that debate, I brought out some information to where um, a couple of years ago, or three years ago, I believe, um, some, some Ethiopian Jews actually came to Israel with uh, uh, Ethiopian Torah written in Gies that was orated from Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Um, that they still have yet to date that they, they it's in the Israeli library and they will not date it for nothing. They're not touching it with a 10 foot pole at this juncture or with well, the, except, with the exception that they got a, they got a, uh, what were they talking about? Like, uh, all I can say is they have a surprise coming. Oh, really? <laughs> That's all I can say though. <laughs> Oh man! So when when does your book when does your book come out for our listeners real quick? Because I I can't wait to get this. Well, I just got my like I said I had held it up because my my sent my publisher selfies and he was really angry and I I can show you the letter he wrote me but he would probably be angry at that but <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get my picture taken again after he sent some funds for that and uh, I just we, um, got them done like was it Friday I think. Um, I had to go get my hair done and all this other stuff, get a dress and all. So, um, I'm hoping, I mean, he has, the book's already basically done. So this is the last, that was the last thing that was needed. So hopefully next month, but you know, it might be as late as February. I'm not sure, but oh, hopefully after the new year, fantastic. If not before. Hmm? I said fantastic. Yeah. It's definitely going to be out in the next few weeks, several weeks, you know? Yeah, I've been waiting for you to come out with your own book book for like almost twenty years at this juncture. So like I'm 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 very intrigued to see what Me this too. <laughs> Me too, but I actually been gathering enough information now and finally uh finally people are gonna be very happy. If you're happy with the, what's on the academia dot edu, then you're gonna be happy with very happy with the book. Not just not just that. I'm saying like so people who are familiar with your blog spots item, please, if you're not familiar with it, get familiar with it because because the, the amount of information she has there is like books within itself, right? Yeah, so if she, exactly. if she if she feels like she has she has enough to write a book now, hold on to your hats. You know what I'm saying? Because it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna blow. Well, I haven't, well, I haven't even started on the blog spot right now as a book, but um, yeah, 
I mean, see what I want to include in the next one is more of the African, because this is actually based on, it's not, it talks about the different African as, aspect to, um, you know, the Red Sea people, the fact that they were found on both sides of the Red Sea and their, their names are obviously the biblical names of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I didn't get to go into the culture, like <laughs> how they reserve, preserve certain things. Like, um, you know, um, I talked about it on, I think in the Facebook somewhere, but on the Facebook page, I talked about the modern day people in Somalia and Ethiopia that are Jews called the Yahar uh, and Uber, Uber and Hubir and their connection to the Chaldeans or Kazdim in how they still, you know, work with astrology and uh, their connection to the Yemenite Kazim or Banu Kassid or Yafi bin Kassid who are still there and have a tribe called Yahar, just like in Ethiopia. So, you know, I didn't get into all that and there was other things, I, there were a few things I brought up with relationship, relationship to the early um, deities in, in uh, the Persian Gulf in India even extending to India, um, connected to the Babylonian uh, deities. And I wanted to go more into that so people can see how these groups moved over and just carried their traditions and gods with them, you know? Like, well, never mind. It's too hard to explain here, but you, you have to get the book. Yeah, just wait. The book. Oh, please, please, I will. <laughs> if for nothing else, I just to get that surprise about about uh, whatever was going on with the Ethiopian tour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I gotta get that for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I found that to be very intriguing. Like, so I, I brought that up in my debate in terms of corroborating the fact that the that the tour has an Afroasiatic uh, origin to it in the sense where, like, like the the Greeks, the Syrians, and now the Ethiopians are all stipulating that that it comes from a Hebrew oral tradition and whatnot. Um, so you got it. The Gies, from what I understand from Bernard Lehman, the, the, the Ethiopian, um, the Hebrew was the earliest Hebrew is, is found in Ethiopia. They found inscriptions or something, Hebrew inscriptions in Ethiopia. Cited from who? The Ethiopians. Or not, not started, but that's where the earliest trace of Hebrew is, the real direct, you know, identical Hebrew. Which was the Canaanite dialect. Fantastic. Now, the the people that speak Hebrew in um, there are people who speak Hebrew in Yemen and as well as the Hunhail also preserve in, in their dialects early Hebrew. Okay. Early form of Hebrew. Hunhail being the Duke I was talking about related to the Al Alcara and Canana tribes. See, we're, we have to also people have to keep in mind when we're talking about. Can, uh, Israel and Canaan were actually just talking about tribes that occupied this valley of the Tahama in Yemen. This low land in Yemen called Wad Kanana. Uh, and that the name comes from the people called Kanana, who um, are found now in different places. But um, yeah, and the Kanana. You can try trace them and where their names went and why you know they, they ended up in Central Arabia and then Ish and those Ishmaelites moved northward. You know, um, you know, I wanted to show how the sons of Shem, how their other names are still in where they were. And um, one of my first my first chapter was about the Ghassan. I don't know how you pronounce that. Hassan, Hassan tribe. And um, as an Azd tribe that um, came from Yemen or the Hudaydah area of Yemen, um, and became later on known as Kushan or Jakshan. And the reason I know this is because, well, that's actually too hard to explain to. But there's a river called Kushan in in um, or Kushan also in the. The Song of Deborah, or De Deborah, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, named after the De Bar in um, in Yemen and Debir. I mean, there's different dialects, and um, anyway, she was basically a judge, 
you know, a judge, a female judge in um, the Yemen. And, um, you know, it talks about all the different tribes, the Makir, son of Manasseh, um, the, the Zabala or Zebulon, um, the Amaleks, who, Amalekites who came from, whose roots were in Ephraim or Ephraimite, in the Ephraimites. Okay. Um, so, well, like I said, it's too hard to explain. People are not going to understand unless they go through the book piece by piece. And it gets confusing. If you don't know the Old Torah or the uh, Torah or the Old Testament by heart, like I do in terms of the tribe, <laughs> tribal relationship, then um, you're not going to, you're going to be confused. But, um, all I can say, tell you now is that I identify like all the, where the sons of Shem are and, and, you know, uh, and they're all living near each other still. A lot of these people are still living near each other, like the Dan and the, the Gila and the Mahir and, and the Gilead or Galadi. Um, so Gideon, El Jadan, you know, all these people. And you also have to understand the linguistics and how the word, how the names transfer over transferred over into Arabic, you know, from Hebrew, mm -hmm. Hebrew, or we have to understand Musnad. Well, I'm not saying I'm an expert in these, in these um, languages. I'm just saying that, you know, there's certain correlations when you're, when you're saying, um, uh, for example, um, like I said, Keturah, Keturah, of course, you know from certain, um, you know, I have certain knowledge of Arabic, and I know that the Katura could easily translate as El Katira, which is the name of the tribe, and, and um, Beit Katir, that's the name of the tribe that, you know, from which, and they still occupy the mountains of Katir, or Katura, Katira. Um, so, and you, then you see that all the, the names of those people, the clans that are part of the Beit Katira are those that were mentioned in the Torah together. You know, and these people crossed over into Africa and you see the same names. The Afrin, the Epha, um, and Deuce, Joseph is, gives it away. He talks about the tribes and how they went to North, they were in North Africa. Uh, and I talk about that throughout the box spot, really, you know. Right. The one thing I, I find interesting is that, um, so you were talking about uh, Ethiopia having the oldest engravings of, of Hebrew and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, and when I read when I read the when I read the Quran in Arabic now, um, I noticed that, um, like so again, I have I have a, 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 a firm biblical background and whatnot. Um, like I said, my mother was a crypto Jew, etc., whatnot. I, I had mm -hmm. to read like the Proverbs every day, etc., whatnot. There's there, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, then even going to a private school, and we still we study certain things and whatnot, and. So when I so I noticed certain things in, in the Quran that, that stood out, for instance, like in Surah 39, Ayat 46, it talks about Allah Huma created the heavens and the earth. And when I see that, I was like, oh, that that reads just like Genesis 1 1 to me, that the, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So I go talk to Muslims about that, and they're mm -hmm. like, well, it doesn't mean Elohim, it means Yah. Yeah. I'm like, well, how does it mean Yah Allah? Yah Yah Allah in Arabic. Like, how does that work? Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> Right, and so the, but then I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back to some of their North African scholars from back in the day. I'm like, no, that actually comes from Katani or or from Sabian. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense, right? One hundred percent. So I, I try to tell I try to tell my Israelite friends like so so uh, when when reading the Quran or dealing with the Arabic, when I'm just touching on the same things you keep talking about, like hey, there there's there's people who deal with it now, and then, but then there's the original people and how they dealt with it. And you should go look at at the original concepts and whatnot. Because because what I find intriguing is you're even talking about like. Uh, referencing uh, Chinese Islamic sources, talking about the Africanness of certain things and whatnot. People don't people don't recognize when you go back far enough. Like that's all people are talking about, like how black the things are, how African the things are, the origin, all that type. Like they can't deny it because it, it, it doesn't look like them. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it's obvious they're obviously describing the differences within the, within the literature and whatnot. And so it's so 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 uh, a lot of people try to they don't, they don't recognize what they, when the Hadiths and in Talmud and certain stuff like that like that to where to where the the people like the prophet became lighter in color or whatnot or like how the Israelites became like boxwood or something like that you know what I'm saying and so so it's it's it becomes real 
incumbent upon people like 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 the lame like myself to find people like you to break down no 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 there there's an older concept to this and that that's what i find so powerful about your work Okay. I have to pause one second because um okay. I just want to make sure my brother didn't want me to pick him up or something. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh no, I know, yeah. Well yeah, it's just people need to start reading them. See, you already have a background in Arabic and stuff, and um so you can see all these, how all this relates, but other people that don't have knowledge of um, Saba and, um, or, you know, the different types of Arabic, whatever, they probably will not be able to accept it as readily, you know, as you. Um, and, I, and I would, I thought when I first was told about the Bible being something that comes from Arabia, I was just, you know, kind of laughing to myself. Yeah, right. <laughs> what is that? How does that happen? Um, and uh, yeah, but then as I, I, then I would pick up certain things or read certain things like from Joseph and stuff. And um, then I would think, wait a second, that's what Kamal Saliba was saying. Why are these, well, all these people with those names in the southern part of Arabia and in, in Africa, you know, it just didn't make sense. And then I put, you know, just keep putting two and two together, like a, like I say, like a Rubik's cube. But um, yeah, so that's all I want to say. People have to learn some of the, either learn Arabic or learn one of the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew, you know, learn one of the Canaanite dialects, you know, that's that's what it is. The Canaanite was the earliest, is the earliest expression of these dialects, or Musnad, closely connected to Musnad. People don't know that the South Arabian dialects are more related to Hebrew than modern, uh, um, or than, than um, early Hebrew. Those right. Don't, yeah. Right. See, that's what, that's what it, it, took me, it took me a lot to figure out, is, is, how, is how much the influence is on stuff like the Arabian language, or the modern, or the, at least at least like the chronic Arabic or whatnot, because like before mm -hmm. you have the Southern, uh, Southern Arabian or whatnot, which that it speaks for itself because when you get into that again, like you see the, the, the where the, the the range of the language, like oh that's all over East Africa, or whatnot. Okay, then it may, you, you see where it, it's it's spanning across the Red Sea and in, into yeah. the Hejaz and Yemen and also into East Africa all at the same time. I was like oh that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so it, it makes it makes sense that like the like the Yemenite Hebrew etc. and all that type of stuff is, is is affecting is affecting the the Quran and Arabic, particularly if Aramaic is even the lingua franca at the time in certain areas and whatnot. Um, well, Aramaic is just named for a certain area, you know, dialect that was spoken in um, a certain area at, that had been influenced by the Nabataeans. Mm -hmm. Nabataeans were the pe people um, that. I'm getting so many texts here. The people that. It's right, because we're super live and people see that you're live now. <laughs> oh. That's always how that works. No, no, these are, I don't know what these are, but, um, oh, yeah, it might be. <laughs> I'm getting some New York numbers, New York City. But anyway, um, no, Nabataeans were the original Arameans. Like I say, they came from Aram, Aram, or Thamud, it came from Aram, Aram Thamud, and um, Ad, Ad were considered, you know, brethren, closely related people, and then the Nabataeans, these same Thamudic people started to be called Phoenicians when they were up close to uh, Levant, where the Greeks had, you know, saw, had access to them. But um, in in a certain period, I think the um, the area between Syria and Babylon also was influenced by Parthian people who came in and adopted those languages. So you see different... Um, uh, people in that area became known as Arameans later, you know, Arameans, but the real Arameans of the Bible, the Torah, were the people in the Yemen from Aram. So, I mean, that's not, not only the name of a, um, 
of one town, but like two or three towns in Hadramaut in um, Western Yemen. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and, no, 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 I'm sorry. Damud and Hud, Hud and Saleh, Saleh, is it? Mm, Saleh, yeah. Is, hmm? yeah, yeah, yeah you, you said it right. Correspond to the Sheila of the Bible and the Aram, Sheila, Sheila, Aram, and other children of Shem. And Katan was Jaktan, of course. Right. Or Yaktan. Um, and, but you find what, what, what I was fascinated was with was um, Tabari saying um, Tabari saying is it Tabari? Tabari? Somebody told me it's Tabari. Yeah. I mean, some some people they people say it different. Like a lot of people, you, you most commonly hear it said it's Tabari. Oh, okay, Tabari. Um, he talks about the Ibrahim or the Eber, the children of Eber, meaning eight. You know the 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 Hebrews. Um, being in the area from Hajamaut to spread from Hajamaut to I think Oman, but they're still there. That that town name is still there too. So Katan and Eber were two children of Shem, and they were Yemenites. They weren't anywhere up, you know, up in the Turkey somewhere, and neither was Ur. The Arabs actually settled in Ur. The the uh, I'm sorry, Ur. Um, Orpha, they brought that name there that has nothing to do with it or the Bible. Um, and when they brought, I mean, the different tribes of Yemenites that settled there, I know the Madij Ruha, or the, which is where the, the name Ura, Urha comes from, or Edessa in Turkey, and those were where the, some of the early Christians were because the king there, King Akbar the, the Black, or Akbar. Okama, because he was an Arab, um, he actually is the one that contacted, um, I guess, St. Thomas or somebody down in further south in Palestine or somewhere and um, talked about getting that the shroud of this person who had, you know, rose from the dead. Uh, and that's where you get, you know, that whole mythos of, we're well, not mythos because it probably happened, but. Um, you know, the Turin Shroud, he's the one that had it for a long time. And they, they turned Christian because of that. Or I think it was because of that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was because of it. his contacts with or his, uh, St. Thomas and all the disciples. Oh my gosh. I have no idea where I'm getting all these calls. Um, you should be this popular. It's a good thing. Well, no, that, that, was my, that was my ex, ex husband. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. So, so Akbar the Black, if you you can look him up, and he was of the tribe of Madij in the Yemen, or a Ruha, which was of the tribe of the. Actually, they, they had come up with the early Nabatian people because they're mentioned in the Nabatian inscriptions. So somewhere between the 8th century BC and and um, 4th century, 3rd century BC. You know, there was different tribes coming up and that was one of them, the Madij Ruha people. And there you can see them in inscriptions. So the other people that, other thing I found interesting was, like I said, the Maziks or Masika, People of uh, Canaan or the of the Azd who settled in the Nabatean area as well, and they're also mentioned in the Nabatean inscriptions. And you know, the Nabateans settled in Petra and, and Sinai and places like that. And it's just an easy movement across across um, you know Sinai into Egypt, and that's where you find these first um, Luwata people of the Berbers. Luat or Lavat, uh, Luata mentioned, who were very possibly the the Huat of um the, of um that area of the Huatate in Jordan. So, I believe that a lot of these people moved across, you know, by way of Egypt. They went to settle in um in Abyssinia, some of them, and then moved across North Africa as well. 
because that's what Eben Khaldun says the Vale Brovers came from the Rift region of Abyssinia. And um, they have the names of the Maziks who lived in the ancient Nabataean civilization, as well as in Canaan in Yemen, or the, the whole western area of Yemen, the Maziksos, they were called. So, yeah, it's a lot to uh, take in or absorb and remember, but fortunately I have a good memory when it comes to that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, so, and the same thing, like I said, the Lawat or Lihawat, otherwise known as, um, some, some people speculate that they're the he, the Hevites, and they're part of the Huatate Confederation. So you find the Quran there too, the, the people called the Quran or Quran, who are also in Africa. Um, the Quran and Tubu and people like that, they were probably all, you know, related. People on the other side of Sinai, the people on the other side of the Red Sea. That was one big cultural area before a certain period. And that's why you find them all, you know, in in, in uh, North Africa, as well as, you know, in this Libyan Sahara. And they move southward from there into uh, the Sahel, further south in the Sahel, and into Sudan, into the Sudan, the whole area across Sudan from the West Africa, or from, um, you know, Chad and, and Libya to West Africa, Senegal, Mauritania, um, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and all those places, you have the same peoples settle. But they also settle among other, you know, Africans that are Brachycephalic or Mesocranic people. You can tell the difference between. Um, so you find that people, mostly in northern Sudan, um, in some area, cases, are more likely to be um, have either. Tuareg influence, but to be um, more Berber and Tuareg than they are um, indigenous African. When I say indigenous, I mean like some of the people further south in, in Nigeria on the southern portions are have a lot more indigenous African than the, the more the Berber related people or the Berry Berry related people. When I say indigenous, though, I'm talking about before 1000 BC, because most Africans in West Africa have been in Africa since that, you know, before uh, 900, 900 um, BC. And in fact, some of the North African places that these people like the Son Inc. claim to come from in um, the Garian in Libya, like, for example, um, Wargla in the Numidian area, they claim that those places were founded by the Queen of Sheba. So they trace their Hebrewism in Africa back to that time. So it's not like this is a recent, you know, recent thing. These people are basically indigenous African, but they just, they, they probably have not always been, you know, in those areas because they have, they've been um, Hebrew for a long time. That leads me to two questions. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Hebrew, though, is not Hebrew is not the same thing as Jewish. Judean, you know, the Ber Ber the Berry Berry probably were Judeans. Like I said, they claim the their connections probably with Hebrew and Asher and certain Judean tribes of, of Israel. But um like the Tuareg obviously were not you know, they're well they might have been Israelites, they were Israelites and Philistines and Amalekites. You know, they were considered of the later coming Edomite, Edomite people, Edomite and um, Horite, Horite people. Now, I did want to bring up, see, I, the first thing I recognized about the Berber traditions, uh, them being from Bur el um, Bar, there's two bar, two, two bars or bears they came from. And one of them mentions, if you look at the Arab texts, they talk about Ishban, the Quran, and other 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 peoples coming across Africa as Canaanites. So this Ishban has to be the, the same people that found Asben in um in Africa, Niger, Niger, 
but you find that in Arabic uh, traditions, like Tabari talks about the Ishban and the fact that they were also called Yashbin, Yashbin, or um, Sambir, um, and uh, that was a Horite. They were Horites, or people of the. It, the name is probably connected to Hawara, Hawar, plural for um, in in Arabic. It's a, this this is an Arabic name too. It's not just Berber name or Tuareg name. Hawara. Um, but you know all these these Ber al. Oh gosh, I can't think of the name Ber. But I have it, you know, on my blog spots. Um, there were two Berbers, two bears. And Mazik was the ancestor of these, one of the birds. Um, so he, Mazik is always called the son of Canaan. And like I said, he, those people came from that era of Canaan, that's why. It's called, and one of the, um, and Sudan's son of Canaan too. So one of those people were called, were called Sud or As, As, Aswad, which is the name of a tribe. And um, related to the Kuda or Al Kain people. So Sud bin Islam um, and, and Kuda and Lamad people are all part of the same group that settled, you know, in pre-Islamic times, pre-Judean times, or not pre-Judean times, but pre-Christian times in Africa and along the Nile. That's why they still have those, those names. The name Burr is definitely not, you know, not native to it was definitely native to Arabia as much as it was to you know, later Berbers. I mean, even the name El Barabir I had seen once in, um, in, a, in a map. I'd seen it in both, um, I think, Northern and Southern Arabia, El Barabir. So, um, and then a the name like, um, you know, when they talk about Ifrakish, Ifrakush. Which is the name of a Himyarite leader of Canaan. You can see the Arab in the Arab text they talk about Ifrakish, the leader of, the, of Jericho. He said he lives in Jericho. He's from the Yemen. You know, I think that's basically what started me thinking. Well, now why are they calling him the the ruler of Jericho if he's in the Yemen? Right. So you know, yeah. That, so that's why I started looking more into this stuff, and then. You know, I said, oh, these, these people have messed up, messed up black history so much that, you know, it's incredible we were able to uncover it again. Right. But the, 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 you, you could, like, like, like I said, again, the fingerprints are in, are in the language and whatnot. And uh, right. I, I appreciate yeah. you telling people to go look at the Arabic sources and whatnot, because there's, there's a treasure trove, not just there, but there's going to be a treasure trove in the future in the sense that, that the, the libraries of Timbuktu were recorded in Arabic and whatnot. And, and they recorded yeah. not, not just like so-called Arabic stuff, they recorded multiple people's histories and language, et cetera, written in the Arabic script. So it would yeah. be it would be somebody's language that they're speaking. They're native, like some West African language, but it's written, written in, Arabic. in Arabic. Yeah, because everybody knew how to, was literate then. A lot of people were literate. They kept whole books and you know catalogs of things in their own home libraries. That's what, you know, that's what I saw in a documentary. And, you know, I'm like thinking, hmm, we don't even do that over here. <laughs> so, right. Right. You know, and scholarship, you, you have scholarship of sciences and medicine and all kinds of, you know, um, philosophy, all kinds of things that, you know, and, and the, the black Americans over here are not even interested in, a lot of them not interested in reading. <laughs> so right and that so that brings me to, to my yeah. question uh my, my first of two questions real quick because uh because uh as as a more i get into american legislation and whatnot and i was intrigued to look into your work and see you reference that the negro act of 1740 in south carolina and whatnot because in in right. section four in section four of that act it references the fact that the the enslaved negroes at the time were were being enslaved from the ancient berbers and whatnot mm -hmm. and so like, like you said earlier like like berber doesn't mean jewish it's, it's like a hebrew concept like it's, it's a bigger concept than just jewish and whatnot well, like I said, um, Berber, the name Berber now, like I said, does come from the Berry 
Berry, berry is just a plural for berry. And the berry, if you look up in the Bible, it does come from the Judeans. I don't know about Jewish, but the Judean people. Right. Um, and then there is also the Hebrew people in general, which it would include a larger group of people, the Torah, you know, in Africa. Um, now, all these people in the Gore area in Jordan, in modern Jordan Valley, who are black, because a lot of other people can't live there. Same thing with Canaan. Um, or the Canaan of the Yemen, the Tahama area, a lot of people are, are very still dark there because they've been living, you know, they're used to the land and, and uh, the agriculture there. So um, they re retain the names of, of the tribes, not only of um, the, the Torah, but of the Hejaz. So their names are the same as that found in the Hejaz. And especially in medieval times. So they were just basically an extension of the people, original people of Hejaz in Arabia. And one, and the Hejaz, like I say, the Hejaz was just an extension of, or either, the, I should say, the Central Arabian area had the same exact tribes as were in the Hejaz. And it's those groups, like in the ninth century, they moved up also into Syria, the Kaab, Montefiq, Ben Emir, Ben Zaza, um, the Kilab, you know, Kuleib, the Jara, who is Gad, Gad, um, all these Arabian tribes in the ninth, up until like the, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say in the early stages of the Islamic Islamic conquests in Syria and Iraq, they were all, you know, basically still African looking people. And now their culture, like I said, the culture of Hejaz and the culture of these Arab people had been already influenced by the Persian people who had basically had them living as vassals. The Persians had taken over many of the um, uh, Arab Arabian um, peoples, and then Muhammad came about and turned things around. So it's based, I look at the I look at the Muhammadan movement as partly a it's a revolutionary movement against you know these surrounding non-Arab people, against the Persians and the you know Byzantine Byzantines and and these people have to be not not dark skinned people you know. So it did become like kind of a racially there was a racial dip disparity and uh, racism first expressed to uh, to the non-Arab people. You know, that's why they call us, we are the black people and those are the red people, you know, but God loves both the black and the red people. Um, and then later on, the, the Ab during the Abbasid or Abbasid whatever period, they turned that around and, um, you know, by the time uh, what was what was the era? Somebody started talking about blackness as if it was bad, and to call Muhammad black was, uh, you know, you should be killed if you call Muhammad black because there also started to be slavery of Africans coming in, other Africans um, from the you know further south in Sudan, where the Arabs had not been used to uh, seeing. So, um, yeah, so when I say Arabs, I'm talking about the black Arabs had not been used to seeing, but because they had been used to taking slaves from the, from the, per, from the um, Persians, from the Turks, the word, the Turk, the word Turk and slave just referred to them, for them, it was just meaning this, you know, this slave person or the, the person who comes from slaves, you know, from our slaves. The same thing for early Syrians. I mean, they were definitely enslaved or subject to people, but the the these Arab men took their women, and gradually, after time, um, especially in Spain, oh my God, they were taking people from the Franks and from the Germanic places, and then um, those people came down as they were. They said the Christian slave, the Christian uh, vassals or slaves of the Moors would mix with the take advantage of the. Um, Berber, the Masmuda women, 
I mean, there's a whole thing about that. And then, and then Ibn Tumar, the head of the um, Amuahid, talks about it. He says, you know, the only reason that you have some light skin, your children are light skin with, with light eyes, is that because such and such, you know, these Christian European people, men came down and uh, to collect taxes and, you know, they had their way with their women. He said, you're, you're dark skin, but your children are light. So that's how that you know change came about because the Masmuda are called black skinned or black complexion people by three or four different Arab writers. Abu Shama, um, he was a Syrian. And this is all during the medieval, medieval period. You know, this is not this is not like in the fifth or seventh century. We're talking about pretty late thirteenth century. The Masmuda were the people along the coast of Morocco that had been pushed back into um, the mountains, the Atlas Mountains. Now the Atlas Mountains are completely what? They're not even black anymore, right? But Abu Shama, um, Ibn Butlan, and uh, Ibn, Ibn Butlan was an Iraqi Christian doctor, formerly of a Byzantine origin, I think, or his, you know, his biological origins. And then um, one of the Persian writers. Who, who was in the Fatimid era. It was in Egypt during the Fatimid era. He writes about the Masmuda and the fact that there were black Africans, his little words, black Africans on horseback. So those are the people that that it, um, Isidore of Seville saw when he, you know, when he was talking about the Moors. He said they were black as night. And those are the people that with um, the Zanata Berbers, who I talked about as being ancestral to Sanink and the Imraguin, Imraguin and the uh, Sugai or Zagawa, the guy, as well as the Tuareg too, were the, the certain branches of, of the Zanata were, but they were camel riders. Certain branches of the Zanata were, were Tuareg. Um, but the earliest invaders of Spain that were Moors, and they were the most of the invaders of Spain of the earliest wave of Muslims into Spain. They were Nafusa and Zanata of Zanata stock. And and you can go right now and look up you know what the Nafusa, most of the Nafusa, Nafusawa are still black. And they're connected to the Zagawa and um and they say their name comes from Nafish. Who was I think he was, um, which was the name of both an Ish Israelite and Ishmaelite people. So well, that's interesting too. Um, yeah, so I could you know talk forever about this stuff. But do you have any particular questions about the, the um, thing I put on academia? We actually touched on a lot of it in the sense to where uh, the important parts in the sense where I because we'll hold on. Because uh, I brought out that I think we talked talked about the people of Manessa there. Um, yeah, Maness, the Manasir are and were a South Arabian people that also live extended, extend to um, and the Makar or Makir people extend to Central Arabia today. But they're, like I say, the Makir and the other groups of South Arabians that are connected to Makir, like the Beni Am, or as they're called in them. As they were called in the Bible, Amiel, because Amiel, I think, was the son of Makir. So those people are still together in Somalia. And the first um, Somalian wave, I think, was of the Kudman tribe. And as I told you, that in South Arabia, they end the, often end the, the um, names with the A-N, the Kadman. So when you talk about the Kadmonites or Kedem, Cadmonites were people that were um, Canaanites. So basically, when you're talking about the Horn of Africa, you're talking about many of those people are more recent, um, like fifth century, sixth century. You're talking about um, settlers in Somalia in the, in the Horn of Africa. Those are long after the, the Berry Berry wave. Okay. But the Kudman tribe did settle in Somalia, otherwise known as the Cadmonites. Um, and you know the Kamenites related to the to other other groups. You have to look in the Torah, and you'll see. 
Uh, they had like four story houses. They, they, they brought four story house, homes, stone homes and stuff. It's, you know, fascinating to look at, you know, some of the stuff. Um, and that was one of the most, definitely one of the most developed areas aside from, you know, uh, Babylon, which was also founded by the same people anyway, before the Assyrian, the rise of the Assyrians. Like I said, the Assyrians were this conglomeration of peoples from the, the, the ancient Ruti, people who probably were ancestors to the Kurds, um, and then the Arab, the true Semitic people, the Arabs, <laughs> the Arabian or indigenous black Arabian who were the original Semitic, Hamitic, and Dephitic people. Okay, that, that moved through the Persian Gulf, settled in the Persian Gulf, and also from there also settled Magan in Babylon, places like that, and brought their language and culture with them. And then I guess these other people invaded. And that's when you, when you look at see who's putting the books on in Babylon, you'll see these non-African people, but those have nothing to do with the majority of the skeletons found there were not of those people. They were of the uh, so-called proto-Mediterranean type people that are found in Africa. So mainly, you know, the Nile Valley, East Africa, and Arabia, uh, the small, the grass Mediterranean type people were found mainly in um, the Babylonian era. Um, you know, well, what I want to say is though that um, Again, not there's different populations in Arabia. There were the very, these very small people that I saw with my own eyes in Brooklyn one day, um, very short, and I was told about them before I saw them. Uh, they were wearing uh, high heel sneakers. That's how I knew how short <laughs> how short they were. And nobody, like my my ex who was from Algeria, he didn't know where they came from, but then he found out later they were from Yemen. Um, and I had been told about them by an uh, Eritrean man who said, you know, across from us in the Asir region, or G what he said, G um, Jizan, Jizan region, he said there are people who are look just like us, except they're shorter, you know, they're much shorter. And I said, wow. Hmm. So, and it's these, these Rizan people are literally remnants of the people who settled after the Marib, um, after the the Exodus, they settled in the as in, the, in the, those mountains, you know, the Aban is here and um, um, the Shalawa tribe is still there, known in the Bible as Shiloh. And they're next to the Shaharan, who are known as Shaharan or, or Sharon. They changed the name to Sharon. Um, so just a lot of um, very interesting connections, you know, between the ge geographic regions and ethnic groups that are still there and living next to each other. You know, just like the, in other words, the logistics of where these people were in the, in the Torah or in the early books of the Bible are the same as where they are now, except they might have changed, you know, their appearance might have changed because like I said, they're living with, they were observing Persian type people, um, you know, or Iranic type people for, for, I guess, centuries, several centuries. And same thing in the Yemen. So you find both dark skin and light skin people in the Yemen, they find the same thing in Asir and in Hejaz and everywhere else. But, um, you speak on on the Makhra tribe in uh in, in the excerpt that you put out, and I'm gonna I'm uh, for everyone uh, I'm 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 gonna link the excerpt below af after this uh, interview is over. Um, uh, but so uh, I'm intrigued with the Makhra tribe in the sense to there's a couple questions. One is there have you found any link to the to the biblical term more in that tribe? The biblical what? The biblical term more. So there's like there's a there's. Oh, it says, it, says, it says that, for instance, uh, Abraham uh, camped in the in the in the terebinth of More, for instance, in uh, Genesis. How do you spell it? How do you spell it? M O R E H. In English, in a uh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's. Um, I don't think I talk about that in my book, but that's also in the Yemen. 
the mountain because it's the hill of Moriah, right? Right, as well. Same, same yeah. concept. Yeah, they're, they're both hills. There's, there's a hill Moriah and a hill Moriah. Moriah, Moriah. Well, so I think it's the same place, but they just translated it differently. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the hill of the Amorites. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, and, and there's a tribe called Mora there anyway. This is still a tribe called Mora. The Mora. That's what um, I was. Gonna, okay, that's what I was going to ask. I was also going to ask: Is there is there any link between that tribe and the Mori tribe of that that becomes that that's that's that are Berbers in in West Africa? No, I don't think so. I, I have to find out what the uh, uh, Mora means, but. My view is that the Moors or Maori, because they pronounce it, they spell it M-A-U-R-I, right. con and also connected to the word, they use the word Mora Forest, Mora Mora Forest, meaning the star Mars. They, talk, they call them the Mora. See, and um, notice in ancient Greek mentioned the fact that the Moors Besides being black, that they worshipped, or that they were the sons of Ares, which is Mars. So, and that's the morning star. That's one of the morning stars. Here. So, the word Mor or Maru, Mor, uh, there's another like Marduk, the Amorite god Marduk, Martu, Maru, that might be related. But I'm not sure if um, the tribe of Amura, Amura is related to Amorite or not. Yet, because there's another group of people called um, Amorat, Amorat, the Amorat, in Amorat okay. that were part of the Nabataeans. And I think one of the Assyrian rulers, Nabodinus, calls the Nabataeans Amorites for that reason. So I think that name, I don't know if the name Amaru is related to, or Amorat is related to the Mura tribe in Yemen or not. So we'd have to find out what the word Mura means, you know? And now speaking of Amaru, the Maru, um, even in India they have the Mur Mori, uh, what's it called? The Mor. They have the same thing. The Mor, not Mor two Mor Maruts. In their myth mythology, they have the Maruts, and that's also connected. Now, I, now, don't ask me how I know that now, but I just figured it out by certain, <laughs> certain, um, a lot of information. The Maruts and um, Amorites and all that stuff. So, but what's going to happen is people are going to find that. Some of the chronology has been really messed up, and that some of these people are actually came into existence much later than they were saying. Like certain people in India, um, you know, this thing, all this stuff about the Vedas and and the Aryas and the Dasyas was actually not about invading, you know, white people and overcoming black people. It was about the earliest occupants of India, the Aryas and the da Dasyas, the Daha, Dahai. And that the word Dahai in their mythology, Iranic mythology, is related to um, Dohak, as Dahak and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, in the, in the, in the early Akemet, Achaemenids, I don't know how to pronounce it, but the early black Persians, they called their, uh, their that was their name. The rulers' names were Azdahaka, and that's where you get, you know, those mythologies from. But those people were not way back, you know, for in, in eternity. They were, you know, much later, 5th century, 6th century, and they're saying that even Mitanni, Mitanni, you know, they're, they're their chronology actually refers to the early Medes, the early Median dynasties. And that's what I was saying before, if you know about Mad and the, the, the legend of him being transferred from Hor from Yemen to Horan during the time of the <coughs> um, 
the invasions of, the, of um, Nebuchadnezzar, I think, was or, or the Assyrians. Some at some point, they were transferred to the Horan and the Yemen, and then the mythology became confused between the Medes and the <laughs> Midianites and Mariani of the Yemen, because that's actually what the, the Romans came to call these tribe of Mad, Mad in, I think it's been Adnan, Adnan, who found Adin in um in the Yemen. But um yeah, you just have to you just have to know a lot, have a lot of information in order to understand how it all fits together. In in your book, do you cover the exodus at all? Yes, that's in fact what the whole Ghassan Hassan uh, chapter is about. The exodus that never happened in in um, Israel it happened in the Yemen and they talk all about it in their in their traditions and mythology and with the, the same tribes and I go all into that in the Medina the forming of the map you know the Medina is from the mad mad and um yeah it's just very interesting I hope everybody gets a chance to see it so I know you, you can't get into too much information, but uh, would you like to get into some of the titles of the chapters of your book? Is that is that possible, or would that do would that, would that be doing too much? I don't even know. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't I don't remember that. No, I mean, oh, no worries. No worries. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Do you cover the Moabites in your book at all? Yeah, I cover all the major true people and the fact that the the Moabites. Um, I mean. <laughs> there's a, they were Yemenite people too, and then there's a Moab still there. It's called Maab though, M A A B, and I show the connection between the Moab people that went to the Jordan Valley and stuff. But they came in that area much later than you know than they're saying, and they were originally in the Assir area as well. Um, they were part of the Harb people as well as part of the Gor people, Gorani people. Like I say, the black people in the Yemen. So yeah, I mean, I trace all that. So I'll, I'll round all, the, all this out with, with my last two questions and whatnot. And so, so in touching back on that Negro Act of 1740 and whatnot, uh, mm -hmm. it specifies the whole concept of ancient Berbers. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping everybody gets a, a concept of in terms of of the of the Ber ancient Berbers is how large they are. So for instance. Um, well, yeah, yeah, you have to say that. <laughs> yeah, like so. So for like, it was, it was basically, to the, the people who were settled on the Niger, on the Niger, that's why they call them Negroes. That spread the Berry Berry or Kanuri related people. Kanuri is a guy, it's a Gawa related people settled on the Niger, uh, and that's how the word you know Negro came about. But. And Niger means great with river, just like it does in Hebrew, Nahar, Nahar. It's from the same root because those are the same people. Um, so these people spread after settling on the Niger from further north and further east, and they spread across and down and formed the kingdom of Ghana, you know, going back several centuries BC. Or it became Ghana later, but those those areas were um, definitely related to East African areas because they have the same. Uh, they found in, um, for example, Dar Tichit the same little little um, statuettes of animals, and you know Jenny and, and Dar Tichit, All these very early places were connected to for areas much further east along the Nile, and where the Sabians and other people, you know. Kushite, Kushite people settled. Now, when I'm talking about Kushite, I'm not talking about um, Kush, so-called Kush in, in Africa. I'm talking about the, the people who still call themselves Kush in Arabia. There was literally a place of the Beni Amran, who was father of Moses, um, and they call their land Kush. I think it refers to the whole area it used to be called associated with Ghassan, the Ghassan or Jakshan, Kushan people, Kushan Medianites. And um, so they ca still call their area Kush, and that's that's what it, it's an area of the Tahama, which is mentioned in the Bible. It has nothing to do with the Nilotic or the African Kush. 
even though that those places may have been related. One name may have, you know, this, the people might have founded the Kush in Africa. Who knows? We don't know how far the name goes back. All I know is that um, the, Egypt, the chronology of Egypt is so messed up because of the biblical chronology being messed up. Or actually, it might be vice versa. I'm not sure which one. I think, I think no, I think it's the Egyptian chronology is messed up. And some of those dynasties actually were much later, had to be much later than they're saying. And the biblical chronology is closer to the truth. And in fact, I line up the different inscriptions found of the Israelite kings in Yemen, which you're trying to say were in <laughs> Syria somewhere. You can cl plainly see they were in Yemen at the same times that uh, they're saying they were in the Bible. So now I wish, yeah, I, I can't wait till it comes out either because I would wish someone would try to refute <laughs> this information. You know, I, I just think, I thank whoever has been helping out, you know, in terms of, um, especially, I guess, I, my ancestors and my spirit guides, whatever, whoever's wanted this to come out, because obviously somebody does. I mean, I was told about writing this book by, by another a psychic when I was about 18 that I was writing a book. It's going to be published, but that was like, what was it? It was over 30 years ago, I think. But, but um, yeah, so I don't think, I think it's just a time for it to come out. I and mean, a lot of people are ready for it. A lot of Western scholars, like I said, are supporting it because it's, it's a bunch of nonsense that have been written about, first of all, the Middle East. And, you know, we have all this fighting and infighting back and forth over things that they, most people there have nothing to do with, um, you know. And the interesting thing was that, Noting that, um, you know, the, the Mageddon, Armageddon, supposedly, um, you know, this would be Armageddon. Is, um, well, anyway, you know, it's just weird how certain things are connected to the modern happenings in the Yemen where, the, where all the people are being, like, slaughtered and stuff. And then in, in, associated, in association with Trump and... Um, somebody whose acronym is Nabus was mentioned by Nostradamus. I mean, it's just so weird how everything comes together and Kushner being the 666, living at 666 or whatever, his capital there. I just thought it was interesting. You know, it's it's probably just a fluke that all these things are coming together like that in the re real region of Armageddon, but so we'll, you know, it's probably just a trickster, trickster consciousness that's happening now. But um, definitely some change is coming back that's going to uh, bring out a lot of this information, Allow that is allowing all this information to come out now. Yeah. So in that in that vein, the council is so like Armageddon Council. Do you have any do you have any uh, plans to write a future book on what we were talking about earlier in terms of like the henotheism and monotheism concepts overlapping in, in the spiritual system? So you were talking about like you didn't get a chance to write too much in terms of uh, what what traditions were kept by the people you're writing about. Um, well, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, but that information is already out there as a matter of putting it together, because, yeah, of course, you, you ha in order right. to be, in order to, um, there is a concept of the one God that was was created by the Sabian, one God as creator, the oneness of God, and then there's a concept of a different, there's a different aspect of, of, con of God consciousness, you know, God as creator, the one God, Allah, the circle of 360, you know, aspects. And what what um I think also um is gonna connect the dots for people is when they find out that not only you have the same deities in um in uh you know between connection between Arabia and Africa, but also India and Japan, you have the eight gods, eight major gods in Japan, you have the Kami Kumite, you have the concept of the Kami Kumite in Japan. The Cam, you know, the Kamites. <laughs> so, right. And, uh, you know, just, and even into the Polynesia where they worshiped Ama, Ama, um, uh, and, and Hono, Pono Pono, and Hawaii, and you have the pyramids built there too. Where the Maori literally say, Fetit Terahi, that we are the children of the sun. 
Well, yeah, well, yeah, everybody worshiped the sun at one time, but it's just their, their, their word for it was is, is the same as it is an Egyptian one, like it's Ra. Oh, what, what did you say? The word for it is the same as it is in Egyptian, which is Ra. No, so what, did you, what did you say? Oh, Fetitera. They say okay. that. So you're saying Ra is the name of the. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's why I was saying Ama, Aman Ra, or Ama, uh, and the different concepts of Hawaii, Hawaiian Kahuna come from definitely from Africa now very close to Egypt somebody had written had written already, already about that and you have different um, concepts among the Dravidians that are found in Pharaonic Egypt too you have the language of the Dravidians that many apparently Dravidians can understand certain African languages uh, in Cameroon and places like that so the Dravidians have written books themselves saying that the yes we are connected to Africans and you know, we have such and such God and Shiva is, is this in, in um, you know, Bali is this. And so all that's going to come out. I'm going to try to put together in a book, but that might be a little later than, than sooner because I'm working on other, other things too first, which I can't talk about. But oh, I was just going to say what you got coming down the pipeline, but don't even worry about that. Keep it hush hush. I see. Um, yeah, it's. Because once you know, and the the thing is, people have to start when they're when they're when they're copying somebody else's work. African Americans have to learn how to either source where they're getting their information, or or uh, at least write the sources down with what they're saying, or else you know that kind of information can become easily confused or misinterpreted later on by other people down the line. Mm -hmm. I've had so much. I told people, you know, they can copy the blog spot and all that stuff. And I see so many people putting it online, but with the improper perspective on what was written. So they have to start using, you know, start also exciting the sources. Well, this was found such and such a place, you know, put it in quotes, put it in quotes and use the sources or else it just makes us look like we're making things up. And, you know, we don't want to look like that. Right. <laughs> so for clarification's sake, um, in uh, the debate that I sent you where I cited your information, did I did I did I cite yeah, you? Were, you were, I liked I loved your what you said. I loved what you said. Much gratitude. In fact, I thought you were the other person at first. I'm like, who the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I, I laughed yeah, when, I, when, I thought you know, when people can't speak English and I start thinking second thoughts. I have second thoughts on listening to it because if you can't speak basic English, if you didn't go to school and pay attention. Then I can't, I can't deal with you. You know, like you know English, I know English. I, I'm not going to speak with somebody who's speaking in terms like calling people cracker and crack and stuff like that. And you know, that's ridiculous. I don't come from that kind of background. Agreed. So you got to respect. You know, if you're a godly person, first of all, you have to respect all human beings. You have to. Um, not denigrate or dehumanize other human beings. I mean, I mean you can't wow. do that. And I can't talk to people that I'm not going to be arguing or debating people that you know are li living their life on that level. I mean, I don't care what the you know people did to us before. We did. You can't get back in this life what you haven't given out to others. I mean, if it's if you haven't done something. This life, it was then it was in another life. And like I've been saying to people, as Moors and as the early Arabs, earliest Arabs and the earliest Moors, these people were doing a lot of things that were now, were later being done to us. Trying to say, oh, we didn't have chattel slavery and all this stuff. That's BS. You know, slavery is slavery. And, and a lot of stuff that was done, um, if we don't, first of all, we don't know what was done because that was so long ago, thousands, you're talking about thousand years ago in Arabia, uh, in, in North Africa, when they were taking, the Tuareg were taking, um, killing people, first of all, pillaging and killing people, um, which is why they're basically disappearing. Um, and then raping or taking their wives and stuff, that's, you know, that's karma. We have to get that back. Now, I know you said, and I, I think too, that you look Tuareg and you found Tuareg DNA. I know I have Fulani. 
I'm almost fully Fulani on the African side. But um, those people, you know, they, they took part in a lot of raids, raiding and, and slaughter, just like now. There's this, <laughs> the Fulani is still problematic. The Torg and Fulani are still giving agricultural people uh, agricultural people, when I say fly, I'm talking about the Wadabi and pastoralist people, are still problems for the, the Shem are still problems for the Ham, the people that work with agriculture. Okay? <laughs> They're still, we're still doing the same things. And I don't know why the Torah would be so idiotic to, to link up with Al-Qaeda who, you know, don't even know what true Islam is. And that now you talk about the Timbuktu, and they're um, they didn't mind, you know, destroying the, those places. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, some of that stuff has been moved out of those areas because that's you know world history we're talking about, not just not just uh, like you said, African history, world history, and world eras of history. Yeah, and particularly Timbuktu, because like again, there we don't we don't know how many people's histories are recorded in Timbuktu until we actually get there and go to with the Arabic. Like we, we can we can know that it's written in Arabic, but until we actually get in, like oh, it's written in Arabic lettering, but it's actually this language. We don't know what's there. Um, and there there's there's a there's a whole universe of information there. I mean that those, we're we're talking like the biggest university systems in the world at one point in time. Yes. So. Timbuktu, Jenny, and other places, yeah, throughout Africa, and that was the, that was one of the golden eras of you know the Afro African and Afro Asian people too. 100%. So, but yeah, I, I come from a tradition and whatnot. I'm grateful that like in, in my Moorish tradition, we, we have the concept of trying to see God in everybody's face. That, right, that in the real Moorish tradition, do yes. <laughs> One hundred percent, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I feel like when that when that when that concept gets brought back into the world and whatnot, um, and, and that responsibility of that concept gets brought back into the world and whatnot through through, through these people that we're talking about that we were we were, we were mentioning the whole time, I feel like we're we're going to see a lot more healing and whatnot. And in the vein of what you do with your work, like I said, like you lay the foundation for people to actually uh, follow like a pathway to heal themselves with information and whatnot, find out where they come from, uh, how far that route goes. Etc. 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 Like you, like you were mentioning, there, there's, there's, there's uh, timings in the Egyptian history, timing in other people's history. Like the things don't match up, and 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 and, and language, languages are matching up, and, and storylines, and narratives have got changed and whatnot. And so, and so there, there's a lot of a lot of what uh, your work does that 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 that, that, that heals some of that and whatnot. And I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm in, really intrigued to see what what kind of healing comes from the book that that, that you book you got coming out the, next year and whatnot. Because it's it sounds it sounds fantastic and whatnot. Because and in the research that I do, that, that I've done so far, um, just in the last couple of years in, in researching the, the Ethiopian influences on things. Um, mm -hmm. I, for instance, like I, 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 I was uh, blessed enough to go to a, to a Lucy exhibit, uh, I believe in like around 2012, we came to my state or whatnot. And, uh, and uh, it, we, in, in order to get to the Lucy exhibit, you had to walk through the uh, history of Ethiopia exhibit. And when I when I, I walk through there, I'm seeing like the oldest renditions I'm seeing. I'm seeing for the first time in my life, I saw the like actual Ethiopian renditions of Jesus and other people looking mm -hmm. like us and whatnot. I literally dropped to my knees and the tears started coming to my eyes. Like I had no idea. I'm seeing crosses of people who look like us. I'm seeing like they're 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 uh, uh, all kind of uh, jewelry that they all kind of stuff that they have, right? And it, it, mm -hmm. I it, it I did like I had no idea. And on top of that, I'm, I'm walking I'm walking into a I have to walk next to a, a, a remake a remake of a obelisk that they built. And I, I look, I'm like, wow, that looks like it came straight out of South America. That, that looks like it's like it's Olmec or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, so it, it it gave me this big connection of thinking, like, uh, of, of of understanding, like, you know what? There's a, there's a story here that we don't know, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm or that we're, that we're that we're having to piece together bit by bit. And I, for one, greatly appreciate your work in uh, in that area and whatnot. And if you're an Israelite or more or anybody who consider themselves of a Hebrew lineage, this woman is a national treasure for what you what, what you believe in. So I, I highly suggest you check out her work and I highly suggest you check out her, her upcoming book. Well, I also want to mention um, there is another book that people might want to look into or not a book yet, but they told me about three years ago it was going to be a book. And this this is uh, the book that came out as an issue already, journal issue. On the uh, it's called Fear of Blackness, mm -hmm. peer-reviewed um, journal issue on West Africa Review, 
And I think um, one of the more uh, Sharif and I all I downloaded it and got it and had to pay for it. But um, and I don't have a copyright, that's why I can't give it out to people. But if you look at that, I mean, it also talks about uh, the Jewish roots in, in many Africans. It puts together that, and um, aside from the many different tribal affiliations and how they, you know, those that went into Spain and, and that kind of thing. But um, that that um, that not many people have seen. I think they're also going to be fascinated about that. And so somebody contacted me from Binghamton University, who said they were going to use it as the core of their African studies class because he said it's very, it's foundational, it's necessary, and he's not even, a, you know, he's not African-American, he's a white professor. And, um, you know, that, that's one of the greatest joys of doing this kind of research, you know, where people can really make use of it and feel that it's going to help, you know, change, that's changing minds, you know. And I wanted to do it so on the academic level because that way you can get it out to greater, the larger public and not just have, you know, all this rhetoric and rhetoric out there that's, you know, based on emotionalism or your nationality and that kind of thing. This is truth about, you know, the human past and especially about, happens to be about the Afro-Asiatics. Afro-Asiatics happen to have been the major part role players in this history and uh, it's time for it to come back home, you know, to its, to its owners. Um, now, so this Moorish thing was the last expression of the great you know, Afro-Asiatic civilization expansion. So before that, of course, you have the, of course, people come over here to America and helping to get that expression of the civilization because the pyramids have the same dimension, dimensions. Central American pyramids have the same dimensions as some of the African pyramids. So the idea that you know people are just building pyramids of the same dimensions uh, at the same time in history is, you know, is obviously un impossible. But um, but I want people to know about the Nabataeans because the Nabataeans, according to Arab Arab um, sources, were the people that really brought civilization from the Middle East. The Nabataeans re refers, like I said, to the Thamudic Thamudic people and the Ad Ad people. Um, who settled in Babylonia from Arabia. And their last expression were the people like the Kab, Kab or Ishmaelites who also moved from Central Arabia into, um, who are, they had actually been in Central Arabia a long time. But um, in fact, the Ishmaelites or Sumu'il as they're called in the inscriptions were fighting against the Assyrians from Central Arabia. And some were fighting from um, from Yemen, and in fact, Suwail is probably related to the word Somali. But um, yeah, so it's a very, it's a very, um, you know, convoluted uh, and very in, entwined, intertwined, um, you know, mesh of, of information that you have to unravel, but. <laughs> So I had discovered a long time ago that Ishmael, the word, the Assyrians use the word Ismuel and Kedar, Kedarites. So Kedar in the Bible is a son of Ishmael. Okay, Ishmael and Kedar and the Batians are closely related people. And that's why you have, um, but not only that, but otherwise it says the Batians, the Bat the Batians were um, under Nimrod, the ruler of Canaan in Babylon. I mean, both Nimrod and the Cushite were Canaanite, and the Nabataeans, who were Canaanites, both settled in Babylon. That's the tradition, and that's why uh, they talk about, you know, how they built, they were the ones that built, um, built the buildings and, um, you know, the, the broad civilization there, and that now in this 10th century, there were AD, they were in a state of humiliation and subjugation. 
So we're talking about the black people had already fallen in the time of the, the um, uh, Masudi, Al Masudi, a Syrian or Iraq, I forget which one, was writing. He said um, in the 10th century that you know, these people, the Nabat El Nubait, who had once you know, settled and built up Babylon under Nimrod, um, son of Cush, otherwise son of Canaan, had um, already fallen to a state of subjugation and humiliation in his time. We're not talking about, you know, during his time, the Batins were doing great things. We're talking about, um, you know, thousands of years before, at least, you know, a thousand to 1500 years uh, BC, or, you know, two to 3000 years before his time. So they, that was their belief in the 10th century AD, a few centuries after Muhammad. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, now, but there was also, um, you know, during the early medieval times, the Sabians and other groups were flourishing. You know, there, it was like the Paris was considered, I think, Sabo was considered like the Paris of them um, in the mid by the medieval period. So a lot of these places that the Arabs settled were definitely flourishing. You see, uh, the <laughs> Andalusia and all these. Uh, right, it had like over a million people in it by itself. Yeah, that was, um, well, a million Berbers had, you know, 900,000 apparently, over 900,000 Berbers had settled there. Yeah, with along with the hundreds of thousands of early Arabs who were blacker than they were probably in some way, in some cases. So. I, I, I'm glad that you said that like that, because a lot, because I, I want people to walk away from this from this conversation understanding that that that, that the original Arab and I'll say Arabians, because a, a lot a lot of the like my Arab friends in in, in, the, in the UK actually will differentiate themselves from from as being Arab versus Arabian. They'll say like, no, the original people were the Arabians, and they they they, they they'll say that they're black. They 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 will like they'll, they'll flat out like, nope, they're 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 black people, right? And so like they will say they were black people or. Yeah, that the Arabian. Well, yeah, because they, because a lot of them don't even see them too much. Like, but, but because, because my UK. No, I'm, saying, I'm saying, do they, are they saying that they were Arabian? They were black people, not because they're not now. Not all of them. Right. Yeah, they say we're past tense. Yeah. Okay. They, 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 they say they say we're Arab. They're Arabian. Yeah. Well, they're not. I mean, <laughs> there's Arab people that Arabian people that are not black. You know, that's what I'm saying. A lot of Arabians are. Of mixed ancestry, they're Syrian blood J1 genetics, which is not the Arab genetics. Um, and anything that doesn't have kinky hair, anybody who doesn't have kinky woolly hair, you know, that means they're mixed with something else because even the early right. Um, and that's what they're saying. They're saying like, no, they they, they like some of my friends acknowledge the fact. Like, no, we just sent for people who moved in. Like, the, like we pushed to eat. Like the, the original yeah. people are on the on the lower ends of, of like Saudi Arabia and Yemen, etc. Yeah. Or, or or they're not there. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh, they recognize that. That's good. They actually, I asked them the question because uh, I was looking into some of your work and some other people's work. I was like, so do, do you recognize the difference between, between Arabs and Arabians? And they just stopped. And they were like, how would you know? Like, what do you know oh. about? And I was like, I was like, well, what, 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 what it is? They said, like, well, no, nah, we were no, nah, they're they're definitely different people, and they're definitely they were there first, etc. Blah 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 blah. And it was yeah, but because they haven't. They, their... they said that on air in a UK in a UK hanging, I was dying. <laughs> they they saw like they swallowed a bug when they when I when I asked them to. It was hilarious. <laughs> well, they said what? The, they, they, it was on. It was on. It was on a, a live UK hangout and whatnot that was on air. Oh. They, they sounded like they had swallowed a bug when I asked them because they were like, "How'd you know?" <laughs> Wow. Yeah, because probably because you know a lot of people don't read Arabic, but in the Arabic sources, it talks all about that. It, right. so in order to be a Arab, you have to be black. Right. Be, exactly. And that was a name. That was the name of a people originally. Arab was the name of people. But now it's just the name of a nationality or a language. Just like Berber. You know, you see people of different colors that are Berber, different cultures that are Berber. Jewish, you see different people. You know, those. That's not a ethnic name. So when black Americans or African Americans start talking about, well, oh, the Arabs did this, the Arabs did that. I mean, what? They don't know, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. I just stop. I said, okay, first of all, I said Arabian. I didn't say 
I said ancient Arabian. I didn't say modern Arabs because there is no such single thing as a single, you know, monolithic Arab. There's the people and, and some people that we call Arabs today don't consider themselves Arabs. Like the Lebanese, uh, some of those, some of them don't, only if you're Muslim, maybe. I think a lot of the Lebanese don't consider themselves Arabs and they'll say that the, the Saudi, the Saudi Arabia is a black, black um, peninsula. Uh, the, well, the racist, there's a racist lady on YouTube that says that all the time. And then, um, like I said, the, uh, the Egyptians, they don't consider themselves Arabs, but we call them Arabs. The Kabyles, the North Africans, a lot of them don't consider themselves Arabs, but some of them are, yes, yeah, some of them do consider, consider themselves Arabs, but not everybody. And people like in Afghanistan and Pakistan, of course, aren't Arabs in Central Arabia, so, I'm sorry, Central um, or Iraq, they consider themselves Arabs, but they're, you know, they're not, they're not really Arabs. A lot of them are not really Arab in, by blood. In fact, like I said, the uh, the black or the Arabic, let's see, I used to put on the line, post online a lot about the Arab um, newspaper article that talks about how two thirds of the, of the black people in Iraq are Arab, while the other third are of African origin. So a lot of times, again, when black people are talking, black Americans are talking about, oh, the African, the black Iraqis are all slaves, descendants of slaves. That's not what the Iraqis think. The Iraqis say that you know, because they have their they have their own history. They have they have it in their documents what the Arabs look like. The Arabs are not fair skinned people at all. The Arabs were kinky haired people. Al Hakami talks about it. Um, Jahiz talks well. Yeah, he talks about it. Um, even Tabari, to a certain extent, talks about it. And he mentions, I, I'm so sorry, I couldn't go back to this thing I saw online when I was looking at some of, one of Tabari's works talks about something about the Central Arabians calling themselves the Blacks or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, can't, I can't find it now, but it was a poem or something. But, you know, the Arabs looked at themselves as the Blacks. And the other people in in in, um, in the Middle East too, they also looked at them as the blacks, or as Kudur, the Kudur, and Samra people. Mm -hmm. One thing I find today is that's what. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's what a black person is called today. In in, if you go to Sinai and places like that, the Bedouin Arabs. That are not black, they'll just say that the black people are the Sumer, Sumer, or color, or, you know, Azarak sometimes used to being blue black. Right. And that was just what I was going to touch on. I was like, I actually found like what I find interesting is that, that you can find, uh, I can't remember where, but there's some writings where they talk about like the pride they have in the color of their skin and the sheen of their skin and like how, how dark it is, et cetera, whatnot. And like it reminded me of like there's certain people in, in Eastern India, Southeast India, to where to where um, they do the same thing. They actually like when the, when their children are born, they actually they. Well, uh, yeah, but you're talking about before, you're not talking about now. Right, 100. Right, and, and that, that's that's the point. I, I want people to understand the difference because there's there's. They a lot used of to admire black skin, but now the Quraysh complain about being black. 100. percent Exactly. You know that that's that's why I wanted to point out the difference between the, the then and the now. Um, in, in that, uh, in that a lot of people would like, you're saying, you, you were saying earlier, people need to learn Arabic and, I, and I'm just, I'm trying to encourage people in the sense the, the reason why they haven't learned stuff like this in the, in the past and now is because they see how things are currently portrayed and don't know, I think, yeah. don't know how things were portrayed. Yeah. Um, so when you, when, when you made that statement of, 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 uh, the air is being darker than the, than the bird was, I was like, oh yeah, well, I want to, I definitely want to point that picture out to people because people people really really don't understand how dark Arabia actually was. They really, and that's why I was trying to draw that line to to, uh, to the concept of the people of of, uh, of South Southeast India to where uh, they uh, they uh, actually cover their babies with uh, with coconut oil when they're born, so they actually get darker. Like they they're they're, they're the dark they're some of the darkest people on the planet, if not the darkest. Um, well, um, I, yeah, I've seen that <laughs> definitely, <laughs> um, but. Uh, 
no, you're saying that they still cover themselves with coconut oil to get darker? Like in South, well, that's in a, a part of Southeast India. But what, what I was saying yeah, was, no, what I'm saying is now, do they still cover themselves in India to get darker? I believe so. But the the point was that I was trying to draw was the fact like that what is that in the old in the old writings you'll find them being proud of their skin as in the similar fashion. Like that's what jumped out at me. Yeah, but yes, that, that's the old. That's the old. I'm, I'm saying that's the old stuff. Yeah, old. nothing having to do with the modern stuff. Yes, just as long as they make that clear because. Today there's still a problem with one hundred percent. Now there's a problem with um, some of these people, like the Tamil and other people, it's trying to look where oh, they yeah. skin they bleaching and all, and it's horrible. Yeah, no, I, I, man, yeah. no, that's crazy. I got, I got no friends at all. Yeah. Now, but um, in yeah, in 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 the colonial times when they first went there, they still, you know, considered black to be, you know, the the desired. In the South India, is a desired color. Yes, yes. Not now. No, I don't think it's now. Even though there are some nationalists there, like black nationalists there, <laughs> that you know, they model themselves after the African American black nationalists, who put yada, put people like that. Um, I think his name is a big thing. But anyway, so yeah, but see that's. As long as you try to distinguish between ancient and modern, and people always say to me, you know, are the Berbers black? I mean, I don't understand that question. How, why, why would you ask a question about, that's like to me asking, are the Jews white? I mean, which Jew are you talking about? Which, right. which Arab are you talking about? We're not talking, first of all, I never talk in terms of modern times. I'm talking about early Arabs, the original early Arabs. If we become, if the African-American um, people become maybe, you know, yellow, yellow gold or yellow white color in the next 30 years, does that mean that the original ones weren't black? The original Africans were black, or the original Afro-Asians were black. No. So I'm, you know, I don't understand the logic or the lack of logic among some of our so-called Afro-Asian people, Asian Asian people. It's just like I can't. If you can't understand basic common sense knowledge like that, then I, you know, I don't know how much you're going to be able to understand the book. Uh, or my black spot even because I have I was talking to my brother the other day. He said, "Oh, I direct a lot of people to your black spot. They say they can't understand it. <laughs> it's too hard to read." I'm like, "Well, I'm sorry about that, but you know they should have paid attention in school. It's English." Yeah, it's you just got you got to go slow and go with the references because because what it does yeah. is because because you have to be willing to unlearn what you know to understand it because like because because basically that that's what it that's what it comes down to is like I can understand it but I would have to throw all this other stuff out I'm like well yeah you kind of got to throw all that out now <laughs> <laughs> that's just how it is well no, no not even understand in that sense and I'm talking about understand the words understand what's being written oh they don't know English they, they don't learn the English language. So if they're not going to learn English language, at least learn Arabic. You know, at least learn the black man's language. <laughs> so, so you can understand the heritage. You know that you say has been stolen from you, whatever. Right. <laughs> no, I can, I can dig it. So we see that's that that's one thing we we gotta get we gotta get honest about what we don't know as a people, right? Like, so we we got we got kids, grandkids, all kinds of. So we got people following us, right? And 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 so one thing I'm happy about with your work is I get to go to people younger than me, like, okay, you you have this. I didn't have this growing up. You you know what I'm saying? This fills in a lot of gaps right now. Um, but at the same point in time, um, I reckon we gotta we gotta recognize what we don't know in terms of like, okay, so I I when I read this, I don't understand this. So maybe when I read this, I should sit down with the dictionary, a thesaurus. A pen and a pad, and and go through this slow. When I hit something I don't understand, it's okay for me to stop and just look this up and and, and read it at my pace versus versus just not read it or whatnot. Because at this juncture, um, like like you're saying, we're, we're living in the era where ISIS and all them is blowing up Timbuktu and whatnot. Like so, we're mm -hmm. we're not gonna have we're not gonna have these records to go check out all uh, uh, in, in perpetuity. Yeah, you know I mean? like, well, unless they save some of it. And the same thing for Yemen. I mean, right. Yeah, I was getting bombed all day, and then, yep. and so and so if we if we don't make these if we don't 
make these these uh, uh, attempts to learn this stuff in the here and now, it's going to be gone for our youth, and they're they're yeah. going to have nothing to stand on. And like, mm-hmm. like like the sister's talking about, like sh- she's decoding a story, and she's been working on decoding a story that's that's been that's been misunderstood for a long time. And so and so we we're, we're at the brink where if this if if this stuff disappears, we won't even know that the story was this uh, yeah. uh, was misinterpreted to begin with. Right. Exactly. Well, I think that's why I you know. The, the ancestors and, and God powers that be are la- allowing this information out at this present time, right before, you know, all this stuff's happening. I think I think when Trump's out of office, a lot of things might end, but a lot of the, the bad stuff might end, but, um, you know, never know. It might be the beginning of the worst <laughs> to come. I don't know. I'm actually of that, that mindset. I think it's going to be the beginning of the worst. <laughs> no, I'm not, but... Oh, well, I mean, I think it's got to get worse for it's got to get better though, before you get better, but that's just an opinion. It, it doesn't have to. Actually, I mean, in in some places, like I say, in the real Armageddon area, it's as bad as it can get. I mean, they're exterminating a lot of people. So if that was the, supposed to be the end of a new era, the old era, um, that. I'm just going to turn light on. It's gotten. Um, that might be uh, a sign that, you know, because I, I really don't think that um I think we're headed for a, I mean I actually don't think but I was told while I was young you know it was impressed on me that in the in the, around the age of forties the forces of good were going to start overtaking negativity and I'm not talking about forces I'm talking about the consciousness angelic angelic consciousnesses that surround the earth you know. So that's why there's a lot of upheaval right now, um, because um, you know, there's, wherever there's light, there's there's the devil that tries to come and you know infest things <laughs> and stir up things, you know, and that's partly what Trump's doing now, and other other people across the world, right? They're trying to overthrow the good forces, you know, forces of good that were built up by um over long period of time. That's not going to prevail, I don't think. It's most of us, most in the world are on the good side, on the side of good. Yeah. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that, like, right before Trump came in, I was, I had turned independent. I was no longer, like, a democratic. I was saying, well, I'm going to, I need to um, disavow my, my black heritage because I, I don't. I really don't think these people have the same viewpoint that I views values that I have. But then I met, you know, the Moors and people like you, who have, you know, a lot of the same. I'm kind of more conservative in a lot of ways than, um, you know, than the prevailing pundits on TV and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, now I'm not going to turn more. I don't think anytime soon, but. I'm already more, by, but I don't be. I, I'm more by blood, not nationality. I'm already. I'm already of the Afro-Asiatic ilk, so I don't. I don't feel the need to change my name and stuff. Yeah, it's not necessary for everybody. Yeah. Every, like, even, even, even in the teachings, it talks about you doing your thing under, under your own uh, line of victory and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? So like, whatever, you, whatever you identify yeah. as is what you identify as. And I, yeah, I identify as a planetary citizen. Um, and I don't need, you know, I'm doing this for not just African-Americans, but for the world, because like I said, this people that created civilization were of a different consciousness than people are now. You know, the Western European people uh, would never have created this civilization. They would never have created civilization because they're too material-minded, too... Um, uh, yeah, just to um, now I don't know what it was before a thousand years ago, but I'm just saying uh, the people that were back there back then were of such a level of spiritual uh, potency that you know they created civilizations from swamp, from swamps. One hundred percent, exactly. Yeah, around the world. So, and that was through. Yeah, it was inspiration, spiritual inspiration. 
nothing comes from nothing. It comes from God. Everything comes from God, you know. Everything that's made, music, art, poetry, architecture, shapes, everything already imprinted, you know, for us to just grasp from, from universal principles. You know, you make up your own, make up your own, um, after thousands of years, you don't make up your own set of ways, human relationships and start uh, defining things for yourselves and changing um, institutions that were put in place for a reason, you know, but so the West will find out soon, I think, you know, I think they'll find out sooner than later. I agree. And I, I think your book is part of this consciousness coming up in terms of uh, like the queen of this house rising, rising up in judgment in the latter days concept. Because I feel I feel like there's a there's a there's a, a thirst for knowledge and there but there's but there's a well a certain kind of a teacher that's going to take to teach that kind of a concept and and uh, I feel like it's like that queen of the south concept coming up right now. Um, yeah, I believe that because I do believe like I said, I've been saying for a long time there's a judgment that's coming. You know, it's not just for people in the north or anything, but the judgment against the, the spiritual principles that we had. You know that that um, the, the earth had and that was founded by people of the South, people that were, happened to have black skin, but the people that, um, you know, their, their, I don't know if penial land was open or what was going on, but they obviously had some kind of connection that is not, is not valued today. You know, just, you know we have the people in new age getting, trying to get new age and, um, spiritual and stuff but even that's being commercialized you know even christmas and everything's being commercialized and they don't they don't care and that's why you know things are falling down their own institutions are falling down around them so yep judgment coming <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that's it's well, definitely never I mean, I mean that's all you know yeah, that's what I've felt for a long time. Is definitely, um, and it has to be that way to change in order to change. You know, get rid of, to to wipe away the dross of the the um, unnecessary and evil. So, you were talking about our karma in the sense of like like uh, like we've done what, what we've done to people and how it's kind of come back to us. Do you feel like we have a role to play in terms of in terms of like writing the wrong or or writing that karma by like. Um, getting over our our racisms or whatever whatever, whatever we, we've done as a people to uh to divide other people so to speak well i don't know what you mean by the last part but i have a feeling that um you know like i said when the moors were in power and all these people for thousands of years basically um they must have been doing i mean how do they get that how do they how the small group of people and Hejaz take over the whole world. It has to have been through, you know, converting people and then making and flaming people. You know, you do hear a lot of killing going on in, in um, the early stages of Islam, both in Arabia and outside, you know. I don't I don't think it's anything to be proud of when Khalid bin, what's his name, Walid, who was the sworn, the, the drawn sword of Allah, he called himself, I guess he was a cousin of, Muhammad went around and killing all these people he considered pagan. You know, that's not to me. That's that. That's another way to get karma. And that, all the the way Islam started to me was not. It's the reason why it's still going on. You know, in in uh, the Middle East, there was a lot of stuff that was take, took place that's still going on, including the Assyrians too. The Assyrians used to slaughter people, but they learned it from the Phoenicians. They used to burn people alive just in cages like they're doing now in the same place. Where you know burn people alive and flay them, flay their take out their skin and you know and, and different things that are um unacceptable in the spiritual realm. You have to pay for that. You have to pay for especially slaughter of children or you know and that's where the the, the part about um there are certain things in fundamentalist Christianity, Christianity that definitely um, speak for uh, the truth, you know, that 
you can't certain things you cannot do that do not, do not have repercussions repercussions on the spiritual realm so but that's all i'm going to get into now <laughs> with that but you know i just know from being involved in shamanism and shintoism there's certain things you know that that you're not you're not really that are not really acceptable on, on um in the spiritual dimensions and they will receive you know you're just you know, spreading hate towards certain people that's going to be coming back to people you know spreading hate well, i don't care if it's jews or even um you know white southerners whatever i think uh people are gonna black people are, are going that are doing that are going to receive I mean, creates cancerous cells you know that kind of hate creates cancer for you that's what i believe is someone coming from the shamanic basis from a shamanic um frame of point of view and um but like i said a lot of what we our ancestors went through uh it's coming to an end you know mm -hmm. because this for example this country is like from what i understand it's almost 50 percent non-white now or more right and that's what people are afraid of that um you know people are gonna their culture is being taken over and people are gonna be do the same to them as was done to uh us you know black people latino latino people Arab people asian people you know they were all treated a certain way and you know unfortunately that's gonna come home through now my psychic uh was talking about not only that it's going to be because of what we're doing right now under trump it's going to be hard to leave the country if you're american especially american not person of color so much because um you know people are going to be very angry shooting at us and all that kind of stuff and i, I think that's already started to tell you the truth yeah that's why I think it's I think it's only gonna get worse because 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 I got a hunch he's gonna I, I have a I got a nasty hunch he's gonna be president again. I think it's if he gets if he becomes president again he's, he's he'll be crazy and bold and, and like you said it'll be it'll be worse for us to travel. I can't even I don't think that's gonna happen. I feel like <laughs> I appreciate that. I feel like well no the last time I predicted that he would be president because um, Hillary didn't have the numbers to be president. Hers was loss and vain regret. And he had good numbers. Now I thought it was going to be somebody else, but he didn't stay in. Bush didn't stay in. Now, um, but what's his name? Um, Biden might be president. I mean, if he goes against Trump alone, he'll definitely win. But Trump might not finish. Well, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I already said, you know, because he has the numbers. He is the 45th president. And if you look up the 45th president, 45th, in what would 45 means in numerology? Not, not good. Not good. But um, yeah, he might not. You know, I don't know. I don't think he'll be president next next time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and if he is, then we're all goners, literally. Like you said, that the Armageddon will come not only for Yemen but for everywhere else. Because he's intent on stoking up those forces again, the evil, you know, Hitlerist type forces, and that stuff's not just happening here in America; it's happening in every country in Europe. Yeah, it's yeah. even happening in South America right now. Yeah, South America too, Brazil, and you know, I don't know what those people think. They, they, all that, yeah. They don't think that the world is going to be, you know. Thankfully, though, a lot of you know, European people and white people in general are still, majority are still against. It's just that they have not um, fought back like we're doing in America now. Now now they're fighting, getting ready to fight back because they realize people, these people have taken over their countries. They have taken over their countries, you know, they're trying to take over Britain, um, Italy, Greece, everywhere. Of course, Russia, forget it, that's gone. That's gone. That's a goner. That's why they don't even, probably not Christian anymore because they see all their, <laughs> all the paintings of the ancient Christian in their country, all black. Yeah. So, well, that's a joke, but 
I don't know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never do know. Yeah, yeah, here, good. There's another thing I wanted to say. I mean, this is a long, long, um, I mean, I could talk about this stuff forever, but see, the early Menaeans were, if you look in the Bible, they were the first Christians. So the earliest disciples, a lot of those early people and the followers of, of um, Jesus and Isa, because I don't know if they were the same people yet, uh, were like Ansar, Nazarenes. Um, and that's why, you, you know, and you go up to Edessa and those places were colonized by Arab, the same Arab people that, uh, you know, they were followers of Christianity. So those are the people closest to Russia. So they just portrayed how they looked. So basically, we're not looking at Africans, we're looking at the Arab, Arabian, early Arabian you know, people, the Menaeans and the Minim, the fishermen, who happened to have moved into Hejaz and um, Jordan at that time. So I have to ask, so why are you, why are you not certain on, on the Isa and, and Jesus thing? That sounded mad intriguing right there. What, what, what has you unsure? Oh, well, that's a long, and, and Kamal Salibi also wrote about that, you know, the fact that there, it's too much discrepancy between the, li the lifetimes of Jesus and Isa, you know, that they could have been two different people. And, you know, like one of them was born from God, another one was, according to Jewish tradition, had a Roman father. One of them died in India, another one rose from the dead. He never, you know, never went back. He might have also ended up in India too, though. <laughs> but, um. Now, for instance, in the more tradition, he goes to India. Oh, really? Yeah, in the Circle Seven Chronicles, he spent, there's, he, there's like the, the first, there's more chapters of him in India than any, any other spot. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. No, but I don't know. If, like I said, I don't know which one is the real one. I don't mean. I don't know which one is the. There might have been. Yeah, I don't know which one would be the real one. And then there was also like my psychic was telling me that. There's also a child, <laughs> a child of Jesus called Sarah, and then that's that. Sarah was um, is actually born in Europe, and you know got mixed in with the early, royal, the early people that you know. Were royals, and that's where that whole idea of um, well, there's a Sarah Kali in the gypsy, uh, early gypsy um, tradition, and you see all the the mothers, the black, the black statues of Mary or the mother Madonna. They the early gypsies have Sarah Kali, the black as black Madonna, Kali meaning black. Oh, wow, okay. and um, yeah, oh, Kali, yeah, that means black, the black one. Blackmer. Yeah, that was I was that, that connotation with that name being in, in uh, Europe that just, just threw me for a loop. I, I, that's that's one of the last names I'd ever think of, of seeing in Europe. It would be common. Yeah, and, and um, that word is related to coal. The word coal. Wow. Etym etymologically, yeah. And even coli in, in um, the coli in uh, India, they're the like lower caste blacker people. And Kali, they call the blacks Kali. You know, um, but yeah, so I don't know. Um, all I know is that, uh, yeah, I, all I know is that when I was working in um, New York City at a, a public television, uh, well, a television affiliated place, and this the, the owner would let in, um, you know, she would very nice compassionate lady and she let in this one homeless person who reddish he had reddish flaming red hair was all messed messed up and stuff and he started talking like rambling and stuff and he started talking about how his family had archives uh of jesus and how he traveled and he was just he wasn't even talking he was just rambling and he was talking about how jesus visited Khartoum. And this was over, you know, this was in the eight, no, not eight years, in the, in the 90s. And at that time, people weren't, didn't know much about Khartoum, you know, which is a place in Sudan. 
you know, I don't know if it's the capital, but it's a place in Sudan. And he says that he had this in his family archives, the records of of Jesus and where he went and stuff like that. And I think he ended up in Europe or something like that. But um, you know, you know, and then at, at the time I'm I'm like laughing to myself. Uh, I was laughing, but I'm thinking, wait, well, now how do you know about cartoon? You know, because people didn't, you know, I was just new because I studied with Dahi and also and stuff and was into this stuff, African stuff. But um, later on, you know, I started reading again, like I said, about Jesus and Isa and stuff. And um, I'm thinking about some, hmm, maybe some Jesus, some. Some one of these people, Isa or Jesus, I guess Jesus, ended up in with having some connection to Europe, you know, because um, it's such a strong tradition in their history. The one that was like Roman, Pac Roman or something. But um, yes, yeah, so I don't know. All I know is that that's something that needs to be looked into because there was a tradition that he did have. You know, Mary Magdalene and, and um, was full, not, not fooling around, but, but he was more of a political leader, um, according to uh, Kamal Salini, and the one was more of a spiritual leader. One might have been had the tradition of being born, uh, like from a virgin, and the other from Joseph, uh, or Joseph was um, a carpenter in one, in one, um, Nag, uh, Nagar, car carpenter, um, and in another he was, I forget what he was, really from a prominent family. Anyway, um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I don't look at Jesus anyway as a, as a, I look at him, the, whoever the real one was, as more, both of them might have been spiritual masters, I don't know, because let's say if you're Going over to India and teaching, you know, the early forms of Reiki and all that stuff here. You know. <laughs> um, but I do believe in the Christ, you know, the Christ consciousness in the um, in the Holy Spirit, which I found out was real. I found out there was a Holy Spirit that could do things, you know. And I don't believe that, that that's coming from me. That was coming from me. I believe it was the Holy Spirit, and I believe um. You know, I do have certain experiences, like um, probably from past life, too many past lives as a nun. But I get, I get, um, you know, the uh, what do you call it in the palms? Sometimes, if I'm really worried about people in the world, I'll get the, that. Um, and I have it on tape, just in case, just in case I had to show it one day. But um, and that started after I played with the tarot cards. Stigmata, that's what it's called, stigmata. After I played with tarot cards, uh, I woke up one day with like burning sensation and a, and indentations in my hands. And I'm like, well, I got to stop stop this because, um, you know, I feel like it's it's trying to show me that it's evil. You know, let, you know, you can allow lower energies into your life. But, um, and that, that, not necessarily a Christ thing. That's just you know a Jesus thing. Maybe I was a follower or something. I do did have a vision once that I was what you call an Abba, a man, and it was an Abba, which I found out was not just a a, a musical group. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up when I was young because I was like sixteen or fifteen or something, and uh, it you know that's what I saw. It was like the leader of the Syriac Church in, in about the third third century, a leader, a, you know, Christian leader. So I yeah, might have been father, like yeah. one of the uh, early leaders. I mean, I believe that because I still feel like that. I feel like, you know, I'm always judging uh, on a Christian level. I judge, you know, are there right things to do? Are there wrong things to do? You know, I believe I do wrong things and I deserve to get what I get. If I, I drink, if I drink martini, I'm not supposed to be drinking, you know, and then, then I wake up and see things I'm not supposed to be seeing, then that's too bad. So I'm very judgmental in that sense. I'm Virgo, you know, we're very critical, but I definitely believe that, um, that, um, 
Anything that happens to you is a result of your own past doings and energy. So that's why I don't blame other people. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't um, blame other religions or you know, attack, attack Jews or, you know, verbally or even mentally because first of all, I've had dreams of other being in other races and <laughs> other ethnic groups. And I know that I'm not always just been black. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, it depends on who, on what level you're at, or what, what, um, what you're here to learn, that, that kind of thing. Like I said, I feel like I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I feel like I came by myself. I, I came because I wanted to come to help my, you know, my God. I, I don't believe that we are the highest form. I believe that we come from God. In the state that I was in, we were worshiping God. There is God. There's Creator, and there's. If we were God, we are God, but we're not. We're here, we're on earth to learn, to express, to create for ourselves. You know, we want, we, we want to create. This is what we're here to learn, to create without, to, without being harmless, without causing suffering. And unfortunately, a lot of people have not that in their mind. Or experiencing suffering, for that matter. A lot of people think that we're supposed to experience suffering here, which is not true. And that's why I got into the practice that I did, which expiates a lot of karma without without you going through a lot of suffering. Yeah, I'm still learning that one the hard way. I guess. <laughs> yeah, everybody, almost everybody, but people that, you know, people that are in my different practices. <laughs> Probably, the, I would say the um, Eastern practices, like those that I practice, in, or maybe um, Sharif practice, they can um expiate and, and bring manna from heaven so you don't have to go through a lot go through. a lot of what people go through is suffering but there's religions that say that, that you must suffer to be enlightened and all that stuff and i don't believe that at all see that's what, that, what i find interesting like so you're talking about like what sharif uh, practices like so he so for people listening so he's a hungar practitioner he, he does what she going and other things and whatnot and so mm -hmm. um i have a martial arts background and other things and whatnot and even as a kid i did like pranayama and whatnot and didn't even know I was doing the time at a pranayama teacher and whatnot. Um, but uh, but when it comes down to like the breath and whatnot, all the, a lot of spiritual systems don't like. So even spirit comes down to being breath and whatnot. And so so um, I was literally mm -hmm. talking to a friend of mine about about um, even Mary Magdalene, and, and she was talking about how like Jesus taught her how to how to alleviate herself alleviate herself from evil spirits and whatnot, right? And so the kind of like they, mm -hmm. they don't get into that in the book because that the, the, that part gets taken out or whatnot. But uh, but uh. Even like with like, uh, I've done a lot of qigong and breathing practices in my life and whatnot, and, and understood like uh, how how to replace things that were there and wash things away and add things and add things to certain things and whatnot. Um, and, well, go ahead. when you when you say, see, for me, it's just the practice that does it. I don't focus on. I just focus on the practice, allowing the practice and, and the sounds to. Alleviate. It's not something you have to focus on. Like I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this go away. It's just these practices naturally will cleanse you so that you experience the best out of life. And I can't say right. I agree. For all practices, I can't say that for Reiki or I don't do Reiki. By the way, I just do. I do something much more powerful than Reiki. But um, those light practices can bring a lot of a lot of dramatic expiation like where you go through things and i don't i don't want to do that i don't want to do that um and i don't teach i use it only when i need it you know the, the light healing but i mainly work with the the chi energy which is balanced energy balanced cosmic energy and that is where you get you get that from the far east from japan korea china you know that's they they're the ones here to teach to learn about breath and if you get into any of those practices and to a certain extent yoga will do the same um you won't have the same sufferings and problems that other people a lot of us unnecessarily go through i mean i'm no. talking about in relationships and talking about in health and talking about in abundance or lack of prosperity that kind of thing you can get you can get as long as you know you're not like me I don't, 
Me, I also do uh, things that I'm not supposed to do, like eat meat. I don't believe we should be eating meat. I eat meat. Um, I drink sometimes. You know, and there's other things I've done in my life that I shouldn't have done. And and you won't get as much benefit if you're doing if you're drinking and eating meat, because that's karmic, you know, repercussion. It's karmic. Um, you know, you're going to get karma from that. Well, I don't care whether the the um, meat's kosher or not. You're still killing uh, animals. So I mean, that's just my belief. But um, don't expect to get the same effects if you're doing that if you're, right. you're not purifying right. your body because you're not you're never going to get a purified body if you're eating meat carnal stuff i used to be a vegetarian i'm going to go back but i'm just saying you know i understand i understand where the vegetarians are coming from and i'm i hope to get there again soon right now that's, that's what i was gonna say about my my experience the experience with my own energy work was this it was the fact that like i i learned that like so like you were saying it wasn't me forcing something to happen in fact me forcing something is what actually caused the injuries i was dealing with like that i had to learn how to get out of my own way with it um and that's that and that's that was the value that i got even from learning eastern systems like i studied buddhism and Taoism and a whole bunch of other stuff and whatnot and the philosophies behind behind the, the, the healing system that you're talking about or whatnot I, I like it because it almost it puts you, it, it puts people in almost like in, in the in the driver's seat of like what what uh what modern physics quantum physics talks about like the concept of the observer and whatnot um and a, a lot of people walk around and don't recognize how much their thoughts affect things how much they're choosing to affect things like you're talking about right they just they, they feel like things happen by osmosis and whatnot and from mm -hmm. the eastern perspective you learn like no 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 you're the one you're you're driving you're driving this thing with your with your thoughts intentions whether whether you, whether you're meaning to or not so you better yes. like if you want to, if you want to have effect over things, change what you mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, a lot of the stuff was create created in the past and past lives and things. And since the West doesn't believe, you know, a lot of people in the West don't don't um, believe in that in past lives. So that's why we we have this problem. You know, we create energy. Sorry, I'm sitting down now. We create energy um, through. Uh, we have created energy, you know, through what we've done with our with our bodies in the past life and through our thoughts and actions. So anything that um, did ne negatively, not necessarily going to come out in that life, but maybe in the next life. And also it affects the kind of souls you attract into your life, including your children, you know. So, and it's never good to blame your children for the way they are because you... You know, they came to you for a reason. Right. It's never good to hit your children. Especially in, in, even though I know it says in Old Testament, bear the rod, spoil the child, whatever. But um, the only way that you, like me, I, my son, when I used to hit him at two years old, he used to hit me back. I mean, hard. <laughs> so I stopped. You know, I just did that a couple of times. And, um, because he used to be wild, he used to be wild. He used to jump on my head while I was sleeping. You know, run back and forth. He was wild like my the rest of my family. Um, but and scream, you know, with this loud cabal voice. Uh, I don't know if you know about the cabal, but they had the loudest voices in the world. You were not, you, you know, if you heard them talking. Some of the men that when they're talking, you can hear them like a, a half mile away. But um. I was brought up being spanked and stuff, so I thought that's the way that you had to treat your kid if they were misbehaving. But the only thing that helped was the energy work I was doing. And I'm talking about the chi energy because it was it would calm down uh, the spiritual essence of my child, you know, and uh, right away. And he became, over time, he became very... Um, protected and very very happy or very lucky fortunate person because that's what the energy of fortune is it's the energy she energy is a dragon of luck and fortune i would suggest anybody who um like if you go see the movie heaven and earth and how the lady uh how her life changed after she was brought back from vietnam vietnam uh, that's kind of similar to what the practice that I do, like the shamanic and ancestral practice, we cleanse our 
ancestors as well as ourselves. In fact, you can't be cleanse yourself unless your ancestors are also helped to cleanse with this with you know chi energy, which is actually the Holy Spirit energy. You know, it's the manna from heaven. Both it's the, both heaven and earth energy, or or fire and water too. Fire, water, and earth. So in the New Testament, there's actually somewhere that's written something of the concept of a baptism for the dead of some sort. Um, is is that something similar to what you're talking about? Mm. Like conce conceptually, sounds like it. I don't know. I I don't read, I don't read the New Testament that much anymore. Um, it sounds like it though, because and there's also a part that talks about um when the spirits. Uh, start talking wait what is it um i don't i don't know i was gonna say something else but there are definitely certain parts of the bible that relate to what i what the practice that i do and the shamanistic practices of the east yes and that that also is also related to Taoist Taoism. you know the in-between state not not fire not water but the in-between state, right. which is the earth, the mist from the earth. Okay, that, that, that's the Holy Spirit. So there rose up a mist from the earth. That's what they're talking about. The pure spirit that we have inside, the pure chi expression is, is that the Holy Spirit. But, um, it's that energy, like I say, that we live and breathe in. He that whom we live and breathe. You know, they talk about in the Bible, in the Old Testament, I think. Interesting. And that, yeah. And that's the, that to me is the Holy Spirit energy and the, and the Christ energy. Now, and I also had a, a, a personal experience too where um well never mind i'm not gonna even say that that part but um yeah there's also a personal the manifestation of christ that happens with with um when you when you absolutely accept accept that the that christ is all that matters really you know, you can have a, another experience of personal Christ, like in Catholicism, which is closer to me in Protestantism to the original Judaism. You talk about the, you know, the Christ and then the personal Christ and then, the, you know, there is a Trinity, Trinity. But it has not, the original Christianity had nothing to do with just a man, you know, called Jesus. Even though he may be, you know, called upon, I believe, in, by Christians in the church, definitely. Yeah. I definitely believe there there is a spirit of Jesus in the church. You know, like I said, you can masters, ascended masters are basically divine. You know, they're divine. So, and I don't believe the one that got married and came over here to Europe, whatever. Uh, I don't believe he was. I believe the one that that raised from the dead, whoever he was, um, I believe that that person, just like in Catholicism, they say you can call on different saints and, and things, and they'll, you know, for thousands of years, people have called on saints and have, have had their prayers answered. I I did a, um, this is when I was studying with a nun who wants to become Catholic, um, and I learned the, the Hail Mary and the next day, uh, no, no, not the next day. It was a few days later. My son came home, and I was talking about how, you know, to him about how I had been studying with a nun, and I was saying this prayer, "Hail Mary, full of grace," and all that. And he said, "That's funny because I had a dream last night, and this is what came to me, and it's called Psalm 23." And he started saying this psalm in 16th century English, the entire psalm. 
and he still knows it by heart. Wow. The English is not even found in Bibles anymore. So that's what I'm saying. That there are things, you know, there are miracles that occur when, uh, I mean, every religion has miracles, but, you know, and that's not, the second time I did it, he, somebody threw a Bible because he was working in a, in a um, place called Chi Chi, Chi, not Chi Chi's, Chima's in Philadelphia. And somebody, one of the people threw a Bible on the table with a small gold, I might still have it, um, Bible and said, keep this. And he's not, you know, he's not religious. And he just gave it to me. But, um, you know, it just shows you the ancestral connections and the lineage connection when you get involved in spiritual matters, how it affects your children, you know? Yeah, 100%. Um. Uh, now, I've also experienced, like I said, in other religions, I've experienced miracles too. Like I was in Buddhist for a while because my aunt was very much into Buddhism and she had, um, she found the, the Namyo Renge Kyo <laughs> chapters in, uh, in South Jersey. You know, that's a popular Buddhism that Tina Turner practices and stuff. And mm -hmm. you can just wish for what you want and you'll get it, you know, you get a lot of things. Like they told me after 10 wishes, after 10, uh, no, sorry, after three months, it was, you'll start to see your 10 wishes come true. You know, that's how I got into that. But the problem with that is it kept, it brings up a lot of your, it brought up a lot of your karma. So I finally chanted for a practice where, you know, I calmed down a lot of negativity and relationships with my mom and family members became harmonious and stuff like that. And the practice that I met was this one. And also it stops your aging or it slows down your aging process. Um, so, you know, it allows you to live longer because the chi kind of, your cells are infused with energy. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's touching um, on it. Yeah. One thing that's interesting about that, what you're talking about is a, is a part uh, just a few sentences ago, like it made me think about the concept of intention and whatnot. Um, to where, to where, um, in the Eastern, in the Eastern traditions and whatnot, that's, that's the one thing that I noticed that, that, that I noticed focused on more than anything was like, even, even when you're talking about moving energy or dealing with energy, like it's the intent manifests the will in a sense, you know what I'm saying? Or, or even the will is manifest intent if you're all yeah. um, right. But, uh, but to get to that point, like what I'm saying is, it's the sound vibration that we use, we use and also the, um, yeah, it was made of the sound vibration, breathing and all that kind of thing that, that allowed us to get to the point where we could do that, you know, use our hands to heal and, um, yeah, use our hands to heal. Like right now I can just hold my hand up and like if I wanted to, um, but you're not supposed to do this, like, make people feel, um, you know, purify people internally that are listening on the site. But that, you know, you don't want to do that because you never know, you know, what toxins, because toxins that can be released and people get very hot, you know, very hot and start feeling um, tired or whatever. But, um, you know, yeah, there's all kinds of practices out there now that we can, people can do. And in fact, in other countries, I'm much more powerful, you know, almost like, you know, Pokemon, people think that's... People think that's, um, you know, just fantasy and stuff. There are people that can do a lot of stuff that you, you see. I don't, I haven't watched it in a long, but it's not, the world is not what we think it is in the West. What is made it up to be, you know? Exactly. 100%. That's what I was going to get to about the concept of, of, of intention and whatnot. And, uh, and, uh, right. and so for a lot of people listening to what you're saying, like they might not have an understanding of Eastern Eastern traditions or whatnot. They they, they, they pretty much on this channel, they'll probably have an understanding of, of biblical traditions and whatnot. And so I, I, wanted, I wanted to link up that, that understanding with the, the concept in the, in the New Testament where it talks about the renewing of the mind and whatnot. Because um, right. uh, basically the people knew how to think one way. And once they figured out how to think another way, it's like, oh, once you change how you can think, you can you can change your, you can change death. In a sense, right? It conceptually, etc., 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 etc. Yeah, um, but 
but the Bible always talks about renewing of the mind through the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. So as long as people and you know, he was did Jesus, whatever he who who he said whatever, whoever he was, was the medium through which people were able to have a direct contact with the Holy Spirit. So I suggest people that are interested in renewing the mind through Christianity do, you know, do <laughs> take in th that into account that Jesus does exist in that sense. You know, there is there is a living God that, um, in the sense that uh, consciousness that is in touch with the greater logos or consciousness that you can call upon to renew your mind. You know, that's why when people raise their hand, palms and say, Jesus and Jesus, you know, you can call upon, you know, this divine energy that he was representative of. And I know that from experience because, I mean, I've had so many things happen where, for example, um, I was in Boston one day when I had my magazine and they had invited me down there to, to go around with another group of black journalists and me and this other black journalist in, in our room in the hotel we were downstairs eating and we started talking about how why black people were in the situation that they were in and i was saying and she was came to agreement that you know basically because we don't rely on god they don't we don't we don't place god in control of our life you know we don't say god is in control of it we say white people are doing this to that and, and you know i don't have money and all that stuff you know and you can't do that when you're dealing on faith with if you're if you're interested in uh truth because that has nothing to do with what what's going on absolutely nothing except your your karma you're living in the world of karma which is called shaitan that whole concept means satan the satanic world where you get to receive back what you put out into the world that's all that is um, and this is by different beings and means on that on this low level, but so what I was get what I was trying to say here, continuing is that we were talking about you know, and we got to such an ecstatic level talking about how we don't rely on God and and, the, and you know Jesus you can call upon to bring forth God whatever. Um, we got to such an ecstatic state, and I left, and I went into a. a um, an elevator and there was a man in there in the elevator with very small eyes and he was tall and black hair and he had a man next to him bond with the suitcase not a suit on but and the man looked kind of was looking up and i looked back at the man the man was smiling at me smiling at me and he said he said hi but i just heard the word jesus and i looked I looked at him and I said, the guy looks, why does he look so familiar? And then um, like a few weeks later when I was home, I was watching TV and this guy had just been on Worldlink TV. I hadn't seen him on the regular TV because I didn't have, I hadn't been home, I was in New York and um, it was with my ex-husband. And that's where I saw the guy in a church, big church thing. And he had a good energy, but then I was watching him on TV. And I said, "Oh my gosh, that's the guy I saw in the elevator. I met in the elevator. I thought he was an angel because all I heard was Jesus." The guy turned out to be Joel Osteen. Wow. Yeah, and um, not only that. Right after that, I went to oh gosh, this was such a powerful experience. I went to the mall. And uh, there was, or actually it was a Burlington Co Factory or something. No, it was the mall, that's right. And this lady called me from across, I was with my son. This lady called me from across the um, room and said, come over here, come over here. I was with my son. I'm like, why did you call me over here? And she comes, she's holding up a shirt that says, Jesus such and such. I'm like, I'm not even Christian. Why is she? Why is she doing this? And she starts one by one talking to me about all the different uh, questions I had about God and Jesus. 
like a few weeks before I had gone to Boston, one by one, and I got started getting scared. I said, oh my God, is she real? You know, why is she doing this? And she gave me the shirt. Um, I think I bought the shirt. She gave me it. And there was like nobody around. There was nobody around while this was going on. I come home a couple of days later. Well, no, I think this was, um, this happened after I went to church and I was listening to this song called "You, Only You Are Ho Holy. Only you are holy. I had it on my site. And um, I was get, getting so ecstatic and so high that, uh, well, I, I you know how sometimes black, in black churches you go to the front of the room, you start dancing and praising and stuff. Right, like right, right. So I was so, I knew I was getting full of something, the Holy Spirit, whatever. I went to the front of the room and I was lifted off the floor and whatever it was came from into my stomach and started blessing people with my, my, my fingers were a certain way. It's almost as if you had some kind of a whisk in mm -hmm. my head. And I was like a statue, but I was off the floor, like about an inch off the floor and I was turned and I was not, you know, I could not move because this thing had taken over me. And I, after a while, I mean, I heard people in the back gasping, you know, in the back of me gasping. But after a while, I got scared because I said, wait a second, this is what happened to me when I was playing the tower cards. Do I used to sometimes be off the ground, <laughs> flipping in my bed and stuff? But um, I said, my God, there is, there is a Holy Spirit. There's literally, there's a man or some kind of being, spiritual being, or maybe it was an angel. I don't know what it was, but, you know, that would come and lift people off the ground and start blessing other people. I'm here, you know, yes, yes. And I don't, you have to understand, I don't go to church. I didn't go to church that much when, when I was young. Probably the amount of times I had been in church was probably 10 times in my whole life. But I always saw myself as being like born to be a nun, born to be, you know, I, I never got into Protestant thing. I always wanted to be Catholic. I always felt like, you know, as they were taking my religion, you know, and when I went to, I, a few times I went to um, the Catholic services and I would, you know, I wasn't supposed to eat the bread, but I wanted to, you know, so I did, I ate the bread. You're not supposed to eat it unless you're Catholic. But so, and then the last, to make the last matters even more, you know, this whole, this whole few weeks was one of constant miracles. So my dad, who prides himself on being like kind of agnostic or atheist, or he used to, he's been dead for a couple of years. He said, he showed me, he pointed to a board, a cutting board we had in our kitchen uh, behind our sink. And he said, Dana doesn't, there was like lights coming on and it was in the shape of a man, it was a man with a beard. No, did he have a beard? I forget. I can't say. I can't say. He just had longish hair, though. That's what I remember. It wasn't like um, he looked look African. He looked like longish hair, like you would see on a book cover. You know. And at that time, um, there were book. The book uh, about Jesus was coming out. Um, not Jesus. What? What? What's that European? That movie about? The Vinci you know, Code. Say it again. Was it the Da Vinci Code? The, the da, Vinci da, Vinci Code. Code. da Vinci Code, yeah. And they had this cover of the book. I said, that looks like the, the cover of Jesus they have in the Da Vinci Code. And he said, hmm. And I said, I see it. He was on the other side of the kitchen, and I was looking from this side. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the last one. <laughs> okay, I believe. I believe. But, um, yeah, but now, now that doesn't mean that that was Jesus. It just shows that it was trying to show, you know, that because people see, you know, when they go on the other side, they see, say, say they see Jesus and this variety, this variety. I believe that Jesus existed. He was, I don't know, if, like I said, Easter was Jesus or not, but I believe that um, if Jesus existed and he was the son of a Roman, half Roman or whatever, he could have had longish hair and he could have looked like the thing on the turban shroud. I do believe that because it did kind of look like that, you know, dark skinned man with long, with longish hair. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I do believe now that 
there is power in the name of Jesus and that uh, and I didn't grow up believing that, you know, but I did always believe in the Christ. I was taught that the Christ is the head of all things, you know, the the uh, universe, this universe in particular is the Logos. Christ consciousness is Logos, which we're all aiming towards. Now, like I said, I mean, I, I, I believe that if that's the case, I'm supposed to help people, um, you know, get there. And I, I believe that uh, the Jesus or whoever was divine came here, had certain intentions and, and didn't want us torturing people, you know, torturing children down in Mexico and pulling out, putting them in cages and um, or burning people alive in cages or whatever, you know, things that Muslims and Christians do. I think right. there are going to be reper repercussions for this because he's he was the saving God. He was the savior in the sense of that was his purpose, you know, and you you can go through him, you can go through other different ascended people, you know, people that were actually more divine than they were human. And I don't think anybody in this country was ever that, that I know of, maybe uh, Quetzalcoatl, I don't know what, <laughs> but um, that, like I said, there are people over there in India that, and there, there are people you can call upon that are saints. I believe that you know, people have used it. There have been saints that died, Catholic and European saints that died that, that never, their bodies never uh, disintegrated because they were such, of such a purity that, um, you know, that the chi, the chi just remained alive in them. But uh, yeah, so that's Christianity. I've had a lot of experiences and I've had, uh, experience in Islam when, when my friend was in, that he had introduced me to a, 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 a Egyptian guy, a doctor in Jamal that was, uh, so he, he liked me, right? So we went, we dated, but he started explaining to me about Islam. And all of a sudden, while he was explaining to me, it felt like all my lymph nodes were releasing, you know, I was feeling like manna being poured over me. It was like a fountain, a fountain of something, of manna just pouring, you know. Um, so I said, oh my gosh, no wonder people can't love Islam. Can't, I mean, stay away from Islam and they love it because this energy is so powerful, you know. Yeah. So then in Hindu tradition too, Hindu, Hindu stuff, I've experienced things. I went, like I said, I'm having, I go to a, different Hindu temples sometimes and do ceremonies because there are different um, deities um, that they apparently energize or they have some interaction with that um, just like in Africa, you know, deities, not always the good kind in Africa, unfortunately, but one time I went to my friend's brother's funeral and um, I had been coughing all day and I went there and the energy was so strong of this powerful energy of serenity and um, and the coughing stopped like immediately. I didn't cough the rest of the ceremony, like a couple hours. Not only that, I mean, I was looking around and see where's that energy coming from? And I'm like, oh my God, I hope it's, <laughs> I hope it's not the statues because, <laughs> but apparently, you know, they do some rites, some rites in the, in the temple before the ceremony for the dead. And I felt this strong, I'm talking about powerful energy there. And I felt similar, not just a different kind of energy when I was at the Moorish, when I was, went to one of the Moorish things in Baltimore recently. I think it was last year. When I walked in and then there, were, there was the higher, the higher level people, I, you know, people had come on to talk. And I'm in there looking around like, oh my God. It felt it. It's almost as if angelic queens were circling around. You know, I don't know if it's with Christian or Muslim, what, but very strong energy. You know, and I knew that this organization or your organization, whatever, is blessed. They're gonna get. They're on the path. You know, towards towards um, 
happiness and, and serenity and saving the world. Because actually all this energy is coming from the same place. It's all God, Allah, or Elohim, whatever. And that's why it's important for people to know the connection between Islam and early Christianity and early Judaism, Judaism, whatever. Because it's all coming from the same place. It's all, all these divine energies are coming, emanating from the same place. That's, that's, that's my sermon for today. No, I definitely agree with that. We, in a, just to, to add on to that from a much perspective, we talk about in the, in the Circle 7 Quran about the fact that, that every nation sees God, but they don't see all of God, and they name the part of God that they can see. And that, right. oh, okay. and the, well, you that. No matter what name they put on it, etc., it's it's still the cause is cause and the root is root. Exactly. Yeah. And see, that's the um, that's the reason I like the Moors because they they have the same philosophy, like almost the same exact philosophy as the, the Theosophy. You know what you're saying. I think they even say it in uh, Theosophy. So, and it's different than you know the other Islam. So. If it, it's it's different, and, and but I'm sure there's other types of Islam that bring about the same uh, energy and same consciousness. Similar, what I yeah, it's interesting. What I find though is most of the Islam that I run into, um, the the Sufis are the, are are, are the, the closest to what I to what I deal okay. with, um, and then from there I find that then it would turn into like maybe the Shias, and then the Sunnis maybe last. Um, well, I wouldn't get into either either of those just because of the energy associated with them, you know, with the dark energy associated with killing and, and all that stuff. That's just too much going on you know, between those groups. I would just, if I was to become Muslim, I would probably be African Muslim, it's like African Sufi. Sufi. Yeah, I can dig that. Hmm? No, I said I can dig that. Yeah. Uh, but but even with that, like so, um, what I, what I was gonna say was, um, with within this, like you're talking about with the killing and such, right? With like the Sunni and Shia tradition and whatnot. Um, uh, so for instance, like even in even in my Jewish tradition, and whatnot, like I don't I don't deal with the Talmud and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. and with with Islam, I don't do I don't deal with the with the Hadith and whatnot. Um, I, I, I deal with the Quran situation and whatnot. I let the Quran. But the, the, the Sunni and the Shia don't don't they deal with the Hadith or no? Right, and so that's yeah. where that's where like so the Quran stipulates that the Quran is the best hadith, right? And it also stipulates that there will be people who come afterwards using a base hadith to lead people away from the path of Allah, right? Mm. So, so I would like I always tell people like to play it safe, like like so like even in, even with the more tradition, right? Like the Prophet didn't he he brought he brought um he brought the Circle Seven. He said he said uh, it's eighteen missing years from your Bible, and it's also unified with the Quran. He never he never uh, he said he specified that the, that the Quran was the source of our power and authority. Or he he never said Quran and Sunnah or Quran and Hadith or whatever you know what I'm saying, um, mm -hmm. and so and so um, when I when I it's interesting when I compare I compare my Islam to uh, to a lot of other people like I I have friendly debates with a lot of people a lot of a lot of different um, belief systems in uh, in Islam or whatnot, and I, I find that that a lot of their belief doesn't really lie on the Quran it lies on the Hadith. Um, yeah. When they take it to the Quran they can't make it line up in any way shape or form. And so when you're talking about like the the, the linkage between uh, the Islam, Christianity, and Judaism in its early form, um, I would really I would really urge people to take a look at, at the Quran and read it for itself and see where it talks about getting its understanding from the previous scripture. Like for instance, in Surah 10, Ayat 94, it says, "If there's any doubt as to what's coming down to you, go to the people of the previous scripture for clarity and whatnot." It even goes as far as right. this. Okay, that means it, the people of the book, meaning Judaism too, right? Right, Christians and Jews are saying saving, etc. It, it even it even goes on to stipulate that that the it says that the Quran is a criterion, i.e., a statute book. But it says that the Torah was first given as a statute book and a criterion. Mm -hmm. uh, and most Muslims, when I tell that to Muslims, they don't even know that's in the Quran. They they're like, that doesn't say that. It is like, no, it says that right there. It says it a bunch of times, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, how come I didn't know? Well, you know I, personally, I personally see that they you know think that um the Quran also the first time I read it, I interpreted it as talking about reincarnation. When it talks about the trees, doesn't the tree return? Um, the branches of the tree return um, leaves again and again, something like that. I don't know, but I I like I like the Quran after that. You you can get an interpretation like that. Like so, for instance, in the, in the more tradition, right? And a lot of people don't rock with this, but in the more tradition, like you're pretty much there's there's the concept of reincarnation until you get it right. 
mm-hmm. until, until you until you return to the until you return to the one, mm-hmm. and that you're basically going through experiences to to understand whatever uh, whatever it takes you whatever you need to do to to walk up the, the, those steps and that ladder to get back to the one. Um, mm-hmm. Long story short, but uh, I forgot where I was going. No, I, I was gonna, I was going to say this was, was that was that um, is that there is a tradition. Even even when uh, I I love how you talk about in, in your and your you work about um the the Banu Ifran and how and how they dealt how they dealt with um for instance they fought against Islam when 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 Islam came into North Africa right um but but, but Who did? I think you said the Banu Ifran right or was it someone else Oh Benny Ifran uh, yeah. maybe somebody else did but no I know the Berbers originally yeah they fought against um, Islam yeah. Yeah, no, I think it was your blog spot. I was reading. You were talking about like Al Kahina and, and or Queen D, etc. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you're right. And then uh, there were some Berbers who linked up with her. That also some other people linked up with her to fight them and whatnot. But then afterwards, you you see that there's a they 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 convert to Islam. It become very they they even become more devout than some people in in, in Arabia and whatnot in certain instances. Oh, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and and uh, what I find interesting about that is, is so for. Uh, um, for a lot of people who, and I, t- I tell this to my Islam friends and whatnot, like to, to understand again in history that there was a there was a large conversion of Hebrew people, whether forcibly or non forcibly, to Islam and whatnot. But there was a group of people who, yeah. when they who when they converted, it, it was sincere. You can find this even in Mecca. You can find amongst Jews, others, other people and whatnot, to where, to where for them it wasn't like they were taking a different tradition. It was it was an expounding upon the same tradition and whatnot. And you can even find concepts like this in in uh, in, uh, in Genesis where you have Jethro, a Midianite. Giving giving advice to Moses on how he should how he should govern certain things, and Moses taking the advice and implementing that implementing that into his governing structure. Um, uh, well, I think wasn't Jethro a Kenite or he he, he he was the high priest of Midian. Uh, okay, because I think I think Moses was also the Danite, wasn't he or no? He married in. I thought he married a Kenite because the Kenites and the Medianites were different people. Kenites or Kushite. So he married the eldest daughter of, of so Jethro is the he's he's known as three names. He's, he's Jethro, Raguel, and Ruel, and he's right. the, and he's the high priest of Midian. But see in the but see he's also a Melekite. Or, or the the um. Oh, anyway, never mind. Either or, I could either, either or his daughter his daughter is called the Kushite. Either or. Oh, what? Well, no, I'm thinking about his wife. His wife is Kenite. Yeah, but Moses. Was oh, Kenite. okay, okay, okay. I got you. Moses was related to Jethro and them, and, and that's why he got, um, you know, he was supposedly not supposed to marry a Kenite or Alkane, the the Smith class, you know, the vassal class. It had nothing to do, had nothing to do with him being black. Them being. Her being black or anything, because she they were all black. So yeah, one hundred percent. That's why when the when the curse of albinism comes through, you see you see that uh <laughs> that 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 Miriam, the one talking stuff about about the the, the Kishite woman, she she obviously loses her melanin or whatever because she gets hit with the albinism. But, but anyway, uh, uh, no, I never saw anything about albinism in the Bible. Are you talking about leprosy? Sure, yeah. Well, I don't consider that albinism. That's a that's a disease. I hope okay. you're not in, in Hebrew, like leprosy has 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 many, it covers many skin diseases, but there's also a specific, particular form where where when it's thought when it's when it talks about um the the whitest snow part, it's it's specifically referencing. Well, okay, sir, so, uh, certain people will recognize that it specifically references like a leprosy kind of concept, but uh, yeah. or, or, or now, now albinism, is, not. albinism you're actually born with, and it's not something you develop. Or vitiligo too is not not something. Vitiligo and uh, leprosy, you're not born with it but albinism is something you're born with so don't, anyway. don't disagree well, okay, yeah I'm, I'm using it in shorthand to talk about uh for people listening to, to talk about um uh skin changing or whatever but any because because there's, 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 there's two miracles talked about where moses puts his hand in his cloak and it comes out white as snow yeah so. not yeah that's yeah but that's not okay so it says the same it says it's it, it, oh, go ahead speak on it no i'm just saying I don't want to get people to get into the trap and think that. Uh, I mean, why would that be albinism? I'm so I was saying that in a shorthand shorthand concept so people get a visual of what was going on. I'm not saying it's like one hundred percent albinism. I'm not saying it's same okay. same. 
Okay. But however, however, to get technical in Hebrew, like albinism is mentioned as a form of leprosy because leprosy is the is is, a, is an overarching oh, okay. for just okay. skin disease. And then okay. there's a way to specify that from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it gets it gets technical. That's why I was trying to I was I was trying to keep it short. But you're you're of a very high level, uh, you're a high level thinker, so you're like, no, I want to understand that. Like I, I, I'm with that. <laughs> well, I, I don't want people because you know there's this guy on on. <sighs> On the internet, going around talking about why people are left or uh, albinos and stuff like that, and you know, it's just I don't like to get into dehumanizing people, like I said, and, and creating diabolical forces um, in what I do or try to spread. But um, and yeah, definitely, I don't know, see albinism in any way, shape, or form as like a dehumanizing thing or something like that. Uh, like, for instance, even like now, like in South Africa, we create the most the most albinos per per capita and whatnot. Right, right. Well, and the other thing is, um, yeah, because they would not have known uh, any white people down there in um, Medellin. They would not have known <laughs> what what that was about. But um, yeah, because that's the Yemen and Sudan, and you know, it's in the same latitude as the modern. Sudan and Ethiopia, so. and because pe people are still thinking, people think, you know, Misraim was Egypt. But like I said, it wasn't Egypt, and in the places where these people were, they never knew white people existed. Probably, Egypt had knew about it because there was people that settled there in, in early times, and you know, also a lot of slavery took taking place. One out of, according to Diop, one out of every ten. Slaves coming in was, uh, or one out of every ten families had a Asiatic slave or something like that. Meaning Asiatic, you know, from the north. But, um, yeah, I'm intrigued to see how that plays out in your book and whatnot, because uh, in particular, in particular, how um, you were talking about uh, uh, Misraim and then uh, the Hamad or whatever. Uh, I think, uh -huh. it was, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, because because uh, uh, again, like like it says in the, in the Circle Seven about the the Egyptians who were, um, who are who who were the Egyptians who were the Hamatites and of direct descendant of Mitzrayim. So I'm I'm really intrigued to see how how that plays out because because uh, it because it definitely denotes like when I when I when I read the, the the prophets literature, there's there's a lot of migration being mentioned that a lot of people don't see as migration. But when you really look, it's like oh, that's a migration right there. Like so when I'm saying like when I when I see the Egyptians who were um, the Hamatites and of a direct descendant of Mitzrayim, I'm I, I'm literally seeing what you're talking about. Like, oh, I can see the hops giving a jump from from Yemen to here to to, to where Egypt currently is. Even in, ironically, there's no, even there's no. even. No, what I'm saying is what I'm saying is there were people called Kipti, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, and Hama. There's still people called the miners called Hamathites, Hama, Hamathi, Hamadi, and Hameda throughout Arabia. Those are living people. Those are living black people. Okay, so Ham has nothing to do with Africa is what I'm saying. And I'm also saying that Egypt, that they're not, I don't know how people are translating the Bible. I don't know. You read Hebrew, but not I don't so. know what, what, yeah, I don't know what, um, if you're getting from the Samaritan, the, uh, what do you call it? Not Samaritan text. The Samaritan? No. There's different texts of the Bible and people, mm -hmm. you know, have changed words around and stuff like that. But Mitzrayim as used in the Bible for the most part is not referring to the African Nile Valley. It's talking about the Mitzrayim people who still exist under their same name with the Hamathites. In fact, the tribe is in Hejaz. The colonialists mentioned the Hameda as one of the Musra Harb people. Now the word Harb or Harib is actually the name Horeb, Horeb. So in modern Egypt, across the Red Sea, there's literally a town called, or a city called Hamath. Is there any relation? Yeah, they, to they, yes, they settled in that area, and that's why, I mean, that was later, though. Okay, because that's what I thats what I was trying to point to, and, I, and you were saying no, so I just wanted, uh, I wanted to be clear on that. So uh, I was uh, okay. to that wrong. Oh, yeah, well, that, that's why I'm saying all these people moved into from Arabia into you know both Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia, the H the Hivites, like I said, the El Huwait people, are still found. Not only in um, the Yemen but in area Sinai called the 
levatai. And I'm saying, I was saying that these levatai, the huat, may have moved across um, Sinai into Egypt, you know, and also across North Africa, because that's why they say, Procopius said in the fifth century that the Hivites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the such and such were were Canaanites, and then they came in to um, they came into that area after Joshua, the robber. You know, came and they had to flee. The Ephraimite, he's an himself, he was an Ephraimite. Um, which sounds like you know he might have been ancestor, might have been talking about the Tuareg, you know, and the and the and the Tibu, the Goran, for all I know, that's what it sounds like, you know, because the name Ifrin, it in the in the um, English translations is E P H R A I N sometimes as much as Ephrem, and they were supposed to be Amalekites, which was it's. The, um, the Tuareg and other those tall people were considered um, Amalekites by the by the uh, Jews in Spain, uh, Philistines by the Jews in Spain, and Amalekites by the uh, Arabs. So, and Joshua was one of them. People don't recognize that Joshua was actually Amalekite because the Israelite r ruling caste was basically the same as the Amalekite people. Amalekite okay, people and the lower caste was the same as the, um, you know, the Ham, they were the Hamites, Hamitic people, Hamath, Hamada, Hamada, who still do mining, Kenite, uh, these people now called Kanuri, Songhai, you know, all these, um, you know, African people. So it's hard to put, you know, all this together. It's all to, it's hard to imagine, you know. I'm just saying, oh, Kenites were the Canary, you know. But you just have to understand all the information involved and why it's. It has to be that some of these Africans were connected to um, the people that moved across Africa over time, just like the people said. I think it was Ibn Rakik that said these people came, were the Sabians who came across Africa and, and, um, became seven, 500 tribes, or 700 tribes. Mm -hmm. they, they came into North Africa, the Maghreb, and spread out into 500 tribes of Sabians. Um, now, the other thing is that you see that Afro-Asiatic people, including the Medianites, they were all, they used to um, divide themselves into five clans, or five, um, with under five, yeah, five clans. And you'll find that in the early Morris, too, in the Torah. Separating into the, the Romans called the Kinkajinjani, the five peoples. Mori Kinkajinjani. Um, and Kushita peoples also do that. Kushita speaking peoples also do that. And like I said, some of them also arrived from Arabia. Yeah, what I can't wait to do when I see your book is to get. It's the one like the old biblical maps and whatnot, where they where they try to say like these are the cities and these are the people and they divide up the areas. But actually, but actually, go go through and get another map of Arabia and compare it to where like we were just talking about like the Hamathites, for instance, where you can see like the Hamad in one spot. I can see the city of Hamath in Egypt, and then for instance, compare it to where they're trying to say that Hamath is now in Syria, right? I, I'll be able to, I'll be able to see like oh okay, this is completely not the story. This, 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 one of these is not like the other. What's going yeah. on? Yeah, because a lot of these people moved north, especially after the Islamic era. Era, and while there was earlier movements north during the Nabatean era, but like I said, the Nabateans, who became the um, Phoenicians, who were also the Phoenicians in the north, basically they were the Phoenicians in the north. They weren't even the, you know, the Phoenicians of the Eritrean Sea that stayed in the Eritrean Sea area, but the Phoenician, the Nabateans, and the Solimi, because the Greeks talk a lot about the Solimi too. And Romans um, were basically the Al Nubait and the Solini or Sulain people, Banu Sulain. So, if anything, anybody gets out of this, people should at least learn about the Banu Sulain and Al Jahiz's description of the Banu Sulain and the rest of the tribes of the Al Hara, the Hara, the Horite people. <laughs> because, um, and that's another thing, the word Hara, Hara might 
be connected to the word of the Horitz when they talk about the Horitz. Horitz. Might be. I'm not saying it is, but it might be. I have to look into that. But um, in the Howerton, also when they talk about the Howerton, you find that name going across Africa for the, the guy related peoples too. Um, but if anything, just they should take away that the Salimi and the Sulaim were the same people. And the Sulaim are the people of Sol Solomon or, or Sulaim. There's, there's a tribe called Suleiman, a tribe called Salma, and a tribe called Sulaim. And these tribes were connected to, to other peoples named uh, Gatafan, Gatafan, and uh, Abs or Yabs, who were the Jebusites, because this, the Jebusites are the people that were in Jerus uh, Dar es Salaam or Jerusalem, as it was called near Sana today. Um, so all these tribes came from the south and they brought their names with them. And it's the medieval sources that kind of verify this, that the Sulaim bin Mansur were the tribe of Salma, who, or Shalmai, who were from Manessa. And if you go to the Bible, you'll see in one place that it says, okay, these are the children of Manessa. You know, Judean, they were actually Judeans as well. But what happened was, all these people moved north, you know, after the eighth century BC. Some and, some and others remained in the south, but the original and the Israel started long before eighth century BC. You know, it was supposed to have the kings ruled Solomon and other kings ruled, um, you know, long before the, the Nabataeans got to the Nabataeans and Salimi got to um, that area the Levant and then they probably colonized parts of the um the uh Aegean and Mediterranean coast. That's where you get the you know other black black Menaeans too. So one part of the uh book it talks about um not the book. Well I think I did mention the book but in my blog spot I talk about how the Greeks considered that the Menaeans gave the name Minoan of, or King Minos to the uh, area, King Minos to Crete. So the idea that you know he came from Egypt is not was not Greek. That was West. That's a Western because they can still confuse Mitzrayim with um, instead of Menaean Mitzrayim, they think of it as Egypt, African Egypt. But you know they said that not only that. Rodmanthus, I think, was, um, isn't that the son of Minas or something? And they have a tribe called Rodamon, a Menaean tribe called Rodamon. So, I don't know. There's just so many hundreds of connections that you have to just put them all together. And, mm -hmm. and that explains why people are saying, the Israelite scholars included, that there was no historical Israel in Syria. Yeah, they I think there's find, a lot of people who want to check that out. Yeah, they can't, uh, yeah, that I have in the book too, that what the own their own scholars say, what the biblical archaeologists in Israel say, because there's a whole group of them that do not believe it has most of it, mostly a historical basis, that it's mostly, the early part was legendary, and then it became historical, they do little historical things. So the yeah. biggest implication of all that is would be like, for instance, the so are 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 would, would you make the claim that that the temple would be in the wrong location that that that, that you to, for the for the temple to be in the right place would have to be in southern Arabia? What we which temple? The Jewish temple, like the the Temple Mount, the 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 first, second temple, etc. I, I don't know much about. Um, you're talking about the 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 later, like the Temple of yeah. Solomon. How about that? The, the, the temple that Solomon built. Of what? The temple that Solomon built? Oh, Solomon, I'm sorry. No, because, yeah, yeah, the, the, so, camp, the temple of Solomon, um, if it existed, would have to have been in Yemen. And I say that also because there is a place, you know, the early 
Medieval Arabs also talk about the remains of Solomon's temple being in Yemen. So that's in the book. You have to look it up. Oh, that's so fantastic. Oh, man, I can, I'm not going to yeah. be able to And that I just learned in the year of writing the book, you know, because there was somebody that gave me a lot of certain sources that had a lot of information that very um, clandestine and people don't know about. And uh, actually, literally linked up all the. I didn't put everything that I found through the sources, but a lot of it was based on these new sources that um that I will let you learn about through the book. Yeah. So in the last year, I I, I was able to find out. I didn't recognize how much was was kept in in Arabic, and mm -hmm. how much information, and ironically, how much is in German right now. Um, well, yeah, most of the most of the texts of the Arabic that are worthwhile, a lot of it, a lot of it's in German. Yeah, I mean, the German scholars are killing it right now. Has been translated in German into German, yeah, but not in mm -hmm. English because right. And, and other things are happening, like destroy people are destroying things and t ripping out pages and stuff. Because some of the sources that I was using, some of the things are, are missing. You know, wow. right when it starts talking about certain things, I'm like, oh, hmm. You know, she, so that's what I'm saying. Everybody needs to start learning Arabic before <laughs> they do something. I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't Duly think. noted. Yeah. Duly noted. I did not know the sources were going. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. They're already changing like that. Okay. Well, that started in the colonial orientalist era. Yeah. Because um, some of you know they wanted to, like I said, they wanted to say that modern Syria was the Israel, but it's not. So you heard yeah. it here first. Yeah. Huh? No, I was gonna say you heard it here first. Yeah. From the Dana Marie, she said that, that she, the sources that she's citing are are already starting to be changed, and and, and pages found missing, etc. So it's incumbent upon us um, to build upon upon the research she's doing and whatnot, and educate ourselves and the ones behind us on on. On how to actually keep this information alive for ourselves. Right, right. Yep, that's what I'm trying to. I've been trying to say that. <laughs> I've been also saying that about my own stuff, copy and paste before it disappears. Because <laughs> I, mean, I did. There was a time I had um, a whole Facebook that was taken over by the Russians and Twitter feed. Wow. And then there's somebody else out there now trying to do something to uh, distort information that have the same information I have and they're putting it on their own and they see Russian um, you know letters and stuff. So despite what y'all are trying to make Marnici is not a Russian plant. <laughs> yeah, well, the Russians are trying to plant something on me. And they're also trying to create conflict between like, as if I'm a uh, racist, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you're definitely not right. Like that, you can you can see it, and you're working also in multiple places. You can be seen online stating that you that that you're mixed, that you honor all your heritages, etc., etc., etc. And no one should should come away from this conversation thinking that thinking that you're racist in any way, shape, or form. Right, right. Or interested? I'm not even interested in the racial um, matters in the sense that you know people are politically. People, social politics in that way. So if people talk to me about Black Lives Matter and stuff, you're not going to get a good answer from me. <laughs> the answer you want to hear, that's for sure. So like I say, this is, I look at the world as having a spiritual basis rather than uh, political or materialistic, you know, earthly basis. It's spiritual. And it's our job to merge into the mother try to um through the holy spirit you know mm -hmm. and receive her energy and uh use it for the good of everybody yeah i, I agree with that 100 percent. so we've been going for a little over five hours i'm gonna feel bad if i keep you here any longer um, well maybe. <laughs> yeah i'm getting <laughs> I'm old, old. I'm getting old, old. No, I'm not saying that. I just feel like I'm, I'm monopolizing your time and whatnot. Um, well, you know, I'm monopolizing my time, but um, 
Can I not know all your time? Do you have anything else to, to ask? Uh, I've got like a billion and one questions, but that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, would you be willing to come on for a part two after your book actually releases and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or even before that, if you want, you know, I can come on. But yeah, I guess I better go and cook dinner and <laughs> <laughs> take care of yourself too, right? Huh? Take care of yourself too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I should do that. Um, and I have these. I don't know what all these calls are about. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely go check out, check that out. Um, but I definitely want to. I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for your time, your energy, your spirit, you. sit, sitting down with us, um, and for the upcoming book that you have. Um, again, family, y'all should definitely go check this out. Go check out her work at AfroAsiaticBlogspot.com. Go check out her past interviews, her past presentations, and whatnot. They're fantastic. Um, I promise you, for anybody who's 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 interested in learning about the history. If nothing else, just understand this. The Berbers take up almost half of Africa. When you understand the the, 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 the length and breadth of, of where they cover and who they cover and whatnot. And so the yeah. system work is integral in terms of understanding that that whole that whole map and web of migration and peoples and stories, etc. And 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 building upon that, once you understand that, I, well, I'm, I'm really understanding that your new book is going to be even much easier to understand or, or more it's you're going to someone will understand the importance of it much more because from from there even more migration that, that's what migration right. is going to do or not right right yeah and yeah hopefully they can understand you know what's on there on academia now because that's basically the gist of the book in terms of how it's written and all the different different sources you know sourced highly sourced which is necessary with this kind of book which is bringing down you know, a lot of the traditional beliefs concerning our uh, religious origins, the you know, West, Western religious uh, origins. And I will definitely link that uh, that uh, snippet down below after the interview is over with. Um, but before I go, is there, is there anything else about your work that you want people to know or, or work that you that you that you've done that we haven't spoke on or work that you're going to do in the future that you want them to know about? Um, uh, you know, only that, you know, this is just the beginning of, I think, what's, what's part of a larger movement of people and energy that's going to be spent on building a new way of viewing and uh, dealing with life and, um, you know, respecting human relations and, and the earth. Um, I like the way the Moors now are they're, they're, taking care of their health of interested in educating the youth at home, which is <laughs> excellent. I should have talked to more about that um, because, uh, you know, from what I see in the Trenton schools at Camden schools and the other urban areas, I mean, it's a very dangerous place to be in terms of just your whole human humanity, you right. know, your, your mind. It's, it's like a t attack on the mind. And the your, your sense of your whole being, whole well-being, because there's so many people in there that are, are so many. I don't even say the teachers, but the, the students are not being raised in the right environments, and it's it's just they're not allowing the teachers to teach. I mean, I play you. I could play you something now. I take my class with the girls, and these girls are uh, two very smart and very um, butch. I'll say. Uh, highly creative girls, and they're very, you know, they're going to get A's for me. But they sing loud in the class while I'm trying to teach. They, sound, they were singing loud in the class while I'm trying to teach, and while the other students were studying, you know, they were rapping and, and all this kind of stuff. And um, I just thought, you know, and that that's not even abnormal in that, in that kind of setting. That's, that's normal what was happening in the schools today. Not just them, it's, you know, other kids walking around the class and walking out in the hall and acting crazy and rolling around on the floor. You know, ninth graders I'm, I was de dealing with just recently, and that's what they were doing. Um, but, and they're going to be lost if they don't get themselves together and start respecting authority, respecting education in school. That's all I'm saying. Uh, and your kids are being subjected to this in school. I mean, there are kids in there that just we're not looking around, not talking to anybody, and they're getting A's, you know, but 
that's hard. You know, they, they, they didn't want to move. They were frozen because all the craziness going on around with the other students, you know, cursing and talking and blo boys blowing kisses to each other and not, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> I don't know what I was, I don't know. I mean, like I say, if, if you want to send your kids to a prison, prison, that's, that's what exactly it's going to be like <laughs> if you do that. Um, now, I'm not saying all urban school systems like this. Like, I, I found a few schools in Wellingboro that I live next to also that are pretty decent because they don't put up with stuff. But some of these other schools, unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. What was your experience like with working with charter schools? Um, not much different. In fact, the, the charter schools also attract a lot of the kids that, you know, that have been kicked out of other schools, unfortunately. So... Mm -hmm. They're getting to be, you know, and the and the uh, schools don't want to kick them out because they want the money from the kids, you know, from the, what the government gives them, whatever. So, no, I mean, not much better. Unless you could send yourself to, a, oh, you know what? This is my suggestion if you can't send yourself out of, <laughs> out of the urban school system. At least have them go to, unfortunately, a not- African American or whatever, Asiatic, whatever you call them, Black American school. It, after at least after the sixth grade, that's that's going to be hell on your child. And I'm sure all many of you already know about it. Um, you go to a school that's Hispanic or recent immigrants or something where they still respect. Uh, other kids and the families are together and that kind of thing because otherwise you're gonna your kids are gonna be bullied and nobody can do nothing about it you don't have to touch the, touch the kids anymore um if you do the the parents will be in with their with their uh tight tight uh <laughs> well i wear tight clothes too but um i don't know it's just it's just for me what i felt so bad for the kids that were trying to learn and there was only a few trying to learn because the peer pressure is so great. So I think the Moors are on the right track in trying to educate their kids out of school. And these, all these other people saying, oh, it's the teacher's fault. Don't, don't, teachers don't want to sacrifice. Uh, they don't want to you know, teach and stuff like that. And they have low standards. That's a bunch of BS. It's a, it's a home that needs to teach the kid first and teach the kid how to respect school and education period that's what that's my belief and that's just from working in the schools not from you know what i hear or anything it's just from experience i definitely agree with that and, I, and shout out to all the moors doing uh and is right and anybody doing anything to get their kids out of out of a public school system into a school system that they control where they can they can they can uh get the kids the information that they really need they can actually like the sister's talking about like the the, the, the learning environment is not conducive to learning or humanity in general at this juncture and she's 100 percent correct like we're not we're, we're not getting into a war zone in, in intellectually yeah juncture. it's a war it is a war zone i can tell you that i mean you have people kids going to jail some of my kids were in jail at the time uh while i was there and they came back missing three weeks of class though. but um no i was going to say for example, another thing, you know, I had books in there, world history book, not a single civil black civilization in there, except I think it was like the knock or Benin, knock and Benin. Could you imagine that? A big, thick history book with no black people in it. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, that's what's going to happen right? when we don't control the, we don't control the information and what I, we got, we yeah. got the majority of school books coming from two, two Jewish organizations in the center of the country, you know what I'm saying? Going to the East and West Coast and whatnot. So. Well, again, I'm not going to get into this thing about Jewish, you know, and all that stuff. Well, no, I'm saying, I'll, I'll say like this, like, so like if, 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 uh, I'm saying like, so if, if you're not in control, if, if, let's say we were writing someone else's history, right? We're not going to necessarily, we, you, we might not focus on the history as much as we focus on our own. I'm not saying it's going to be an intentional thing. I'm just saying it's going to be, it's, it's going to be natural. You, you're going to speak about your own history more than you're going to speak about someone else's. Um, this stuff was going on long before the, the Jewish people got involved with that. I mean, that's been since it's Southern, Southern whites, you know, it's a white thing in general. It's not Jewish. So, um, 
That's what I believe. I don't. I don't believe because I know a lot of Jewish teachers are putting up with a lot of stuff and trying to to help help out um, urban urban kids in the schools. You're not. You know. You're gonna. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wasn't putting it on like teachers. I'm so, like so again. What I say. What I say was saying okay. is. That, is that no, the, I, people who make the book, school books. There's two. There's two. There's there's two. Uh, there's two big organizations that make the majority of school books for, for the for the educational system and the public school system. That's all. That's all I was thinking. And you were saying they were Jewish, right? <laughs> I mean, oh my God, I, I don't come from that. I don't know. I just, to me, when you start pinpointing people, you know, because there's a lot of people. There's a lot of things people can say about black people, and I I say things about black people, which is true. But you can't stereotype all black people. You can't say, oh, because they're Jewish or because they're black, um, you know, the, these people killed whatever in Jersey City. You can't do that. So so I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe I just stereotype the entire Jewish Jewish people. I just, I, like I said, no, no, you didn't have to bring up that. You didn't have to bring up that. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to criticize you. I'm just saying that's, I don't. I don't want to deal with that kind of energy put forth. I know in the black community, they have some kind of passion about the Jewish white community as if, but to me, that's the least of their worries. It's not the Jews in this country that are caught, that want to kill you. So I'm Jewish. Yeah. So but you, you're saying you are not taught. Listen, I'm not going to play games here. Okay. You are not talking about your particular people who you think you don't. I don't think you you identify as Ashkenazi Jew, right? No, I'm not going to be. No, I'm North African, 100. percent Okay. Well, we know. Look, I'm not going to. All right. I'm not going to play games with that. But thank you for having me on. Um, I hope the 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 my whole point about love and respect for everybody as this is a world of illusion and uh, something we have lessons to learn in this world for a reason. I said that. I, I said that. So I hope, you know, people take that to account. And that's the reason I'm doing this book so that people can learn that there was, there's cycles in nature. There's some people come up, some people come down. Uh, everybody's attacking, you know, at some point has attacked certain people. I know um, at this point in time, there's a tendency of both whites and blacks to attack uh, verbally and other ways, um, you know, Jewish people. Um, but I don't, I don't get into that because I know on the other side, you're in love with the Jewish people. You're in love with the people that come back on the other side. I need to be extremely clear about something. So I didn't. I make no attack or no dispersion on any Jewish person whatsoever. What I specifically stipulated is that we're not in control. I made the same point that you made. So you pointed no, out. Yeah, but you. It's white people. It's white people. It's not Jewish white Jewish people. Jewish white people. It's white okay. People. So are are you are you now are you now stereotyping all white people? No, but with that's what I'm saying. We didn't even have to bring that up. That's why I don't talk about that white and black and Jewish and this and that. And I'm not, anything that reminds me of Farrakhan, I don't deal with. So I didn't say, so I got it. You got to let me finish my thought on this. Okay. Cause you jumped in twice and you got to let okay. me finish my thought on this. Okay. So when you, when you brought up the concept of you opened up a history book and you saw two black civilizations, you saw Benin and Nock, right? Mm-hmm. The whole What's point. Oh. So my point, what I said about that was, is if you're not writing the book, if another nation is writing a book, another people is going to write about themselves more than they write about you naturally. All right. It's not another nation, though. That's those particular people that wrote this book. Cer certain people, commercial oriented people that want to make money wrote this book. That has nothing to do with being Jewish. OK, take Jewish out of it. If you're not writing the books, would you expect to see yourself in it as much? OK, yes, I agree. Okay, that's the, that's the simple point I made. No, you made more than that. No more than that point. See, one thing about me, um, Tyvon, and everybody out there. See, I don't play games when it comes to uh, this reality we're living in, and and sociopolitics, nationhood, all that stuff. 
if you don't are not willing to raise your level of consciousness where you can can understand and empathize with all humanity, then we're not gonna you're not gonna see the change that you want. It's just simple as that. And that's my whole point of writing and researching this. Because I'm past that point. I've never been like that for maybe many, many lifetimes. I don't know. I don't even know. I had to learn that. To tell you the truth. Okay, but, then I, I just so just so I can understand what you're saying, because I think I might I might have understood you, misunderstood you. So just so I can understand what you're saying better. So when you're saying it's not Jews, it's white people, what is the focus I'm supposed to have on that? It's white people as commercial people. It's not a whole, it's not, you know, one specific ethnic group, but it's people that don't know about black people. They don't know about it, us. It has nothing to do with, you know, they might be trying to uh, make money, but they don't know about black people. That's all, you know. Now there might be a time when, when, like I say, the white people didn't want uh, black people to know their history. But to say nowadays that kind of thing, that sounds very racist to me. I didn't say anything like that. I didn't implicate. I didn't apply that in any way, shape, or form. We just said control of history. All right. Well, control of history. Jews had control of of, of certain organizations. That's what you said. I, st I stated a very simple fact in terms of education that the people who print there's two companies there's two book companies that print that print the majority of school books for and all, all the people that work for that company are Jewish. I said it's a Jewish owned company. If it's a Catholic owned company, would they be Catholic? Why if would I, you? Have to if they that? were Catholic, I would have said Catholic. If they were German, why? I would have said German. Why? If, they were, if they were Nigerian, I would have said Nigerian. Well, why? All right. Because it, because it, because it, because it, because it, because it has the strong. I'm going to go just because I don't have, I don't want to talk about the subject anymore. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. I'm not mad, but I just want to go. That's the way, <laughs> that's the way I am. I don't want to talk about it because I, I'm, I'm probably going to say something you don't like. That's what I'm afraid of. No, you don't got to worry about that. No. I'm yeah, yeah, I think I do have to worry about it. Okay. If you want to go, I, I don't want to keep you. Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate I want, your time. I don't want that. Yeah, I don't want that kind of thing coming up with my interview. I tell, I tell everybody from the beginning, I'm not into racializing things. That's a racialized, uh, that was a racialized thing that, that came out of your mouth. So, okay, I gotta ask one question if I can understand you. Here's what I'm, here's what example, I'm saying. Listen, say for example, you don't know me. How if I have right my mother if my mother was white and Jewish, how would I take that? So when I hear you say it's not Jewish people, it's all white people, how would I take that? Because I'm I'm part white too. How about I that? didn't say I didn't say so am I. I didn't say it was all white people. In fact, it's not mm -hmm. has nothing to do with racialize racializing things. Okay, so yeah, I, like I, said, I, I hear you. I hear you. Talk I about hear this because I don't want the, any negative energy associated with my book. And that right. Is, I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to argue with that. I want, I want you to get your your statement out clear. Okay, so this, this is what I'm saying. So 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 when you were talking about when you're making your, your your point about the book, so people don't think that you're racist. This is what I want to get clear because you were talking about people getting this unclear beforehand. So I, when you were talking about uh, the the concept of the, of the knock situation and the Benin situation in the book, please clarify that for the people. And I'm I'm gonna stay out of it so they can get. No, your I don't clarify anything for the people. I said, I already said my piece with that. I said knock and only knock and Benin people are in there. That's what I said. Right, and I just, I just want I just want I just want you to paint your, your paint your point you were making with that, so it's not painting without what I was saying. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Well, at this point, like I said, I'm not really interested in talking about this kind of subject anymore because people are brought up a certain way different than I am. And people, you've been out on the community. I know what the community thinks about this kind of thing. So I'm not, you know, and like I said, I don't think of myself as, you know, belonging to any one group, especially anymore, because I, I don't. I feel like I'm here for a purpose in this lifetime to help out the black community. That doesn't mean that I think we're any special or 
you know, um, anything specialer than other people. And, and I definitely don't feel like talking about other people uh, in connection with, with um, you know, just when I'm saying the Benin, Benin and Nak culture is the basis of African civilization in these books. That has to do with me. I'm not talking about Jews. That has to do with me. And my responsibility to get information out to, you know, people uh, up in the African Asiatic community. And even in the, uh, you know, I also put up pictures of Mayan, Mayan um, ruins and other things dealing with the Latin, Latin American community, because I had Latin students too. But, um, you know, I don't want to get into this. So Jews own this and all that. I just don't want to do it. That was not my intent. And I, have, I give you my sincerest apology if I put some energy into your interview that you didn't want there. I think there's, I still think there was a mis misunderstanding between us two. But again, I still apologize for putting any, inf any energy my, into your interview that you don't want there. My thing is, what, you, are you looking at all these different entities and institutions and saying, oh, this one's Jewish and this one is, you know. No, uh, I, I literally did the same well, thing you did. I looked into my school book and so I was, I was wondering why I didn't see more, more, more stories from where the people I come and how, from. And how, so I, I literally looked, I looked into, I looked into who owned the companies, who did certain things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I found out something very interesting that two companies supply the vast majority of public school. Okay. Well that, that's an interesting, um, that's interesting information, but I'm sure that the people writing for these companies are not all Jewish. And, and, and probably the one, the, the owners probably could care less what's in the book, except for what makes money. And that could be Jewish or any other ethnic group in this country, including black people, because I see black people putting out BT. Yeah, I, com I, I completely agree with that. And I would, I would agree. I think we would also agree that us, us knowing our own history is not. It would not be commercially beneficial for for a, a lot of people. Right, right. So that's why I said people should people should, uh, you know, homeschool, homeschool. Right. Stop complaining and homeschool. Stop worrying about what other people are doing. Stop, uh, you know, targeting other groups. Because that's actually why you're in the situation that you're in now. And that includes me, myself, and I. Not, you know, not, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about general. But, um, yeah. So I agree with that point 100%. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so. Any other questions? I mean, I'm not, I, I feel bad now because I'm, I'm not mad, but you know, I'm just a very direct person. I'm, and uh, people. No, I appreciate that. A lot of people get, lot of people get upset because I go straight after the truth. I don't like when people, you know, put. Hip, you know, I don't like any hip hypocritic, hypocritical stuff or, you know, mean spirited. Stuff involved in what I'm doing, so I appreciate yeah. directness very much. So I, I take I take no offense at it. Again, I still I still say where there's a misunderstanding, but again, I don't I take no offense with it. It is what it is. Right? Um, I don't want to like again. I don't want to force you force you to be here like anymore. You want to be talking about anything you don't want to talk about. Um. Okay. You know what? You're a very nice person. So that's why I'm still here. If you want to ask questions, go right ahead. You're okay. very, oh, you know what? I think that you and the Moors like you, you don't have, I think you're level-headed. Like many, many of us women are not level-headed. That's why I like dealing with the Moors. Okay, I'm, I'm, I feel bad too. And that's part of the reason why I want to get off. I felt bad. I'm, I'm kind of getting upset with you. But no, you want to, Right. If you want to keep going, I'm I'm here. Oh, I'll you know what I'll I'll ask this question. Like so, um, 
there's so being that you have you have you have a lot of experience in the educational system and whatnot, um, different levels of, of education. Also being in the system yourself, like teaching. Um, I remember I, hear, I was reading on your on your uh, Facebook that you were teaching it recently as a, as a substitute uh, in Trenton or something like that, yes. right? Yes, that's where I was. So in in setting up these schools for like a homeschooling system or something like that, um, what would be some of the some of the uh, uh, pieces of advice you might want to you, you would you would give us in terms in terms of uh, setting up a curriculum or something of that nature? Because I feel I feel like that would be that the maybe a, a real tough part to deal with in, or 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 wrap your head around if you haven't been in the school system. Well. The main thing, like I, I mean, I've actually put stuff on, on my Facebook page about it. And main thing is that you, you know, I mean, you know, I, I've taught both in substitute, a substitute long-term charter school. I mean, college, different places. And the main thing is that I see that people in the urban school districts are lacking um, appreciation for education. And scholarship and that leads to lack of striving for the highest standards so for example africans i'm talking about the real africans come over here from africa they're learning pre-calculus in and not only africans but a lot of asian people learning pre-calculus in six eighth six to eighth you know six seventh eighth grade while i mean the kids i was dealing with could not write in fourth grade, read in fourth grade English. So the first thing would be to focus on what other, like the suburban schools that have the kids reading, you know, an hour a day, at least. There's mathematics, I mean, mathematics, they have to, you have to, that's what the main principal thing I would focus on now for, except for reading, reading and mathematics, because once you do mathematics, you can do all kinds of sciences um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be like the reading can can be you know involved with experiential learning experiential learning um, you know it could be in other words combining science with uh, combining science as part of the, the reading and language curriculum or social studies you know combine combination things because you know an another thing is we're lacking lots <laughs> i hate to say this but we're lacking common sense in a lot of things and this is because we're not using our brains as much as in school and so when they say you know the iq of of african americans is much less than other other groups it has nothing to do of course with the our brains, but culturally, we're not um, we're not interacting with our environment as much. Like the kids in Trenton, I mean, they've never been out of their what is it six block area, and they don't go to museums. They don't go to um, you know you have, you have to take your kid out, get them used to other cultures, other um, you know history. Well, history you can just go to my blocks down there. But um, or create your own block spot. Go there's actually a lot of block spots on here for, on the internet for kids. Anything you want actually can be gotten through um, in the internet now. You know, in terms of education, I was just looking at the Khan Academy and how some people just put themselves to school through school on that. You know, so um, there's a lot of lot of um because. In Africa, you know, they don't allow this this stuff to happen. A lot of places they don't allow kids to talk back and, and do certain things that were are allowed in public schools. Mm -hmm. And now even in the charter schools. Charter schools, like I say, I, I didn't see much different. In fact, back in some 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 uh seemed worse. Um so I don't know why that was, but like I said you know these places these um schools where the kids had parents like the latin kids you know the weird thing is i mentioned the word divorce to my because i was before i was in trenton i was I mean, before i was with the ninth grade academy i was with them um, uh 
the uh, I was an ESL doing ESL with mm -hmm. kids from Guatemala and Honduras, and I mentioned the word divorce with them, and they were fifth grade students, and they were all like, "Oh, you know, like they'd never imagined why how that's like a bad word. That's a like curse." Right. Now imagine if I mentioned something like getting married or not getting married and having kids out of wedlock. I wouldn't bring that up to them because that's not uh, probably not heard of in their country. And that's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, I was arguing with my, my brother about this yesterday too. It's more accepted in America in general, but it should be less, since there's a war going on against uh, knowledge and economically against uh, Asian people, or upper Asian people, then don't put yourself in a situation where you're not able to, you know, support your kid and and help them learn and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, where you're, ha I don't know why, I don't know how people could do that. Um, and if you're gonna, anyway, we, I mean, those institutions were created by by Africans, the marriage institution, school, and school, and all that, you know. So why, why um, follow the lead of the greater um, Western society when you know that's not what your culture had said? That's not what your culture believes, and yet we we don't really have a culture anymore, like I said, because um, don't want to. They don't want to like the kids. When I introduced them, some of the kids were interested. Some of their kids, eyes were wide open, you know, they stopped talking when I was talking about the moors and all that stuff. But a lot of them weren't. You know, a lot of them weren't even interested in, in knowing. I mean, so unless you want your kid to, to face a lot, and not only that, there's a lot of energy that kids or people carry with them into the schools, you know, from home that can influence you. So... That's my belief of dealing with shamanism. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in the wrong place with the wrong peers, you can get <laughs> influenced the wrong way. I mean, that's why people don't want their kids around people that are not achieving or not not successful. Right. It's heartbreaking to hear that our kids aren't even interested in hearing hearing what you got to say about our own history and whatnot. Because yeah. I would like like if if, I, if you were teaching when I was in school. And there was somebody singing in the class or whatnot, and I'm trying to hear what you're saying on this topic. Like, I literally would have walked, I would have escorted them out the class for you. Like, no, no, I'm trying to hear this. Like, because we don't hear this all the time. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I grew, I grew, I grew, I grew up here, I grew, I grew up here like nothing but, but, but Egypt was Greek and Roman in in, in the world history, and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? Like, hmm. hearing what you're talking about is is night and day different than what than what I grew up here and whatnot. Um, so well, as we speak to this question here, like so, like so, you're like I'm 37, so you're basically teaching like my generation's kids and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, one thing I noticed is that is that my gen my parents knew more about what I was learning than what than what than what my generation knows about what their kids are learning. What like the gap of understanding is way different um, mm -hmm. in terms of how they and what they're keeping up on. And so what I'm, I'm noticing is like my generation doesn't know what their kids don't know. You know what I'm saying? Right, so right. As, a, as a teacher, when it comes to this history, when I, what 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 are the biggest areas that our kids need to need need help on in, in, that that you find that they don't know about that we can help them out at home with? Um, I would say, well, I don't know how many people know math. Like I say, mathematics. Just just, just in terms of history, just in terms of history, whatnot. Oh, in terms of history. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, the whole slave narrative needs to be readjusted so people know that, like you said about the Berbers. I mean. The Berry Berry, and um, you know the right right before that the slave narrative, right before the slaves were brought to Atlantic the Atlantic there were, it was actually like a um, re rebuttal, like what the Europeans said. They they said, look, they were doing this to us. There's books showing you know with, with written sources saying like they were these Moors these, well these they said the Barbary corsairs. Right, you know, doing this to us, so we're going to do this to them. So that's what the early American, um, white white American um, 
settlers or you know the the or their leaders are saying about Africans. They were saying, you know, these Moors are, are taking us as slaves. And at that time, there was still a lot of uh, slavery going on in North Africa with the bringing them um, with what's his name, because Mulai Ismail and other other early um, sultans in Morocco were definitely looking more black than anything else. And that's why um, Shakespeare. See, this is why I think people should get fear of blackness which is on West Africa Review, which I write about the Moors, the Sultans. I, you know, I talk a lot about the Sultans in Morocco and how they were black and how they were taking European uh, slaves and the, how the Americans were, what the Americans were saying about that, and what the British were saying about that, and then this, these, uh, what is it, wicked Negroes, you know, were taking, you know. It just was uh, definitely a black, white, conflict or or um what do you call it um focus um in early colonial history and they were looking at it as it as it on as if you know they were getting even getting even not just about taking slaves but getting even allowing this to take place because of what 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 was happening to uh, you know, their ships would go in into that area and they'd be their people would be taken slaves. The men on the boats would be taken slaves, just like in the Europe, Europeans. So early Americans were getting um, harassed by these uh, sultans in the, in the 19th century. Um, and actually before that even, because Shakespeare, part of his, one of his plays, Titus and Andronicus, was about one of the Black Sultans of Morocco. Yeah, Aaron the Moor. Yeah, that's a cold play yeah. right there. Yeah. So, I mean, it had been going on a long time. Like I said, it's a, it's, so they didn't look at it like they were the only ones doing it. You know, they didn't feel guilty because they knew what was happening to their their own people. So, but now it's like you people, especially African American people, or along with African American people, are trying to. Think of it as, oh, the Europeans took African slaves and the Indians of us brought over here and um, white man's a devil and all this other stuff. But, you know, like I said, this has been, had been going on for a thousand years or more in North Africa. And when remember, those, those areas used to be black. That's why I wrote the, 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 the title, Fear of Blackness. Those people used to be completely black, and and over time, those people, you know, through slavery, a lot through slavery, as well as, you know, people turned Turk or mercenaries came in, um, and tur actually turned the tide. The same thing that happened in the Near East. So, um, yeah. So the slave narrative has to be checked. I want to say check like put into perspective, the proper context, instead of all these people trying to say, uh, you know, like the white, you know. Now today, of course, I don't think, I don't think people um, in America, um, like some of these people that are racist, should be doing that with the, what they're doing. The white people that are racist, um, but. All I'm saying is, uh, at that time, you have to put things in perspective. What was going on in Africa, and even Africans were trading their own people in their own—not even their own people, because the different tribes would trade, you know, prisoners of war. But they say now their own people, just like they say in the Middle East, it's their own people. That's a bunch of bullshit too. It's different. Those are different people. They consider themselves different. The Kurds are not—we not looked at as the same people, for example. Um, so. I don't know. That's one thing in terms of black people need to start looking at um, that and, you know, the fact that when they were brought over here, that word had meaning, the ancient Berbers. They talk about the ancient Berbers. They knew, they knew who that was, that, that, who they were. Now, at the, at the time, uh, like I said, at the time in that 
in the 1600s, I think wasn't wasn't um, I think that was in the 1600s or 18 was that the 18th when they wrote that thing about the Berber, Berber and ancient Berbers or was that? Yeah, 1740. Oh, 1740. Okay, yeah, but at the time of that, the, you know, North Africa had already been changed and um and a lot of the people in the in the north were not you know uh berbers but they were called there were still moors there i mean the moorish arabs as well as other arabs and they just they just called people moors you know after, after that in north africa because they were from the maghreb that's what basically meant the people of the maghreb the moors um but uh, yeah, so that was that's the main thing I would say to, to understand that um, black people were actually feared people, and and that's part of the problem. Um, not even not even um, with Americans, but before that, with the there were other conflicts going on in the Fatimid area era in Egypt between blacks and the, the Kurds. When I say blacks, I'm talking about the Berbers too. The Berbers, the Arabs, the Copts, the Israelites, because like I say that when um when the when the uh Arabs went in there and including um a Mamluk, the Mamluks, what's his name? Uh, Al Makrisi. Al Makadisi or Makrisi, he said you can't tell the difference between an Israelite, a Nubian a Copt or an Abyssinian. Al Madrisi. Yeah, uh, Al Makrisi. And Macrisi he said. Or Madrisi? No, Makrisi. Okay. 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 And he was a man look who said um, not only that, that those people were in such a conflict that they would kill each other over, you know, over nothing. They were killing each other. Wow. They hated each other. The, those people were together against the Greeks, or excuse me, the constant Byzantine people that were there, and the white and other Turkish people. He said those Greeks were against these black people, i.e. the cops, the Israelites, the Nubians, and the Abyssinian. And they were, you know, they were kill each other for nothing, for no reason. They were constantly killing each other. The same thing happened in, in Spain for a while too, in different areas. So this black white thing is not just an American problem. You know, it's been going on different time periods and, and sometimes it's been the whites in power, sometimes the blacks in power. And the black and the red, or the red, as the Arabs call them, the red people. Mm -hmm. okay. So when I talk when I talk to to to, to the children uh, from that generation, I know like you're talking about them not knowing about um, the the era of slavery and like how and, and kind of like our like how people we, we might have been feared in that situation. One thing I noticed is that um, a, like so a lot of Moors we talk about is like the age of discovery and whatnot. But when you go prior to that, um, that you're talking about like the Moors fighting for a thousand years, like starting in 711 probably. Um, but before that, you still see you still see Crusades, you still see the Punic Wars and all that kind of stuff. Do you see that as like from the Punic Wars to the Crusades to the Reconquista to uh, to slavery? Do you, do you say it's like almost like a continue contiguous fight, or is it is is it, would be, would it be wrong to look at it like that? Um, a good question. Um, no, I think sometimes you know the uh, Arabs and the, the the Muslims united definitely against. The non, the Christians, whether they were black or white, you know, there were Christians who were black, like the Nestorians, mm -hmm. uh, many Nestorian blacks in, in Asia and in, you know, including up into into uh, the Central Asia, and then in Ethiopia and Arabia, and, um, and those people, you know, were against against the Muslims. So, and who were, you know, of also different backgrounds. So I would say, no. Um, no, definitely not continuous. Even though they've been continuous wars, 
Um, and a lot of times they were like racially based or religious based. Um, they weren't definitely, they, didn't, they weren't constantly uh, black, white based. Now there is an interesting subject matter with regards to the so-called Zanj rebellion and the certain Arabic, modern Arabic writers are saying there was never a, a Zandri rebellion that involved mostly black s slaves in uh, Near East. That it was mainly about modern, about Arabs. And there were only a few, you know, Africans involved. So the whole idea of the Zandri rebellion being from, because you have to understand the early Zanj were not Africans. The earliest Zanj were considered considered the word comes from um persian word for the uh um people that were in their country before them or or you know the darker skinned medes persian original persian people that were in their country and they were known or considered to be related to the arabs so they were the zanj you know the, the people that moved in prehistoric times or pre-christian pre-Judean, uh, not Judean, pre-Christian times further east that were Arabs. The word Zanj referred to Arabs, not not just, uh, and the Zanj were considered descendants of, like I said, Dahak or Al-Dahak, al Zohak. And uh, so yeah, so that, that whole narrative of the Zanj rebellion apparently didn't happen or it was like not, not, even though it was a black against non event against red, um, it wasn't about Africans, you know, being slaves and stuff. That didn't start till much later, you know. Uh, much, the majority of majority of early um, slaves in in the Muslim world were not Africans. They were, you know, basic. I mean, a number of European peoples, Greeks, Slavs. And also Eurasia people, Syrians, those kind of people. So, yeah, so I can see where our concept of slavery is thinking the older we got to get cleared up just all together, just get a, a wider range and scope on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when when you're saying that our kids are, are not interested to learn to learn this history and whatnot, what, uh, being that you're on the front lines of the of the whole situation, what do you feel is is this interesting to them and what do you feel is uh, is catching their interest? Um, well, first of all, they were always on their cell phones when I was there, uh, even though I would tell them to put it away. Cell phones and Chromebooks. So I don't know why they started letting people, the kids, uh, you know, with cell phones in their schools and stuff, always looking and, and creating, uh, you know, emails and YouTube things. But um, yeah, rap is all I saw, rap or rap music and um, uh, I don't know what, why there's a whole, there seems to be a lot of homosexual stuff going on in the school. That's a new interest of theirs. Um, so, you know, flirting and flirting and I don't see, <laughs> what's their interest? Let me see. Um, now, military, they did have a certain kids in the military, the ROTC, you know, that were doing very well, doing very well, and knew how to, you know, resist temptation and peer peer pressure and stuff like that. But, that's interesting because you so so basically that's almost referring back to what you were talking about in terms of like at home our kids aren't getting a certain level of discipline education and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So like you're saying right there, like for people getting supplemented discipline, it, it's also reflecting in their education. Interesting. Yeah. That's, that's a lesson. That's that's a big lesson for my generation and whatnot. Because I, I'll say this right now: like I've I've never seen a more hands-off generation of parents in my life than my. <laughs> um, yeah, because they, they think they can just leave in front of the computers and the. Um, right. Yeah. Or in front of grandma and grandpa and whatnot, right? Like I've never seen like I've never seen more more grandparents babysitting kids full time yeah. than I have in my generation. Yeah, that's true, and um. But I did have a hard time getting my son off the computer. I got I to gotta admit that because, uh, and I don't even think he got, really got off, but he was he happened to be a very smart, you know, smart kid. He never really had to study much. Um, but. 
So yeah, maybe so, that's it right there. Like, so, so, and, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I think it's harder if you're like, I got divorced from my ex, you know, I came home with my parents. So I think it's harder if you're not with a significant, you know, the, the, the father. And that's another thing. I do think they need a lot more men teachers in the schools to handle because <laughs> these, the, you know, these, the women teachers, there's only so much you could do, you know, when the guys got in, get into fights and stuff. But usually it's the women, the girls fighting anyway. So. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's why I'm saying the, the Moors have it going on when it comes to staying. They should stay with the institutions, mm -hmm. uh, value the institutions of the Moors, which is, you know, whatever marriage and, and other things, um, not drinking, not um, waiting until marriage to have kids and stuff like that. All right, proper courtship. Um, yeah. So, and my, my ex was a very good provider for his kids. Just he was a little too dominating for me to stay with. And that's because his culture, you know, which I thought was just stereotype, stereotype but it's not. So, um, you know, and it's different than, it was different. It's the most, Kabbalah culture was the most patriarchal, paternalistic community in Africa. I have that in a book, I, you know. Wow. I did yeah. not that. So, you know, it's funny because they don't think you, the women can do anything by themselves, that kind of thing. Very, very, you know. And then, um, yeah, so I'm not saying all the North Africa is like that or all Muslim communities, and even though I did see some strange things happening with the Jordanian and the Arab people I met too, because I was with the Yemenite. And that's the problem, that's a, the that's a thing about um, modern Near Eastern culture. It's completely different than the early pre, well, even during early Ar Islam, the Arabs, women often had, you know, the, the, the social power, if not, you know, the military power, whatever. But um, I was just saying, uh, what, what was I saying? I'm talking about the, about North Africa? Yeah, you went into Jordan, you went into a... Uh... Oh, oh, no. Yeah, when I was living in, in New York with my ex, and I would see all these different... You know, there's a lot of... I was living near Atlantic Avenue where there was a lot of Arab people settled. And, you know, I went up to my... One of my neighbors who owned the apartment we were living in, a Yemenite family, and the lady was sitting on the floor, and he had... Well, I was a guest, so he had me eating with them, but the, the, the mother had to sit on the floor. And I thought, uh oh, well, this is too, you know, this is a shame. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and her her daughter actually looked a lot like me, and she would say, you know, you look like my sister. She would, she would have to say that to her daughter to tell me because she couldn't speak English. You know, and then she would be sitting in the back of the car and instead of, you know, front. So a lot of that stuff still happens in the Near East, you know, in the traditional cultures. The women have to walk behind the men, you know, or sit in the back seat, that kind of thing. In comparison, do you know, uh, so uh, in, in talks we're having about the Berbers, et cetera, um, in North and West yeah. Africa, do you know, do you know, do you know of any, I, I know I've heard you talk about certain, certain people who, who like where the women would go send the men off to fight. And it's almost like the women called the shots more. Yeah, a lot of, and especially the Tuareg society, which, which is like probably the toughest, was the toughest people in Africa, if not you know, the world at the time. Um, yeah, the, the women still hold the, uh, a lot of the social power. Like you have to pass property, I think, in certain among the women. And, and then the men in certain communities have to speak in soft tone among the, um, among the, you know, when they come near women, that kind of thing. And then even I even read something about the men getting sex sexually harassed or something. Which wow. <laughs> which I found funny. Right. That kind of thing, you know, because if you don't have power, that's, you know. 
That's extremely interesting. So, I, I, wow, I, would, I definitely would have lost money on that bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, only in the Beja culture, too, which is the Pacific further, further east, um, very, very dominant, dominant women, uh, women minded, women centered culture in the sense that, you know, if you, that I had read in about the book, what was the book on? Sons of Ishmael by George Murray talks about how the, if a Beja by accident touched his mother-in-law, he was banished from the whole country forever. You know, and then also the same thing with the early Arabs. The Arabs, all the, if a woman wanted to get the divorce, all she had to do was turn her tent around a certain way. <laughs> that you know, so I think women are sometimes getting back what they gave out to. But um, yeah, and still in the uh, the the places where they still speak um, the early South Arabian dialects, like the, the Mara, Kara, Mahra, and the Kara, and the, all those cultures further, you know, Hajimaut to, to uh, Oman, um, they still have a culture, culturally, they haven't acculturated this paternalistic thing, and apparently there, there's oppress, oppression in certain areas of, you know, women oppressing men. And and I know in um, Assyrian texts they mention you know a lot of times when they were fighting against the Arab leaders they were usually mentioning women and not men. So it was like the women that were leading the uh, charges against the Assyrians. But you know, so it's not never good to be extreme in one sense and stuff. But that's definitely. In some African or Afro-Asian cultures, that's the way it was. You know that the, the women were getting too, too much, too much exploiting, exploiting the men. You know. Yeah, I promise you that the female Moors and, and Israelites out there won't have any issues with you uh, putting out any uh, articles on uh, the women subjugating the men. <laughs> well, yeah, the Jewish women too, especially, were known for that. Yeah, for for being the the men was like. Man was like an appendage. They said, I just saw that on even a uh, <laughs> European woman saying that. Recently. Oh, wow. <laughs> in society. <laughs> so, so, what happened, you know, what happened when the Greeks and other people got started writing the Bible, you know, things changed in the Bible, were changed around, and the names of, of women, you know, became, some of them became those of men. Um, really? But that's on the it's another, uh, you know, like I know the word Levi also comes from Leah, Leah or something, something of that sort. Uh, there's a book called The Arabian Matriarchate by William, um, name. but he talks about that, how originally the, the Arabs are totem, totemic and Ar the women, you know, pass the property and lineages and, mm -hmm. and that's why, and they claim descent. That's why Muhammad, sometimes he's talked about his background coming through the line of Sulaim, the women he came from, because mm -hmm. his tribe was made out of Sulaim, Sulaim maternally and uh, Kanana on the other side, Canaanites on the other side. Interesting. Yeah. Completely so, opposite. No way, I'm sorry. Completely opposite of what we've been taught, you know. Prepared. So in that, in that vein, like, so, I look at I look at uh, Ethiopia, for instance. I look at their Christianity and whatnot, and I'm, I'm I get I get really confused. When I look at modern Ethiopian Christianity because these are the these are these um, are the people of Sheba, but at the same point in time, like the women can't be priests there in modern times, and I find that extremely well, perplexing. Yeah, but you see, but see, that's what I'm, that's why I told people you have to understand they've been influenced by the Armenian and Parthian, well, mainly Armenian Christian and Greek Christian cultures. They've been very highly influenced by those other Greek, I mean, there's other non-African and non afro cultures. And, and um, I don't know if it was early Christian then, but by late Christian times, you know, all of, all of Christianity was like that. Because the people that were in control of that were mainly, you know, Byzantines and Armenian Greeks, people in the north. So a lot of the... Uh, traditional ways of Ethiopia have changed 
you know. Probably not even the earliest Christianity. Probably not, I mean, not the earliest representation of Christianity. Yeah, so we have someone in the chat saying uh, they're trying to figure out uh, all the different uh, the citations and references you're citing and whatnot. And I, I would I will definitely tell you this, family. Uh, go go check out our blog spot and, and go check. And when, when our book comes out, I promise you, there's going to be a good, there'll probably be a chapter of references in that joint. Um, I, <laughs> well, probably a couple chapters because it's over. Well, the book itself is 400 pages, and I have like 10. It's probably over a thousand. A thousand citations. Oh, you just yeah. made me happy. You said four hundred pages. I thought I was gonna be like two hundred or something. Like, oh yeah, Wait, she said four hundred on them. It's yeah. about to. Be, yes, sir. Okay, so you're about to make a lot of people mad, is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and um, the uh, I was gonna say the um, the book is actually it's like four four inches by seven page uh, length. So it's like a, I have a book here that he sent to me, but it's not, a, you know, they're not really big books, a little smaller than this, this one. That's my GRE oh. book. Um, oh, this would be the, the size on it, but you know, it's much thicker than this one. Yeah, 400 pages. But that, yeah. Heavy weight on them. I like that. Yeah. Well, my the publisher is very happy, you know, extremely happy. And he can't, he was like mad at me because he wanted to get it out earlier and I, he didn't like the pictures though. So so I'm sure he's he's gonna be happy this week. Um and, and you know, able to put it for for and out there in the next couple of weeks. So when it's out, I don't know what gonna, oh, go ahead. well, I think it's going to be um, put out in in universities first. It's supposed to, his book's good, like thousands of universities, a few thousand universities, and um, he also gives me, I think he said, fifty copies, fifty copies first. So when it when it's out uh, and available for for uh, for a sale, where will people be able to find it? Oh, it'll be everywhere. I mean, regular stores, you know, like usual. I mean, regular stores and but black bookstores, of course, will have it. And uh, online, Amazon, you know, that kind of thing. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't I have no idea what it's gonna cost because like I said, some of his books are, are very expensive. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be Hopefully it'll be in the fifty dollar or less range, but it might be you know over a hundred. I don't know. Especially for that size book, I don't know. Yeah, well, for, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, Jack, it'll be interesting to see what the price is when it comes out. The, the, yeah. Particularly the information inside, because I can tell. Again, family, when you see when you see how much how many citations are just in the, in the little in the in the snippet. She didn't even give a chapter. It's just it's a snippet of a snippet, really. I think it's just two pages. <laughs> When you see the amount of citations just in that, you're like, okay, like you're gonna, you might mess around and get a doctor just off reading this book. <laughs> well, you, you might have to send her extra money for the course you just got. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, yeah, if there people are able to read it, they'll definitely have more than enough um, for probably teaching about teaching about it. I don't know. I can I can tell you right now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be working on trying to take the information from that book and uh like you said like the like like the children from uh from the generation you teach they're they're not interested in whatnot and and I agree with you in the sense to where it seems like like with the, with the cell phones and and what in uh the laptops etc whatnot and all that type of stuff like it, it's all about instant gratification and whatnot and so a lot of the information you have to teach is corrective and whatnot so when you got to correct information you got to you got to be like here's the wrong lesson and here's the right lesson. So yeah. it's almost like double long for people and whatnot. So yeah. uh, I think in, in you doing your job, it becomes behooving upon people, the parents and whatnot, my generation went out to take that information and and, conden and do what we can to condense it to, or not even condense it. Let me ask you this. if we, what, what would be your advice in condensing information as dense as yours to a generation that's all about instant gratification? 
So if I if I wanted like if I want to get to your work but not but, yeah, yeah, yeah make but a group not uh, service go ahead. Yeah, I would say making a group of um. If if you're talking specifically about the book, you can make a group of um. Kind of like summaries about the chapter, each chapter. Like I have a chapter on the connection between the Gassan and the birth of the Medianites chapter on the exodus you know that kind of thing and show um a chapter on the connection between the judeans and the Salim and the or mansur how is his name uh but you know it's gonna be it would be hard because like i say then unless you know the names of the, the biblical peoples and i do put you know but this is more for academics people who already know mm -hmm. biblical peoples but that's why I tried to make the blog too, and people ha are having having problem understanding a lot of that. But and so I'm also putting up this Facebook, the Facebook page, and putting little snippets, of information, and with pictures so people can, you know, uh, grasp some of it. Um, I'm thinking of making booklets up for kids too. Yeah, but, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, now I have more time. I'll have more time, so. That would be fantastic. Okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to making some illustrations based upon the information. Like, So I believe you said that you, you your book's going to cover around like 60% of the people mentioned in Genesis, et cetera, whatnot, like in terms of the tribes. Yeah, mentioned or whatever. Mainly 60%, only because, you know, there's like thousands and thousands of people, thousands, a thousand people mentioned in the Genesis, really. But I mean, I do talk about like I do go over the totality of the um, the sh the major the, the direct sons of Shem like the Aram and the Salah and all those people and where the names come from and where they were and why why they are um yeah where they were and when they moved from the Yemen and stuff like that uh like the Edomites and why they're not you know in in the north and what their names are now. Or the, the Arabic names are of it, what their Musnad names were, and you know, and then I talk about uh, you know Israel, the tribes of Israel, and where they were in Yemen, and where where they are in Yemen, and and, and how they some of those people are also found in the Horn of Africa today. I don't go into the West African or the African component of you know in this book so much because that's a whole other. Like I said, the fear of blackness does cover some of that. The movement of very very uh, and who would consider themselves very very and stuff like that and the fact that you know that the arabs never considered berbers anything other than black so i don't know why people are trying to pretend that um uh, you know <laughs> that anybody and their mother now is berber is 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 representative of the ancient berbers i mean if you, you want to call yourself berber fine you want to call yourself Amazigh, fine, but that doesn't mean that your the original Amazigh were described as Ethiopians. Or was he described they were javelin using Ethiopians with riding camels. They were related to certain Tuareg, not not everybody. So people in North Africa, if they don't want to recognize all their ancestors, don't don't try to take, you know, don't take it. Africans' ancestors or Black Africans' ancestors, because you don't want to recognize your other ones. And the same thing for the Middle East people. You know, don't say you're these these people are descendants of slaves, and and you're you're the true Arab when the Arabs didn't even like people with fair skin. They looked down on that. So, the earliest ones, you know, they have now they did like themselves some. Uh, Blonde women, but um, there was um, I read something about um, uh, that the fair-skinned Arabs after a while were called the sons, the children of the clitoris, because at that time, of course, uh, the Byzantine and other other um, you know European Eurasia women did not get circumcised and that you know at that time all muslim and jewish original jewish 
women were all circumcised, like the African people I came from. So, you know, I found that interesting. And that was kind of like telling that the early Arabs were African related people. So the so, women got circumcised too, you say? Hmm? Did you say that the women got circumcised too? Oh, yeah. Ex excise. It's called excision. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know that in Islam. Well, when you were talking about in that, in, that, in, that particular, in that particular area, I was like, that 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 was knowledge to me. Like, I didn't know that. I knew about in other spots, but I was like, oh. when you said the Jewish people, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. There. Oh yeah, and I have a part in my um in my book where it talks about how the the certain groups in Africa, according to was Strabo or Diodorus or one of them, said they were ex the women were excised. In the Jewish fashion, meaning like <laughs> the Africans took it from the Jews, you know, but when in reality, of course, the Jews and the Africans were the same, same people basically. And um, unless, you know, at that time, the early time, they had already gone to into Africa. I don't know, but they're talking about the black, you know, East African in East Africa in the Jewish fashion. Okay. So, um, so this will be my last question. Uh, I got I to get off and get something to eat right quick. But uh, um, so in in uh, your earlier blogs and whatnot, I know that there's references to, to Moabite stuff I can find in terms of like maybe uh, writers in Spain or in other places like that. Um, but in this upcoming mm -hmm. book, am I, is there any information about like, for instance, Moab and Arabia, et cetera? Yes. Uh, OK. Yes. In the Yemen, yeah, and also, like I said, the Muahid people, who were basically related to the Hameda tribes, also were moved up into the Gore area, and that's why those people were called even in medieval medieval times, uh, sons of Lut or Lot. Mm -hmm. Is is there is there any uh, uh, information in terms of like the, the Moabites being or people related to them being in the Hejaz anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. So just off that point alone, I'm, I'm sure like a lot of more is going to go grab your book if they hear this on that one because uh, that's going to be mad intriguing to them. Oh yeah, yeah. No, they were like I said, they were in the Yemen, in the Asir, in the Hejaz, in the Central Arabia. In the, Jordan Valley, basically the north. That was the northern um, expansion up into the Jordan Valley, and Babylonia, of course, was even earlier. Some of those people had arrived, but um, yeah, the Hejaz had all these people, especially in the people called Musra and Harb, the Musra Harb and the um, uh, another group of Harb tribes, and all those people also are found in. Gore Valley, or a lot of them, and then some of them moved in Sinai as well. And they had, like I said, the, the plural Moahid, Moahid, but. Um, Moahib is the plural you said? Yeah, I like the way you said it, yeah. Did I say it right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Because that right? <laughs> that's a plural for uh, Moab, Mo, the Moab, Moab, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I lied. I do have. I do have one more question. So mm -hmm. when I when I when I read your work, something that stands out to me is that historically speaking, I had like when it, it seems like the Midianites are a lot bigger than what I than what I ever understood them to be. Like so that that's one thing that that stands out to me. It's like wow. Like I mean, well, go like I say, there were um, tribes of the the upper class Shem 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 whatever they call themselves. Um, mm -hmm were often pastoral groups that were for some reason they're a lot taller um and then there's there used to be other you know different casts of people that were these are all included under the medianite i mean even today you see them the uh the toreg and the sonic uh smiths class or vassal class of um among them among the toreg even so these people stayed together throughout their history through thousands of years. Do they um, wear the black veil or is that another group? 
Uh, they sometimes wear the veil, but yeah, they also wear the veil. The lower cat, the lower cast Tuareg will wear the veil. Yeah. Is that, is that a midnight thing or is that a Tuareg thing? Um, we, I think that from what I read in um, Born in Sahara and Sudan, that it began with that Magianism after the, um, who are these people? The Maz Mazdians. Did you find like a fire cult through, throughout Arabia and the Beja until, mm -hmm. uh, you know, late times? And they worshiped fire and um, the, the polar principle of polarity, mm -hmm. you know, duality. So, and, and this guy, Sir Richmond Palmer, said that um, they used the lithium so that they don't blow on the smoke. And that's why it was found both in the Mazdian culture and the uh, in the Tauric, who were Madians. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Or, or fire, fire, I don't know, they did something with fire, celebrated fire, the fire cult. Would I be a, a, a correct in assuming that the, um, am, am I reading your work correctly in assuming that the Midianites would be bigger than what I would normally have assumed them to be? Like, it's typically Which, about. No. Okay. No. Like I said, the, there were different groups of pe people. Like today's groups, the, the Ifrin. Mm -hmm. you, I think maybe you meant the Amalekites. Because there's Amalekite people among the Medinites. Sometimes they're considered, you know, in the Bible, sometimes Amalek this says the Kenites need to get up from under the Amalekites so I can destroy them. Uh, and then it says the same thing about the Medinites. The Kenites need to get out from under the Medinites. So, you know, the ruling people were, they had said, um, often these taller groups of Amalekites, the first of all nations. That's what that meant, probably. Um, that, they also may have some, had something to do with the Hyksos. I'm not sure though. When I was saying bigger, I didn't, I didn't mean in size, I, in height, I meant more so like in population. Um, no, where, what, Midianites, you uh, mean in Arabia? Uh, just period. Cause I'll say like this, like, so, so when people read the Bible, typically they don't see that, like they would see like the Midianites as like a real small group of people. Um, and I noticed that when I read your work that they're mentioned oh. more than I would think than, than what, than what they're, 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 they're mentioned more than what, uh, uh, that's because they were the, basically the early, early, they were the earliest people of the, Is you know, Israelites. That's where the Moses and his people came out of Amalekite and Medianite people. And the Kenites came to form the Judeans and stuff. They were the word, the Kenites worshiped Yahweh. That's where that, you know, they were the ones that worshiped. Yahweh and brought it to the world. So in your and, research, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, there's places in the you know, Bible talks about the um, tribes of Israel and there's tens of thousands of tribes of people mentioned as children of, you know, Bahila and Naphtali mm -hmm. and all the people. And they were never in uh, Syria. They can't find a trace of these large groups of people, especially during the time they say this happened. Um, now, in Central Arabia and, and Southern Arabia, you know, you did find these people named Mahila and Jazira and um, Gan Guni and, um, you know, all these tribes of, of, um, who's, of Dan, Dan, because Dan married Bahila and then another one was Zilpa. Or wait, I forget. Anyway, you know, you do find a lot of these people in the area of Central Arabia, sending it to the Sawad later on um, in in southern Mesopotamia or southern uh, Babylonia. And um, there's no reason why you know there couldn't have been those tens of thousands of people in a place like Saba, which was flourishing, you know, a flourishing nation. But they haven't really done the archaeology. Of Central Arabia and that that um, Yemen yet, and, um, but they definitely haven't found it in, in Syria. And you do find, like I said, the names of these people who are still there. There's probably more proof of modern uh, people under those names in Yemen 
even though they're being exterminated, uh, than there were was in in the archaeology of Syria. You know, um, I don't think personally. I don't think that some of them even made it up there. Some of the Israeli tribes never even made it up there. Bahila being one of them. Wow. Okay. You know what? I do have one more question still, and then I, I will have to go. So you were talking about earlier. You were talking about Assyrians and the, the Kasdim and the Chaldeans, etc., or whatnot. Um, and we, we we briefly touched on that, but I want I, I forgot I wanted to touch on that a little bit more um, because they're a significant group in the in the in the Bible. Um, and when and when when people hear well, when I hear your information that you that you said on the so far, um, I, I don't think. I don't think people look at them as the people that you that you put them out to be like they they typically would think they would think like a modern concept of like what what Syria looks like or something like that right and so and well, so no, the Assyrians the Assyrians like I said they were not Afroasiatic people in the sense that I'm talking about now they were Kurdish people related to those Kurdish as well as the original Babylonian people they were not black you know they were some kind of um they look a lot like the modern day series they wear their hair the same way and they act the same way some of them act the same way you know slaughtering people but um no i shouldn't have said that uh to me the assyrians of the period of the seventh century sixth century bc fifth century bc was not uh you know that whole area was not occupied by afro-asiatic people but they named that area because they were there, Assyria, you know, just like they named Aramaic, yeah. Uh, most other places in the Middle East were named by them. You know, the Semitic names come from the Semitic people. But um, yeah, the Assyrians were not, in Babylon were not Afro-Asiatics predominantly. They were, and they also, they invaded Yemen where, there, where the people the original name of the original Assyrians, um, you know, is also found in the Yemen, the Assur, the Assur. But like I say, because people don't understand it near the Dead Sea, which is called the Assyrian Lake, you have all these black people still living. It's only me, and that they're the ones that brought that name to the area. But the Assyrians and the Arameans, um, that the, the original uh, people were in the Yemen, but the Assyrian of the Bible were not, you know, you can see from there, unless those are, again, like sculptures coming from later times, they don't look black to me. They don't look African, Afro-Asiatic even. They look like could have some... You know, they were mulatto or something, but they weren't. They weren't black. They weren't Arab. They weren't like the Arabs. Yeah, and I wanted to make sure I touched on on, on the on the, the the Chaldeans and the Kasdim again, um, just because yeah, of the Yemenite people, the Banu, the Kas, the Kasdim, mm -hmm. or Kased, Kasid, are still there. They're black Yemenite people. Kasdim. And they're, and they're also in close relationship with the Banu Khalid, or Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. And that's why, see, these people used to live also in the area of Oman, extended to the area of Oman in the Persian Gulf. That's why um, the Greeks said that the Geraeans that lived in the area of Oman were originally Chaldeans. So I remember you were saying something about them. Uh, they, they still practice their astrology. Uh, oh, in, in, yeah, in, um, in Ethiopia, or the Somalia, Somalia, or the Horn of Africa, yes. Yes, they're known for, and they give out magic charms when babies are born and stuff like that. They're the people that are, um, yeah, known for that. Telling, telling fortunes and all, all that kind of thing. So, it's, so even like so in, in the Bible, they kind of have the the, the connotation to be like the smartest people in the land or very wise people or whatnot. So even even in today, they're almost seen in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. Well, as the people that see nowadays, of course, that kind of stuff is not considered. It's haram. It's considered taboo, you know, among Christians and stuff like that. Astrology, of 
course, is not a Christian practice, but in ancient times, of course, is Nabataeans and the Chaldeans practiced astrology. Yeah, Sabians practiced astrology or re reading the stars. Like the Benjamin Chidale said, the Eurvidians, the Kushites who read the stars and planets. So, yes, they still can do that. Okay. Not, so, yeah, not modern Muslims and stuff, no. So the Chaldeans, Afro-Asiatic, the Assyrians, you're saying maybe a lot of people, not, not so much. No, I, didn't say, I didn't say a, a single word about the Kazdeen and Ethiopia being mulatto people. I said Assyrians in Babylonia. Did I say that backwards? I'm sorry. I can I can be I can be dyslexic sometimes. So if I said that okay. backwards, I, in my head I thought I said Assyrians. You said links to mulatto or Babylonia. Yeah, uh, Assyrians were mulatto. That had nothing to do with okay. the. That has nothing to do with the Ethiopians or Chaldeans and Kazdeen. Right. So I, so I was right. So what my point was that the, that the. Um, let me be clear real quick. So in, in the Bible, there's, they're, they're, they're linked a lot of times, the Assyrians and the, and the Chaldeans. And so what I was trying to clarify is that, so one, you were saying one was one group. and wait, then wait, 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 wait. Where did you see in the Bible that Chaldeans are linked to Assyrians? Maybe you're saying the Babylonians? It literally says in the Bible that the, 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 the Chaldeans were started by by Asher, by Asher, by the Assyrians. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Asher, like I said, was is a tribe in the Yemen. Yes, Asher. Now, if you're talking about Assyria, the place, like I said, that these people settled and conquered, that's different. These people, that the people that arose in Babylon were, were um, first they were Semitic, and then, like I said, these other people from the Zagros and other places came down, Kurdish related people, or mm -hmm. whatever it was, white Eurasian people settled in the area, just like they settled in uh, Turkey. Right, and that's what I wanted to clarify for the people real quick, is because because uh, you said it real fast, and I want to make sure they they caught it because because okay. there's a lot of names coming out. So when you, you said that the the original name they was found in Yemen, the Ashur people, right? And so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, sure. they were they were um, definitely not. Um, yeah, they were definitely connected, but in the Yemen, yes. Right, right, but not, but not, but you, but like and I was just talking about that you were saying that they weren't necessarily even. Even are you saying A S S U R or A S H U R? So for the people in Yemen? No, for what were you talking the Bible? In so, the Old Testament, you said the Chaldeans and the Sur or Ashur. I don't know which one you were saying. So in the, in, in, in Hebrew it's, I think it's a it's a sur, but but then it but uh but but again in, in uh in uh the English it just says the Assyrian, and so that's why I was trying to clarify something real quick to where people might get something confused. Oh, okay. Because yeah. Because oh. No, yeah, the Assur, the Assur, the Assur people, like even that's what I'm trying to see what you're saying because Joseph has talks about the Assur being Medianites, and so those people were not related to the people in Babylon later called Assyrian. You know, by the seventh century BC, whatever Shaman, uh, I don't know if Shamanazar himself was, you know, Hadian or what, but okay, then um, let me ask, let me ask this. So when, in when general, the Bible, Assyrians right. were different people ethnically, okay. they look different, whatever. Yeah, now something I was trying to clarify. So, so the, 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 the follow question would be this so when the Bible is saying that that the Assyrian or that Ashur started uh, the Chaldeans. How would you interpret that? Would you interpret that is is is, is it really meaning the 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 the, the Assur people of, of Yemen, or or is uh, that? Yes. yes. Okay. And that's the problem with um, modern translation interpretation of Hebrew. Yeah. One hundred percent. However, however, like I said, these people also lived in the Persian Gulf and settled in Assyria, and right. they named. They named Assyria in in ancient times, and um, what's this going on, by the Oh, um, no. What I was saying is that Assur, according to the Bible, they were Medianites, and they also 
the Chaldeans and the Chazdeans also settled in Babylonia. In fact, the Chaldeans and the Batians were sometimes, you know, considered to be the same people. That, that's what I appreciate so much about your work and people like Kamal Salibi, et cetera, whatnot, in the sense to where when you when you really look at the situation, you can see to where like the, the older people move into new areas and, and almost rename them after the old areas to where and it's almost like you can see to where there's it's, there's a confusion to where like the, the areas that got newly named are being seen as the ancient places and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what I appreciate almost the most about your work is it, it just it just it 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 it, it writes the ship in a sense to where like I I was going in reverse, but now I'm going forward. And I was like, oh, I can see, I can see where this thing's going. Okay, I was, okay. I was going in the wrong direction to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Because, and that's where I th that's where I think a lot of our people uh, are, are are missing out is they assume that when people like when uh, when their educators or someone else is telling them, yeah, these are the original people of the area, um, they're they're not doing the, the extra research that you're doing and you're showing us, mm -hmm. which like no 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 no. When you go back far enough, no no no, that, that's not the case. There's different migrations, yeah. there's wars, there's this, there's that, all that. Right. Right. Yep. So with that, I want to say one more time, thank you very, very, very much for what you do. Um, my apologies that if any way, shape or form, uh, uh, I had anything negative to the to the, to the conversation. Um, again, everyone, please check out her book. Let me get this. Let me get this title right. One more time. The African and Arabian origin of the Hebrew Bible. Exegesis in light of inscriptions, folkloric history and early ethnography of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, again, I will link uh, a book excerpt down below when, when this interview is over with. Um, and there's also a, a link to a Afro-Asiatic blog spot so you can check out her blog. There's 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 books worth of information on that blog in and of itself. It's it's mm -hmm. worth in and of itself. Yep. And um, like I said, if, if other Western scholars are applauding it, and I tell you, I forgot to tell you the, um, the fear fear of blackness that when um, they told me it was going to make they were going to make it into a book. They asked Dr. Goldenberg, I was talking about, to um, write a, you know, what do you call it? Not the forward, the, um, on the back cover where they write the support um, endorsement. Mm -hmm. So he wrote an endorsement for that book, which is, deals with Africans and African Jews and that kind of thing. So I think people would like it if they read it. Um, but I, this book is much better than that and much more sound because there's a lot more information the one that's coming up fantastic so with that I, I say thank you for your time thank you for your energy thank you for your spirit uh, thank you for your thank you very much i'm sorry if uh, you you experienced my righteous side for a minute there but <laughs> and make no apology I, you have nothing to, you have I nothing to be sorry for but you know you're not well, like i say you're a very nice guy and i wish a black woman. Are you, I wish. Are you married? No, not currently. I was before, but not now. I wish you find you know a nice woman your age that will make you happy. But you're right. It's very hard to find. I think either a black man or a black woman that's you know uh, balanced and not. Well, I can say that so much. I mean, I don't know if it's just me or. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you, I think the black women that need a black man, I think you're perfect for them and they should, they should, uh, write you or whatever. And <laughs> I appreciate uh, that very much. You're, you're way too kind. And again, my apology for my poor choice of words, and I appreciate your righteous indignation and correction. Okay. Thank you very much, Taiwan. And I'll stay, you know, keep in touch on the Facebook. Oh, most certainly. Cause I'm, Cause I'm I'm waiting for that book to come out. You're definitely gonna get the call back when I when, when, so I can get this uh, review it. Cause okay. uh, I'm 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 looking forward to burning through those 400 pages real quick. Okay, I'm I'm glad. So am I. <laughs> so you take care. You have a good night. Uh, you too. Thank you so much, and to everybody out there. The peace to the chat. Thank you to South Showtime and, and the Debate Talk for you uh, platform for letting us have this conversation. Y'all have a good night. Peace and love. Thank you.